Good morning. All right, day two. So, uh, Pete Flores, I'm the Executive Assistant Commissioner for Office of Field Operations. Uh, very honored to be here today and to be able to kick off day two. Had an opportunity to see the kickoff of day one. Uh, been able to hear some of the comments on the panels and the number of participants online. So a, a lot of good conversation, right? A lot of good activity um, and uh, collaboration, right? Which is what we were hoping for and why we're bringing people together uh, for this event. So I'd like to thank the Office of Trade uh, for initiating this event, right? And all the employees behind the scenes that really went to make this happen uh, in order to have us all here to really start to talk about forced labor, what that means, the collaboration, what's out there, right? How do we come together to, in order to put our best foot forward, our best efforts forward on how we prevent, right, this heinous crime uh, on what we see out there from a forced labor perspective. Also like to thank all of you that are here, uh, either in person or virtually, uh, for being here, taking the time out of your schedules and, and really ha hold this conversation and participate uh, either virtually or in person on what we're doing over the next couple days here. I think coming together for us, the ability to come together for us on this important event is important. And as we think about the innovative ways, right, on how we can combat the forced labor issue for us, right, our ability to share information is the way we're going to be able to do this. As, as we talk about partnership and stopping forced labor into our supply chains. As the Executive Assistant Direct Assistant Commissioner for OFO, Many of you are aware, I, I have the responsibility of border security at our, 20, our 328 ports uh, across the country. Um, so one of our responsibilities in really legitimate trade and travel, right, from a national security perspective, what trade and travel looks like and facilitating that through our ports of entry is also combating forced labor goods and articles coming through our ports of entry uh, that have been made with forced labor. So as we talk about what ports of entry are and we talk about numbers and, and really what that is, right, we, our ports of entry are busy, busy locations across the country. We start talking scope and volume of what we do every day, right? Our ports of entry are processing over a million travelers a day coming in to the country every single day. We are processing over 90,000 uh, rail, sea, truck coming across our borders or into our seaports every single day. We are processing over 10,000 shipments of goods uh, and approvals for entries every single day. So there's quite a bit of volume coming at us every, every day at our ports of entry. So as we shift through that, and really make assessments on what we want to do, right? Forced labor being a priority for us is, is going to require the partnership and the collaboration that we have established and will continue to establish uh, going forward for us. But I think forced labor, as we talk knowingly or unknowingly, we talk about shipments of forced labor coming through our ports of entry, right? That, we know, goes to financing transnational criminal organization or entities that are abusing workers and threatening uh, Americans' economic uh, security. So field operations and what we do every single day, we deploy a dynamic risk-based approach on what we want to see and what we want to look at based on high-risk goods using current information and data that we have in our systems or is being shared with us. We identify and target information related to a variety of threat streams pertaining to forced labor. Our frontline personnel every day are reviewing manifest and entry information for specific shipments looking for red flags or indicators of which one of them is a linkage to violative shipments that we've seen in the past. Connecting a shipment to a previously uh, known or violated shipment with forced labor 
for us is a very proactive avenue in how we pursue determining the legitimacy of the cargo or the shipment that we have in front of us. We also receive a lot of information from industry itself. We get feedback from the trade about manufacturers and raw materials and what we're dealing with. And I think that partnership in itself cannot be overstated, the value that it brings to the process of enforcement compliance on what the next steps are for us at our ports of entry. So we use that all, all that information in making determinations about whether or not the item that we have in front of us right, is likely to be from the Xinjiang region. Once we determine that a shipment is subject to the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, then the onus, as you're all aware, is, to, is on the importer to overcome the presumption of forced labor. So far in FY23, we have, we have targeted over 1,700 shipments that fall into that category. And that really, from the overall scheme of things, is right, as we talk about the number of shipments coming in, the number of containers coming in, the number of truck and rail shipments coming in, there's really a small percentage of, of the total overall volume that we are looking at. When we think about 1,700 shipments uh, and the volume that we're dealing with at our ports of entry every day, it, it, it is a small percentage uh, of what we're dealing with today. I think another reason for us, as I talk about partnership and collaboration, another reason for our success here is our CTPAT program. Right? So CTPAT, which is founded in what strong public-private partnership is for us, has grown tremendously over the last 20 years for us. We now have close to 11,000 dedicated program partners, and the results of the work can be seen through the continued growth of the program as well as lessons learned, lessons learned over the years. With the increased scrutiny of goods with forced labor, we are excited right, about the way forward and how our partners have come together to address forced labor in our supply chain. Just to give you a brief overview, overview of CTPAT, in FY22, we signed two new mutual a recognition agreement to bring our total to 16 MRAs, and we signed two joint working plans with Guatemala and Colombia, which obviously can turn into MRAs uh, for us. Over the last year, CTPAT went back to in-person validations and were able to validate 456 uh, validations in Canada and Mexico. This year with CTPAT, we plan to get back to pre-COVID era, what we were doing with in-person validations while continuing to, continuing to use the validation, right, the virtual validation uh, where required. Some of CTPAT's best accomplishments recently have come out of strengthening our requirements. We have been bringing additional awareness to our partners, asking them to monitor their supply chains for forced labor. The mission and effort to combat forced labor has been so great that we have worked to provide additional standards for both the minimum security criteria for CTPAT security and have made it an integral part of CTPAT's trade compliance program. The criteria sets a mark to eliminate participating companies using forced laborers. Through collaboration and other government partner agencies and the Commercial Customs Operation Advisory Committee, CTPAT was able to evaluate multiple forced labor benefit recommendations. So I think the bottom line for us over the now and as we continue forward is that we have to do everything we can to safeguard American businesses from unfair competition while pro protecting vulnerable people right, from inhumane working and living conditions. The only way we can do this is by working together and sharing best practices. As my colleague EAC Highsmith said yesterday, technology is a critical tool for us on how we combat this effort but can never replace the dual diligence on how we do this every single day. Now, it's an honor for me to introduce our keynote speakers. First, we'll hear from Kit Coughlin, the Vice President of Global Client Engagement at Caron, an organization that provides data analytic tools to optimize core functions of financial crimes and compliance programs. Mr. Coughlin works with global corporate, cor corporates and financial institutions on sanctions, export control, and supply chain risk. 
prior to Caron, Mr. Conklin served as national security positions with the U.S. government, where he specialized in nonproliferation and East Asia security issues. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Laura Murphy, who is a professor of human rights and contemporary slavery at Sheffield Hamlin University. Dr. Murphy's research focuses on trafficking, contemporary slavery, and forced labor globally. She is currently working on multiple research projects focused on forced labor. She is also an author of several books, including Freedomville, the story of the 21st century slave re revolt. Without a doubt, we have an exciting agenda uh, over today and, um, and what, we, what we had yesterday. So I want to thank you again for your participation and your collaborative efforts. Look forward to meeting with many of you and continuing the important conversations uh, on forced labor. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Coughlin. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, wonderful to, to be back up to discuss um, today a bit of a different topic. Um, we were asked to present to industry a bit about real life examples of what UFLPA intelligence looks like. How do you think about these issues uh, from the perspective of doing due diligence on your supply chain? What are some of the industry best practices um, associated with UFLPA compliance? I think more importantly though to start is not only why this matters from an ethical, an ethical perspective, we heard that from El Nagar and Nori yesterday, but from an industry perspective, why does this matter? If you look at sanctions regulations over the last several decades, um, the numbers of, of penalties that you've seen for sanctions violations pale in comparison to what CBP has been able to accomplish in nearly nine months of UFLPA enforcement from a value of goods detention perspective. So for those that may not follow the monthly updates from CBP on the statistics, or maybe you haven't seen the new dashboard, highly encourage you to look at that, but this is the number that matters. So in the back of your mind, when you're thinking about due diligence, when you're talking to your C-suite about why the UFLPA matters to you as a company, to you as a bank, to you as a freight forwarder, whatever the case may be is, this is the number that matters. We haven't even, uh, we haven't even had a law in effect for a year yet, and we're almost at a billion dollars worth of goods being detained uh, per the risks outlined in the UFLPA. Um, fortunately for government, um, and now a new challenge for industry, is that's just the beginning. CBP has a mandate, the power, and the enforcement authorities to scale enforcement for the UFLPA. They have new resources, um, Congress, this is a bipartisan consensus issue in a world and in a city in Washington where bipartisanship is sometimes rare. This is a key priority from a national security and an economic security perspective on both sides of the Hill and in the White House right now. So we see this when budgets change. This is the new budget. New people are coming on board. New capabilities are coming on board. So if CBP was able to detain $800 million worth of goods in the last nine months, imagine uh, where their enforcement capabilities will be as resources grow. So what do you actually do about this? Um, I said this yesterday, I'll foot stomp it again today. CBP has explicitly provided guidance time and time again to industry on how to think about this law and how to actually comply with this law. If you're in supply chain risk management, if you're thinking about compliance and you're sending surveys to your companies and your tier ones, your tier twos, and you're asking them, please check this box, do you use forced labor? Yes or no? What do you think they're gonna say? It's going to always be no, regardless of whether or not that's actually the truth, right? So we have to shift from an industry perspective outside of this format where you only think about cascading surveys. The guidance explicitly states that these types of surveys, these types of audits are no longer sufficient. What else? This is all complicated by emerging and changing regulations, but you also have on the other side of the coin, suppliers in China that are obfuscating their ties to the region in Xinjiang, 
There are ties to companies that have received labor transfers, that have received banned or high-risk raw materials from Xinjiang or produced with forced labor via the other typologies that CBP has outlined. So not only do you have the new legislation, not only do you have new resources coming on bear to uh, help enforce this law to the, the fullest extent possible, but you also now have uh, a challenging environment through which to actually find an action intelligence that can enable you to detect these risks. Um, so let's actually talk about that. I mentioned this yesterday, but when we think about forced labor risks and you think about the WROs that have been publicly announced or the UFLPA entity list, there's only 20 or so companies that have been publicly identified by CBP as being representative of these risks. But if you, if you crack open one of those WROs, if you really examine those entities that have been identified by CBP, please read Laura's reporting on this. It's pretty explicit why those parties were targeted with an enforcement action. But that's just one small subset of the overall risk category. When you're thinking about the UFLPA and you're thinking about the, the guidance that CBP has provided to all of us in this room, it's explicit. You must demonstrate due diligence, you must conduct effective supply chain mapping, and you must have supply chain management measures to ensure that um, no products manufactured in whole or in part with inputs derived from forced labor are, are brought into this country. Um, so what I want to do is actually talk again real briefly about these typologies. And then I'm going to walk through some case studies that involve real companies that are involved in these typologies. We're going to discuss how you can think about intelligence, how you can conduct the due diligence on your own supply chain using the partners in this room, using intelligence that you may have, that Caron has, whomever has, right, to identify these typologies. But just to make sure that we're all, again, on the same page for those that may have forgotten from yesterday, these typologies, these warning signs from force, or for forced labor came from the government. Once again, CBP has explicitly provided over and over again information to industry on how to detect risk, on what types of risk to detect, and these are those risks. So things like, for example, forced labor in prisons, companies co-located with prisons, government subsidies, the mutual pairing assistance program, all of these things are red flags for industry. So how do you actually detect it? So let's, let's start with a real case study. It's always more fun to see this. Um, so when you're thinking about mapping your supply chain, what I'll do in this instance is start with the risk itself, an actual prison in Xinjiang. You can see it for yourself. You could try to find this on Google satellite imagery. It's there, right? So the first thing that you need to do from a diligence perspective, if the, if the guidance explicitly states that companies co-located with prisons are, are subject to a possible detention, you probably should know where the prisons are, right? So first we identify the prison, and then we figure out what are those companies that are located at that prison. This is very common. Let me say that again. It is very common for companies, mines, and farms to be located at prisons in Xinjiang or internment camps or re-education centers in Xinjiang. This is not made up. CBP didn't make this up. This is real. This is how it's actually happening. So once you identify those companies that are located at those prisons, the names start changing a bit. You keep building out these risks, and you identify other companies that are owned by front companies at these prisons. Pull back that thread a little bit more. This guidance is explicit. It tells you to look explicitly for these types of red flags. You build that further, you identify cotton companies, for example, that ultimately are four levels on paper removed from a prison, but once you dive into that using an intelligence analytical process, you're able to see that these front companies, these shell companies that the Chinese uh, are using to hide and obfuscate this activity, this is real. And so from there, from a UFLPA perspective, what does this mean? If you're sourcing products from a company that's got Xinjiang in its title, think about that. I mean, there's. There's, there's red flags there that you should be aware of. But really, the risk for the UFLPA goes above and beyond that. So you need to understand where are those other companies in China or in other parties like, or other countries like Vietnam sourcing their products from companies that are located at these prisons. The UFLPA is explicit. The guidance is explicit. 
you have to conduct due diligence on those companies in Vietnam to ensure that the products that they are, that you're buying from them do not have inputs derived from forced labor. This is a global problem. The regulation is explicit. You can't just think about Xinjiang risk by, I'm only buying stuff from Vietnam, therefore I'm clean. I don't have to worry about the UFLPA. It's not how global supply chains work. And so this is a good reminder that from an industry perspective, the first step in this process, if you're that identified US company on here, or if you're that identified European retailer on here, the first step that you need to do when you're thinking about this risk is identify who all your tier ones are. And then it's a matter of using some of the great partners that are here, that CBP has brought together, that provide that mapping service for you to identify your tier twos. And then from there, you're able to layer on that intelligence to figure out here's where the actual risk lies. So over and over and over again, uh, a lot of the panelists have discussed there's no silver bullet for UFLPA compliance. You have to conduct your own supply chain mapping. You have to understand who's in your supply chain. And you have to layer on and understand from an intelligence perspective where this obfuscation is taking place. So that's case study number one. Case study number two, um, aluminum. Lots of questions I get asked about what commodities are being targeted next. Um, and I'm sure Laura is going to answer some of these questions as well. But from our perspective, and I won't speak on Laura's perspective, but for, from my perspective anyway, it's pretty obvious. If you want to understand where the guidance is going, if you want to understand what are the next commodities that are going to be targeted for the UFLPA from a detention perspective, look at what goods are being manufactured, mined, in whole or in part in Xinjiang. It's pretty straightforward. One example of that is aluminum. There are massive aluminum supply chain uh, connections to parties in Xinjiang that represent risk. So here's a real example, uh, Xinjiang Join World. Xinjiang Join World is a company that represents all sorts of red flags for the UFLPA. The first of which is they are affiliated with the so-called Mutual Pairing Assistance Program. So they've received incentives from the Xinjiang government um, to establish satellite factories located around the country, around the province where forced labor is being utilized. The second red flag for this company is that they've been identified as part of the uh, forced labor terminology that CBP has outlined in the Xinjiang Supply Chain Business Advisory, as well as subsequent UFLPA due diligence uh, guidance. So these are things, for example, like poverty alleviation, educating ethnic minorities on Mandarin. Um, these are all red flags per the guidance. So when you're thinking about these, these types of companies and you're trying to figure out where in your supply chain there's actual risk, these are the typologies that you can use to identify that. This all comes from government. They've been very explicit and very open about this. Um, the next piece here is labor transfers. So this company has also been involved with labor transfers. Um, so you keep adding these red flags onto these companies, right? So they've received labor transfers, they've sent labor, ethnic Uyghur laborers um, to other factories to work at. And then from there, I would also note that they're publicly traded. So if you're a financial institution and you're thinking about your securities and you're thinking about your risk perspective, what happens if you own stock in your Vanguard account or in your TSP and it's an emerging markets fund and Xinjiang Join World is all of a sudden having all of their goods detained at the border? That's not great for, uh, from a financial perspective, right? So think about that. Think about the obfuscation. They have companies that are located in Hong Kong that are moving these, these aluminum shipments from. All of this boils back down to the risk typologies themselves. And then from there, uh, you have identified automakers, both in uh, the United States, Europe, as well as other aluminum companies in, in third countries, right? So another typology. And I know we're, we're, running, we're running a little tight here, so I'm gonna go through a couple of other ones just to kind of make people think about this from a bit more of, a, of an interesting perspective. Um, one topic that we didn't spend a whole lot of time on yesterday, although El Nagar and Nori uh, both briefly mentioned it, was the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. If you look at the CBP guidance on what are the red flags, Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, affiliates, subsidiaries, um, another flashing red light in your supply chain. So things, for example, like XPCC affiliates, it's very common from our perspective, looking at these networks from an intelligence perspective, to see parties that are affiliated with XPC, XPCC co-located or, or involved in the same supply chain as parties that have already been publicly identified by CBP on the UFLPA entity list or historically via WROs. So here's an example of an XPC subsidiary. You have the 8th division in this case. They manufacture all sorts of products um, that are being um, sold all over the world. 
they also are part of the supply chain for another company, Xinjiang Junggar Cotton and Linen Co., which is um, on the UFLPA entity list. So by understanding the sources of this risk, you then follow the supply chain. Companies like Lutai Textiles works with hundreds of American and European companies. Um, they're sourcing cotton from Xinjiang, they're sourcing cotton from another party on the uh, UFLPA entity list, but they're not located in Xinjiang. They are located in a separate province, um, and if you are only relying on surveys, you may not know that that party um, is actually sourcing its cotton from, from Xinjiang and from a party on the UFLPA entity list. So another typology that you can see here is, once again, just because you're not sourcing products directly from your tier ones in Xinjiang, there is risk that's far more expansive than, than just screening the zip codes. You have to do that extra level of due diligence to determine if any of the parties located in other provinces and other countries are providing um, that banned or high risk raw material to you. Because again, you don't want a detention and this is knowable. You can do this. It is possible to have this intelligence. And then from there, if you're a Western fashion retailer, um, you, you've got Xinjiang cotton in your supply chain. Um, the next case study that I'll briefly discuss is government subsidies. Um, this is, in Xinjiang, it's very common for the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps to provide power, to provide electricity, subsidized electricity to companies, to, ma to mines, um, for, for silica, for the polysilicon supply chains. Very, very common for Xinjiang government, XBCC, uh, subsidiaries to be offered to companies to help offset some of the costs for manufacturing these products or mining these products. Um, in this case, uh, government subsidies. Once again, another typology that CBP has provided explicit guidance on for three years, I should note, on how client or how uh, companies can can think about this intelligence, how they can operationalize this intelligence, and how they can actually detect this risk and stop these types of products from entering your supply chain. So government subsidies in this case from XPCC going to a biotech company who has um, uh, onward supply chain connections to parties both in uh, the United States as well as in South Asia. So if you're if if you've maybe had a detention, and you're thinking. Why did CBP detain this good? Um, well, ask yourself, have you done that supply chain mapping? Have you identified the Chengguang biotech groups of the world in your supply chain? Have you identified their tier twos? Have you identified their tier threes? And if not, and you're asking yourself, why did I get a detention? Well, there's probably some sort of risk that's tied back into the government guidance that once again, CBP has been very explicit, very open about encouraging industry to look at uh, in order to comply with the law. So last slide here. I work with um, uh, hundreds of clients at this point on the UFLPA, uh, both the largest companies, the largest financial institutions, as we're all collectively trying to wrap our minds around how do you think about the rebuttable pres uh, presumption? How do you think about the due diligence requirements that are required um, in the law itself? How do you think about enforcement trends? What's next? I would distill those, uh, the guidance that I kind of provide back to clients into, into four pretty simple bullet points. Um, listen, if you've got a detention and you're just now starting to think about how do I comply with the law, you're working, you're working backwards. You gotta do it the other way around. You gotta be proactive. You have to understand where your supply chain is. What are the inputs in your supply chain that represent risk? Because that's the only way to proactively use a risk-based approach to detecting these types of typologies in your supply chain. If you've got a detention, I know you've got your, your hair on fire and you gotta work through that, but, but please, please, the government has been very explicit on how to provide uh, uh, use intelligence, how to think about supply chain mapping. There are all sorts of documents and FAQs that CBP has published. Please read them. I find that a lot of people sometimes get busy and they, they don't read the guidance and then they're confused about why a detention happened. This is as open and great as, as it gets from a government perspective. Um, the intelligence community is never going to provide a full list to CBP of every company that, that's subject to these restrictions, right? It's an evolving 
Uh, supply chain. Supply chains change every hour of every day and they always will. There will never be a list that's published by CBP that's all encompassing of the risk typologies that happen here. Front companies will always pop up. Shell companies will always pop up. There will always be obfuscation. Um, so just think about that. If, you're, if you've got a detention, work through it, but it's time to build a program around detecting this type of risk. Um, with that, I know, I think my time is, is limited here, but if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them, and then I want to make sure, Laura, oh yes. Thank you for those excellent remarks, both uh, yesterday and today. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Piero Tozzi. I'm the staff director of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, whose principals, uh, Congressman Chris Smith, um, Congressman McGovern, Senators Merkley and Rubio, were the authors of the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act. And, uh, uh, and just to underscore the bipartisan interest in this issue, and the, the scrutiny that it will be receiving in this Congress, both from the China Commission and also the, uh, the select uh, uh, committee as well. But my question for you, Kit, is uh, you, you talked about stock portfolios and the impact that could have on the bottom line there, but what about uh, the issue of uh, materiality uh, of disclosures and omissions for the purposes of the 1934 Act? Uh, should that also be a, a concern Omission should always be a concern from my perspective. Um, so we are, the, the environment with respect to the data that's available is changing regularly. And Laura, I'm sure, can speak about this. Um, but the, the risk uh, information that we're seeing on, on companies starting to, to not disclose their supply chain relationships inside of, of China, that type of information is, is taking place already. So historically, you had a broad set of disclosure requirements uh, for publicly traded companies in China that outline their supply chains, there's information that's starting to evolve and, and, and dry up as part of that. I don't know if that gets to your question, but that information uh, is changing, but the disclosures from the U.S. side anyway certainly would be uh, interesting to see, but I am not in a position to make any sort of policy recommendations. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Sir. I'm Tony with uh, Livingston. Thank you. Interesting uh, comments. Are you aware of any situation where uh, maybe an importer has um, timely and, and proactively used the intelligence uh, that was then successfully used in overcoming the rebuttable presumption standard? I get that question uh, three or four times a day. Um, so the, the, from my perspective, as, a, as an intelligence professional, uh, if, if you've identified intelligence that, that signifies that there's some sort of risk uh, per the typologies and, and warning signs that CBP has publicly announced, it's, it's probably too little too late to get something uh, released because there's intelligence that suggests that there is forced labor in your, in your supply chain. Um, so proving a negative in that concept is always, uh, from a detention perspective, um, it's, it's a little bit of a, the, the cart's behind the horse. Whereas from what I encourage clients to think about intelligence is you want to use intelligence to identify your risks before there's ever a detention to begin with, not the, not the other way around. And I know, I think I'm out of time, um, but Dr. Murphy. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Is, is my slideshow working? Yeah? Oh, you can see it? That's not my slideshow. OK. Um, I will power through and keep my fingers crossed that this, uh, my slideshow pops up. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be able to have an opportunity to talk to you today. And really, um, just incredibly grateful. Um, Incredibly grateful to you all for being here at 8 a.m., um, to all of you for committing your time and your energy to thinking about this issue that I take, uh, that I'm quite passionate and concerned about. Um, also, thanks to all of the Uyghur advocates who have put their lives and the lives of their families on the line 
to talk about what's happening in their home country, in their homeland, and whose work inspires me to keep going even when I want to curl up in the fetal position and get under my desk and weep. Because um, <laughs> it's a lot of work. The work that you've seen represented here is um, extraordinary, and it's happened in a very quick fashion, and it's because what we're talking about here today is extraordinarily urgent. It is probably the, I hope, the worst human rights crisis we'll see in our lifetimes. And so I'm really grateful to all of you. Um, I'm also grateful to my team. A lot of people have said my name in the last couple of days, but I just want to say that my name is just an avatar for a team of extraordinarily researchers, many of whom are from the Kazakh and Uyghur communities who are living in exile, whose families are in detention camps, and who nonetheless put their lives and their families' lives on the line to do this research and work with a kind of passion and, and, and urgency that you can't possibly imagine. And they inspire me every day. And they, um, some of them are named in our reports, and many of them are unnamed because of the risk it, it is to them to do this work. And so I'm grateful to them. And our team, not me, but our team together, have uh, uh, written or contributed to six, uh, seven reports in the last two years that have traced the ways in which the Chinese government, the PRC government, has invested enormous resources in moving manufacturing to the Uyghur region intentionally to um, transform that region. Um, and transforming that region, they claim, is a development project, but it is, in fact, a major integral part of a genocide. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about that, but I think Nuri and, and Elnagar and others on the first couple of panels did a good job of helping us to understand that. But what we do is we look at how that forced labor is affecting our international supply chains and try to produce the knowledge base that allows us to uh, take action. So we've looked at solar, we've looked at uh, cotton apparel, we've uh, done research on PVC and built uh, uh, like building materials. Uh, and we've looked at the automotive industry. We've also looked at how this is financed locally and globally. And we've looked uh, in particular deeply at the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps because it is a nefarious institution that has no real precedent or comparison. Um, it is a colonial, paramilitary, corporate conglomerate that is bigger than anything you can imagine. And it is the machine, one of the machines by which the Uyghur people are um, being oppressed. And so we do this research for free for you. Many of you think that we do it against you, <laughs> but we do it for free for you. <coughs> because we want to believe, we try to believe um, that business wants to be ethical, wants to do the right thing, and does not want to be uh, doing their, uh, making their profits on forced labor. What the Chinese government is doing is artificially deflating prices by using forced labor uh, and by using, by having practically no environmental regulation in the Uyghur region, the dirtiest possible um, manufacturing goes on in that region because they, they think of the people and of the region, the land that they live on as disposable. And so we can't profit from that. And I want to talk about that today. The, the thing that you, that I think that might be being missed here is that the, when, when Kit talks about labor transfers and other folks talk about labor transfers, that is a, 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 a euphemism. It's a, it's a neat, clean phrasing for it. It's a phrasing I use as well. Um, but it is a system of forced labor. And the way we know that is because while labor transfers operate across the entirety of China, in the Uyghur region, they operate on a backdrop of extraordinary coercion um, that, is, that is mechanized, that is operationalized through the threat of internment. So a person in the Uyghur region could possibly, like me, I grew up in a tiny town uh, in southern Louisiana, and I could not wait to get out of that town. Many people who are like rural kids want to move to the big city and get a new job and have a new life. That happens. And Uyghur people are not different from that. Some of them want to go work in a factory. Very few of them actually want to work in a factory, though. Many of them want to stay at home and live their lives and marry their you know, high school sweethearts and have children and stay close to their families. The thing about the situation in the Uyghur region is those labor transfers, somebody could say yes to them, but no one can say no. 
No one can say no. To resist a government program is to be aligned with terrorism. This is directly written into government directives. And so anyone who says no knows that they are risking going to an internment camp. And they know what happens there because there is no one in that region who has not gone or, been, or had a family member go to a camp. They know that there's rape and torture and violence in those camps, and no one wants to, to take that. And so they end up in a factory making your shoes and your shirts and you know, your electronics, et cetera. I'll tell you all of what they're making. <coughs> We're not using some imaginary definition of forced labor here. We use the ILO definition of forced labor for our research. That's anything that's you know, um, made under, uh, under threat of penalty that person, a person's not doing voluntarily. But I will tell you, as a scholar of forced labor, I've been working on forced labor globally for 20 years. What is happening in the Uyghur region meets every single definition of forced labor, human trafficking, and slavery that I've ever seen. And there's debates about what those terms mean. This meets all of those definitions. There are few things that experts in the world agree on, but experts on forced labor agree on this. This system is a, a, a massive and unprecedented system of, of, of state-sponsored forced labor. And so it is all of our duty to address this. What do we do? I was asked to talk a little bit about what we do um, and how we do it. So we. We do what these guys are doing with machine learning, just with our eyes and like behind a computer. We're like manually doing this stuff. We, are, we don't have anything fancy to do our work, um, but we've, we've developed a methodology that I think informs a lot of these platforms. And I've talked to these folks and giving them whatever I can to help them understand what we were understanding, you know, before many of you were. Um, what we do is we start in the Uyghur region. We look for companies. Well, let me start here. Let me back up. We start with sectors that the Chinese government has prioritized for investment in the Uyghur region. When, I first, when we first came out with our report on solar, they were like, why are you targeting us? We're trying to do a good thing, and I am all for renewable energy. I want our planet not to catch on fire. But I also know that the Chinese government has intentionally held that market captive by moving polysilicon um, um, manufacturing to the Uyghur region and, and by moving so much of it there. They're holding all of us captive. They're holding the planet captive by moving manufacturing to that region. And the thing is, like Kit said, you can just look at what's being manufactured in the Uyghur region. The Chinese government makes a list every five years of what manufacturing they want to move to the Uyghur region. I have helpfully typed it up in my UFLPA submission if you would like to see that list. Um, and so the Chinese government tells us what they want to have manufactured there. So we start with the things the Chinese government invests in and say, okay, well, let's look at that sector. So we start, we look at every company we possibly can in that sector in the Uyghur, that's operating in the Uyghur region. And then we start seeing, do we, can we find signs that they're engaging in forced labor? Do we know if, um, if they are uh, you know, doing labor transfers? All the things that Kit just described. Are they operating in a prison? Are they operating in an internment camp? Um, and, and, and are they operating through the labor transfers that affect 3.2 million Uyghur people in 2021? 3.2 million, that's a Chinese government statistic. 3.2 million Uyghur people of 12 million. Take that for a second. 3.2 million of 12 million Uyghur people were moved into labor transfers in 2021. Half of those people are children and elderly people. So right, like half of the population is being forced to work. Forced to work for us. And so, so we look at the things that the Chinese government invests in, puts those people to work in. We look at where those products go and we trace them out to international supply chains. We have researchers who are fluent in Chinese and Uyghur and Kazakh. I want to encourage you all to hire people who know Chinese. Get some cultural competence. And I'm talking to you if you're in corporate. I'm talking to you if you're in the government. Please hire more people who speak Chinese. Like, like, if you're, if you're in tech, if you're in academia, if you're in nonprofits, like this information is available to us in Chinese 
The Chinese government advertises this. Corporations advertise their engagement in these programs. This is what we do all day, is look for those advertisements of their participation in this work and who their customers are, who their suppliers are, et cetera. We look at customs records, you know, SEC filings or, you know, uh, IPOs. We look at Chinese state media. We look at government docu documents and directives. We look at individual testimonies. We look at satellite imagery. All of this stuff gets put together to create a portrait of what's going on in the Uyghur region so that you, so that place is no longer a black box. People told us the Xinjiang region is a black box. But the truth is, if we can see it, you can see it. It is all online. We are not hackers. We don't know anything about the dark web. Like, I don't, like none of this stuff is how we, we just, we just Google it, y'all. We Google it in Chinese. You can use Google Translate. It is not like rockets. It is by far not the most complicated intellectual project I've ever in, 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 uh, like been on. Like this is not, it's not that complicated. Um, and so, I mean, we work hard. <laughs> it's exhausting, but it's not like rocket science. So if we can see it, you can see it. You can be doing this work. You can use these tools, but you could also just Google your supplier's name in Chinese, I cannot tell you how many companies tell me they do not know their supplier's Chinese name. How do you know anything about your supplier if you don't even know what their name is, right? And so what we do is we trace supply chains out to the rest of the world. And what we're finding is that companies and whole industries have remained ignorant of their raw materials. This is an image that's in my report. You can see it there um, in the, the, the in Broad Daylight report. But what we found is that many industries, including the solar industry, for instance, did not know their supply chains beyond the, the poly, in this case, the polysilicon level. They, they, when I presented my findings a year into the, the, more, into the solar industry, taking responsibility and saying, we want to change. When I said the name Hoshine, everyone on the webinar said, who is this, who is Hoshine? What is this metallurgical grade silicon? Tell us about how, and I'm like, you guys are engineers, you know how this stuff works, right? But they had not looked at the uh, raw materials. They had not gone beyond that stage. And, and they had not gone to Xinjiang, despite the fact that 45% of polysilicon was made in Xinjiang. And they are not alone. They are just the first group and the one that the Chinese government has targeted the most, the renewable energy sector. So if you're in another renewable energy sector, y'all, it's not just solar. It's like, we have got to address this issue because we have got to address other issues in the world, including the burning planet. And so we, we have to root this out. I've got some good news for you in a minute, but just hang in there. So what we do is we look at, we go as far as we can down into the raw materials. We look at companies that are egregiously engaged in the, the labor transfer programs. Hoshine is an enthusiastic um, and, and, um, and avid participant in the, the uh, like an architect in some ways of, the, of the, the forced labor in the Uyghur region. We document what they've done. We then say, okay, who are they selling to? We look and see, are they engaged in labor transfers? Then we say, who are they selling to? And lo and behold, they're often selling to the biggest suppliers in our side of the world, right? Hoshine doesn't only supply the solar industry, they su supply the automotive industry, they supply all kinds of rubber industries. They, 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 are, they produce 38% of the world's metallurgical grade silicon, 38% of the world's metallurgical grade silicon, and only half of it's consumed in the Uyghur region. So we know that stuff is getting out and people aren't tracing it. And this is not just in the solar industry. I mean, the thing that we keep trying to tell people is that it's not just solar, it's not just cotton, it's not just, um, what's the other, tomatoes. It's everything. It's, it's, it's shocking, right? We have looked at magnesium alloys, we've looked at paprika and garlic, we've looked at, um, oh, what else, the PVC, as I said, uh, uh, all other kinds of forms of renewables. We've, um, what we can learn from the Chinese government is their intention to move as much manufacturing to that region as they possibly can. They're particularly focused on uh, raw materials processing as well. And let's see, um, our report um, on, on um, on the automotive industry, I kind of just want to take the, co uh, the cover off and put a new 
uh, cover on it every couple of days, like take the automotive report on it, put railway on it, take the cover off, put you know electronics on it. Because what we found when we started to dig into the 30,000 parts that make up a car, terrifying to try to do this work. But what we found was that all we had to do was look at the basic materials, the raw materials, the aluminum, which isn't exactly a raw material, but bear with me. But like aluminum and um, uh, copper and uh, steel to be able to see that, th that the automotive industry was wi wildly exposed, but so are any other industries that are that are making things with aluminum, copper, steel, gold, uh, graphite. Uh, so, so because China has decided that they're going to move the dirty, dirty processing of the actual raw materials of bauxite and and iron to the Uyghur region, where they don't care what happens to the environment, where where processes that are outlawed all over the world, including in other parts of China, are still being practiced in in the Uyghur region, complete impunity. And so companies are moving to, and, 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 and importantly, all because there's a massive coal reserve in the Uyghur region where they are producing our renewable energy, making the highest carbon emissions you could possibly imagine, right? And so, so what they're producing there is also not really paying out on the, on the environmental front either. So, what we found was that everyone needs to be looking. If you have any raw materials that, are, that, that could possibly be processed in China, they're moving to that region and you need to be looking at your supply chains to figure that out. So people often ask me, what should we be looking at next? Or, or wink, wink, what are you working on next, Dr. Murphy? Um, and it doesn't matter what I'm working on next. What matters is what the Chinese government is working on next, right? And so, and, and, and the fact is they're working on the raw materials. They're working on moving that raw materials processing to the Uyghur region. And so it affects all of our supply chains. And we have the opportunity, some of us in this room, have enormous economic leverage to make change in those arenas. We can say, we're not going to buy this. In fact, we cannot buy these goods if they're coming from the Uyghur region because we can't ship them into the United States. We have the opportunity to do the right thing and say, we're not going to just not buy those goods for the American market. We're not going to buy those goods for any market because who am I to be like, oh, I'd like to buy your untainted uh, booth forced labor supply for this uh, over here, these folks over here. But if you could just save me some of your forced labor made goods to send to Europe, that would be awesome. Like what, just think about like what that, the implication of that is. So, so, cause you're knowingly, knowingly choosing to buy things made with forced labor. And so this is where I would start if I were you. I wouldn't be waiting for a report from us. It's too late, right? So what's happening though is that Chinese companies are catching on. They delete things the minute I look at them, right? They, the whole multinational corporations have deleted their entire websites because I put a thing on Twitter once. Um, uh, this is really strange for, as, a small, uh, as a girl from small town Luling, Louisiana to be like stopping multinational corporations in their tracks. It's nonsense. What do they have to be afraid of? Um, but like this is what's happening. They're erasing the evidence of their wrongdoing rapidly and, um, and they're trying to change the game up. I often use the analogy of the, of the television show The Wire um, where like the drug dealers are constantly changing the game up and the police are trying to chase that, but they're always a step behind of figuring out how they're doing what they're doing. Um, this is how our research work works too. We're always trying to see like how are they changing it up. And, and I was asked to, to, <laughs> to list ways that companies are obscuring their supply chains and I couldn't even fit it on one slide. And, and you probably have a tiny, the font is probably, the font is probably unreadable still, but the, they're doing all kinds of things and we notice it every single day. And this is, we're doing manually, but this is even easier to see on the platforms that you're, uh, you're being exposed to this week. But we're seeing companies that have eliminated the names of their customers from their press releases. Like, hey, we just sold so much of our goods for a five-year con contract to a party to be unnamed because that party no longer wants to be named as a, as a purchaser of a good from a company that, say, maybe um, is, you know, got a WRO against them. 
uh, or they are bifurcating their supply chains and going around telling everyone, hey, look, we've got this new supply chain outside of the Uyghur region. It's absolutely untouched with um, uh, forced labor. And then they tell everyone that. And then it turns out that only 10% of their supply is made outside of that, outside of the Uyghur region supply chain. But everybody in Europe is like, oh, it's going to be OK. And I'm like, y'all, that stuff is going to the US. That 10% is going to the US. It's not being made for you. And, but everybody's being sold the same clean cotton. They're all being sold the same clean polysilicon. Don't be fooled, right? We're also seeing companies changing the name of record. This happened just on the, on the flight here. I was like, How, who is this company? And the company was a company that I've spent a lot of time talking about, but they just rearranged the names or rearranged the letters in their name uh, in their shipping records or, in their, um, or they create avatars, like new companies that are not new companies at all because all of a sudden, this new company has all of the... Um, uh, customers that the old company has. And, I, and they're like, oh no, we sold, we sold this company. We're still in the business, but we sold that factory to someone else. You sold that factory and all of your biggest customers to that dude who used to be a manager in your factory? Really? Okay. We'll see about that. And so, like, we see, see companies uh, exporting things through shippers or subsidiaries or parents or ports outside of the Uyghur region and pretending like, oh, you know, we, we no longer are manufacturing in the Uyghur region, but they manufacture everything in the Uyghur region. You have, like, it's, it's not even, I mean, it's just, like, it almost feels like it's an insult. <laughs> it's an insult, the, like, cat and mouse games that they're trying to play. Um, and it, it can't be successful. We can see these things. They're operating in the same address, but they've changed their names. They've sold the company to someone, but they haven't actually, they don't have any records of sale. Um, but they, they tell me, oh, we sold that company. But of course, they're still operating. Um, we're seeing custom brokers set, step in and, and import things that you can, within two steps, like a two-minute search, you can see are coming directly from the Uyghur region, including from Chen Guang. Um, Chen Guang, by the way, is also deeply engaged in labor transfers and expropriating Uyghur lands. And so we are seeing all kinds of ways that companies are falsifying their documents, paying for audits where um, Americans are telling them that they've got a clean bill of health in the Uyghur region, and it's not true. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing all kinds of ways that companies are obscuring their supply chains and trying to fool you into continuing to buy their products. I want to take a minute um, to reflect on what this means and what it is we're doing here by reciting all this information and reminding ourselves of, of our risk in this world. I regularly hear from businesses about the risk. I, we need to you know, limit our risk, our, our exposure. Um, we need to limit our financial risk, our legal risk. And as a human rights researcher, I think you're talking about the wrong risk, right? There are 12 million people in the Uyghur region, 12 million people who every single day are terrified that they will have a sack put over their heads, that they will disappear in the night. People who go to sleep wearing layers of clothes so that when they end up in an internment camp, they have underwear, right? We are talking about a risk to 12 million people who are working in your supply chains. You, I, I hear businesses talk about, oh, there's a risk to my Chinese worker on the ground in China because if we talk about forced labor, if we say the word Xinjiang, we will, um, we will risk our workers' lives. Three million Uyghur workers work for you. You may not pay them directly. No one pays them directly. And you are profiting from them. And you are talking about your business risk, your legal risk. I am talking about the risk of participating in a genocide, of financing a genocide, because that's what we're doing. And consumers can only do so much to prevent that. I can only do so much wearing of my used clothes to be able to prevent that. The people in this room have a responsibility to make sure that these folks who are saying, I don't want to go and work in this factory. I want to stay with my family. I don't want my children to go to a boarding school where they'll be only taught in Chinese. I don't want my elders to be put in an elder care facility. I don't want my land to be taken away from me. I don't want to have my land polluted. I don't want to, people who are not wanting to do this work are doing it, they're doing it for us. 
and they're, you're making money from it. So I don't want to hear, <laughs> I don't like talking about risk to your business. I like talking about risk to Uyghur people. And until you are doing every single thing you can do to make sure that you change what's happening for the Uyghur people, or at least make sure that you're not profiting from it, until you're doing every single thing you can do, you should not sleep at night. I mean it. I don't know how you do it. And so, all of that said, I think there's some reasons for us to be optimistic. And I am out of time, but I'm going on. Um, I think there's some reasons for us to be optimistic. I think that we have together done some pretty incredible things to address this crisis. It's, it's remarkable as someone who, I, who lived in the Uyghur region, who's watched this um, situation deteriorate over 20 years, to see how people have come together and how quickly we've been able to make change when people finally recognized how urgent this situation is. I think that there are ways that we know that what we're doing is working and we need to remind ourselves of it. We're seeing the expansion of manufacturing capacity outside of China and outside of the Uyghur region increase more quickly than we would have were we not paying attention to this human rights violation. A lot of people said, oh, if we, and still do, oh, if we look at what's happening to the Uyghurs, we will slow down our, our route to, to addressing climate change. We will slow down manufacturing. We will slow down our economy. I say it's worth it, but even for you, for you who have to build things and make things and sell things, I get it, you have a job too. Um, we're actually seeing diversified supply chains come on board more quickly because you're having to find a way to buy things outside of that region. This is good for all of us. It's good for the planet. It's good for the economy. It makes supply chains more sustainable. This is actually happening. We're seeing it happening. It's real. We're also seeing increased innovation. The deflated, the artificially deflated prices of goods made in the Uyghur region meant that we were not able to invest in expensive innovations because we could always buy things so damn cheap because no, like the Uyghur people were being forced to work and their lands were being expropriated and their land was being polluted. And so those artificially deflated prices created a lack of competition both in like supply chains and, and, and manufacturing and in innovation. We're seeing more innovation be able to come out. There's also investment on government's part to try to address this and make it possible to diversify supply chains. And that, I think, was sped up or maybe even created in a way by addressing, by the, the desire to address this crisis. We're also seeing Chinese, some, few, very few, Chinese companies come out and say, we're no longer participating in the labor transfer programs. It's very few of them. We're not seeing, and this is the thing, the, the rebuttable presumption question. <laughs> There's nothing I want more in the world than to find the Schindler who is out there in the Uyghur region, like employing a whole bunch of Uyghurs, protecting them, making sure none of them end up in an internment camp. But let me tell you something, the people who are working in the Uyghur region watch their colleagues disappear in the night and they don't shut down their factories. They don't say, oh, that's it, I'm not doing this anymore. They keep producing stuff for you. And so, and for, the, for Xi Jinping and for the Chinese government, right? So we are in a situation where Chinese government companies outside of the Uyghur region, a couple of them have said we're not going to use those programs anymore because of international pressure, because of brand pressure. That needs to keep happening, and they need to be more public about it. Um, and we're seeing changes in PRC government repression. They're lowering the visible signs of their repression, but forced labor is the space in which they're really cracking down on people and being able to control them, and so we need to keep putting pressure on forced labor. We're also seeing international human rights due diligence move more quickly. Um, that might not be your favorite thing in the world. It is my favorite thing in the world. And people who, are, um, who work in labor rights have been fighting for this stuff for 20 years, and now we're seeing it actually come to fruition. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing you guys create new tech to try to help us map this. Um, and I want to also be sure to like make a, a, a plea to those of you who are in the tech side, too. This information, if a company can put it in their desk and ignore it, you are also not doing everything you can. And so to that end, I want to announce <laughs> that we, my team and Sheffield and Northeastern University are putting together a free online supply chain tracing platform using the insights that we have gained to be able to make it possible for you to do some of that tracing for free. We're small, we're scrappy, and we don't have $2 billion from the US government to do this work. But 
I don't know anybody does, but um, <laughs> but we are t we're at it. So it won't be as fancy as the things that you guys are talking about here. But we will be able to show you some of the insights that we're gaining and be able to put that stuff in an automated system so that you can see supply chain trace uh, supply chain mapping. This will be coming out in a pilot version at the end of the year. It's no time soon. Please buy the products that you're hearing about now. Do not wait. But we are going to do that, and that's because we want small and medium enterprises to be able to actually afford to do this, not just the big guns. And because we want, when companies don't do what they should do, we want journalists and nonprofit advocates and, and, and people like me to be able to hold them to account, and CBP. Um, and so, that is me. I am way out of time. But uh, thank you very much for your, for your time. I want to welcome everyone back. So exciting to kick off our industry presentations uh, for the rest of the day here. So first of all, we're going to start off with uh, Deloitte, uh, Deloitte Financial Advisory Services. Uh, so they're going to be discussing their integrated technical capabilities to increase supply chain transparency, accelerate, that, accelerate analyst decision making, and illuminate supply chain risks across industry. So presenting for Deloitte, uh, we've got two, two speakers. We've got um, Mr. Philip Giacchini, who is the senior manager um, and for uh, Magnify product owner. Mr. Giacchini is a senior manager in the Deloitte strategy and analytics practice, where he serves as a product owner for the Magnify platform. He has spent 10 years building and delivering analytics platforms for the federal government focused on putting mission data in the hands of operators to more quickly and efficiently respond to a changing landscape of new threats and priorities. And also from Deloitte, we've got Ms. Antoinette Wollner, who is the manager for investigations and intelligence. Ms. Wollner lived in Beijing for several years and is part of Deloitte's intelligence and investigations practice, uses her language and regional knowledge to gather information on Chinese corporate networks for federal law enforcement clients, including support to CP's National Targeting Center on cases regarding Force Saber in the Xinjiang region. Ms. Wilner's skills include identifying niche international information and data sets that may be incorporated into data accelerators or used to illuminate unknown network connections. I'd like to welcome Philip and Antoinette. Thanks for that great intro. This one? There. Hey, thank you all. Um, you know, Mr. Choi did a, an excellent job already of, of giving us a brief introduction. Um, just to reiterate, my name is Antoinette Wollner. I'm, I'm a manager in Deloitte's investigations and intelligence practice. Uh, and in that role, I help clients access a multitude of data sources. I'm leveraging a tailored trade craft tools, techniques, and my own in-country experience in China to assist in the uh, development of holistic understandings of the operating ecosystems um, around persons or entities of interest. With me today, Phil Giacchini. I'll give him a few minutes to just quickly go back through his background. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'm Phil Giacchini, Senior Manager in our Analytics Practice. I uh, have the honor of being the product owner for the Magnify Asset. Um, over my tenure at Deloitte, I've built uh, a number of systems for the federal government, and now I've focused time and energy in building internal tools for folks like Antoinette to use throughout their day-to-day -day and accelerate the workflows and the contract delivery that they're, um, that they're supporting throughout the government. Oh. And two of our leaders were also on that slide, uh, Vaden Ball and Kerry Crowley. Uh, Vaden, sort of my analog in, in the analytics practice, Kerry also supports commercially enabled intelligence along with Antoinette. And moving right along into our discussion of um, our current understanding and methodology regarding supply chain illumination, um, at Deloitte, anti-human trafficking and forced labor uh, prevention is an important part of our delivery. We're deployed across industry and in the federal space where we utilize an integrated approach uh, through our Magnify tool, as well as our practitioners' skill sets and um, analytic capabilities to develop better understandings of business networks and insights into their supply chains. Um, so industry supply chains stretch around the globe. Uh, competition has brought more developing countries into those supply chains. Um, 
which increases the prevalence of forced labor at multiple points within them. Regulatory measures like import bans of, for example, cotton or other raw textiles materials from Xinjiang can be effective, but um, you know, as we've heard a lot today, these global supply chains can be really opaque. Um, and even with regulations like Section 307 and the more recent Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, imports which are in violation can still slip through the cracks. So our highly trained teams with regional um, foreign language expertise, subject matter expertise in data, data science, um, targeting and network analysis, have uh, depended on a, a proven methodology to assist clients in um, developing a better understanding of business networks and generating uh, insights into their supply chains. So Phil's gonna walk us through some of the technical aspects of this methodology. So our, our platform was born of trying to solve the problem uh, for, for folks like Antoinette on how can we aggregate commercial data, how can we aggregate mission data or, or private data establish relationships amongst the entities within that data and more quickly identify risky relationships, um, creating 360 degree views of an individual or a business or some other entity that might live within your data um, and use that automated generation of, of the link chart that you see here using a graph database to accelerate report generation, dossiers, Intel reports, um, and also use the tool and the technology to draw the attention to the users that to, to entities that they may not previously have had on their radar. So using those relationships to high-risk individuals, we can create non-intuitive connections and, and really sort of start to elicit the uh, full supply chain set of relationships that might exist amongst commercial data and, and um, internal mission data. Um, sort of the, the workflow for the asset, the, the, the way that we found um, really sort of takes advantage of both the technology and the data we have available is we know that our customers and internally have access to just a multitude of databases, flat files, uh, APIs. Um, so how do we ingest that? And we've created a data pipeline around pulling all that data together and writing it into sort of a uni unified schema so that we can start to create those relationships. So, you know, I may have a phone number. Antoinette may have a phone number, we may have exchanged phone calls, she has an address or uh, some criminal history and I can start to tie um, her data to other be potentially bad actors. Um, and one of the challenges with pulling all that data into the, um, into the platform is, how do we know that the Phil Giacchini from System A and the Phil Giacchini from System B are actually the same? So there's been a big investment in integrating a number of different entity resolution tools as well so that we can get the complete view of a single entity rather than have to sort of disambiguate records across a number of different systems. Once it's in the, once it's in the platform, uh, sort of probably very familiar view for, for a lot of you folks, uh, this link chart idea where you can just point and click and explore and compare entities amongst each other. Um, and once we start to sort of elicit that entire view of an entity or their organization, have a workflow specifically built out for generating reports. Um, a lot of times our, our deliverables are reports back to our customers on a, on a specific selector or number of, of folks. So rather than having everyone hand jam that data into a, into a Word doc or a PDF, we can, we can create that in a couple clicks. Um, a lot of features that we've built out, I, I talked about a few of them with entity resolution. The, I think the, the crux of the problem is the entity comparison and understanding who are the similar entities that I should be paying attention to? So a lot of time and energy into creating views that show everything I know about Phil, uh, and then using some of the algorithms in the back end to create similarity scores across other records. So sort of like a slider, and I can see Phil Giacchini and Philip Giacchini, and maybe Philip M. Giacchini, uh, and, and start to compare those entities so that me as the user can also make some assumptions or, or make a decision around whether or not they're the same um, actual entity. I think in the law enforcement space, one of the things I learned is that we really didn't want the system to dictate when entities were in fact the same. So giving the user uh, some knobs and levers to tune which entities are related and which aren't, um, and then sort of feeding that back into the system to help with tuning the entity, res entity resolution algorithms has been been really huge for the team. Um, you go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, uh, once we get the data into that format, um, 
now that we have entities with established relationships living across our, our platform, we can do some really interesting in, uh, entity analytics as well. So understanding common patterns uh, within the graph and within the sets of relationships that we, we know are, are problematic, we can use a suite of algorithms um, and some AI and ML sprinkled throughout to help with identifying similar but maybe unknown networks of bad actors. Uh, we call it community detection. It's one of the things I'm more excited about it across the whole tool because what I can do is create additional entities, right, almost like a, a false entity that represents a community of interest, um, whether they have sort of an anti-pattern in the relationships that we see across their data or even relationships two or three degrees away that have high-risk individuals you know, built off of models that use criminal history data to really understand who I might need to be paying attention to. And then we can load that into a leads, a leads view and have the, the user, the analyst, um, actually have a short list of potentially high-risk uh, communities and, and supply chains sort of right at their fingertips and they can dive in from there. Great, thanks so much, Phil. So uh, on the screen now is an example of how this might all come together um, to illuminate supply chain risks or to expand the scope for enforcement once those risks are identified. Um, so the general opacity of a global supply chain is compounded in a country of origin like China where um, the amount and availability of public information is tightly controlled and regulated. So in this fictionalized example, a U.S. company has terminated its relationship with a supplier following allegations that the supplier was using forced labor. Um, CBP may be made aware of those allegations and take measures to ensure that products from the supplier don't enter the United States for consumption. Um, but in this example, that's only part of the whole picture, right? So our teams might start with uh, some manual research and international records to identify enough information on the owners and operators of that entity alleged abusing forced labor so that we can confidently conduct entity resolution in Magnify. Um, when we then pull that information into Magnify, we can rapidly conduct a federated search across domestic and international um, records to just very quickly uh, establish additional ownership links to more companies that are um, producing and supplying uh, similar products, right? So the manual aspect of this research is really important um, and often necessary. As Dr. Laura Murphy mentioned earlier, right, this information is available, but it's often published in native language only or um, is, you know, restricted to access behind paywalls. Um, you know, some of the most information-rich data sources in China, for example, don't make that information available via API polls um, or through you know, large commercial corporate records aggregators. Um, we do understand, however, also the importance of tech enabling our investigations so that we can maintain the speed and scale that's necessary for you all to have operational relevance. Um, as such, you know, Deloitte's kind of unique combination of providing access to those foundational third-party data providers our agile and agnostic approach to go out and identify, start integrating whichever niche data is applicable for your specific use case, and our highly configurable models, which we use to integrate all of these components um, through the graph database that Phil was showing you, has proven really critical uh, for us to deliver consistent, efficient, and complete targeting packages for our customers. So with that, we would like to use you know, whatever time we have left to answer any of your questions. Thank you all for your time. I'll be around for the rest of the day, so just please come find me if, if there is anything you think of. All right, next up is uh, Sayari, Sayari Analytics. So <clears throat> Sayari is a commercial risk intelligence platform to protect finance, trade, and security systems by illuminating, illuminating global commercial networks that provide instant worldwide corporate transparency and supply chain risk identification. And presenting for SIR today is, uh, is Mr. Farley Mesco, who's the Chief Executive Officer. Uh, Farley is the CEO of Sayari Labs, a venture-backed and, and founder-led commercial risk intelligence provider, provider serving government and regulated industries, the former Chief Operating Officer of C4ADS, 
a national security research organization. He has consulted for multilateral and United States government institutions on financial crime issues and testified in Congress on the use of open source data to combat terrorist financing. His academic works have been published by United Nations, Brookings, the World Bank, and many others. Farley? Thanks, everybody. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, be here today, presenting on such an important topic. And uh, thanks to, as well to um, CBP for hosting us. You guys have been awesome partners for the past few years. Uh, my name is Farley. I'm the CEO of Sayari. Uh, in terms of just a quick agenda, um, I'm going to kind of quickly introduce us, uh, talk about what it is that we do. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how we apply our data and tech specifically to forced labor risk identification. Uh, and then I'm going to close with just a quick note about how we fit into the broader ecosystem of supply chain tech. Um, and then, of course, I'll be happy to kind of take questions at the end. So jumping right in. Who we are. <clears throat> this is us in a nutshell. We're a software as a service company that collects billions of corporate documents, uh, hundreds of millions of trade records from corporate registries and customs agencies around the world. Um, from hundreds of different countries across disparate levels of, uh, or uh, types of data, levels of quality, structure, foreign language, et cetera. Um, and we parse, transform, and resolve all of that messy uh, data into a nice, clean picture of companies and their relationships. Who owns them? Who controls them? Who do they do business with? Where do they source from? Et cetera. Um, once we have that clean picture of uh, companies, we then um, match those, that reference data to various types of risk content. So uh, watch lists like the UFLPA watch list, uh, the OFAC list, uh, the global equivalents of those lists. Uh, there was some discussion of adverse media yesterday, so we do include adverse media, PEPs. Um, uh, and basically all of that reference data, the core reference data, and then the risk insights on top of that get served up in a very lightweight, um, software as a service, SaaS uh, platform. And that allows analysts to do essentially two things. So number one, um, search or batch potentially large amounts of suppliers, entities, third parties uh, against all of that core reference data and risk data. And then number two, um, once you've found something interesting, potentially risky, et cetera, um, we do then allow you to conduct uh, deeper diligence and adjudication of those potential matches uh, within our platform, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but the idea is basically the, the batch and the investigation all in one lightweight SaaS platform. It's also deployable, private clouds for those with data uh, sensitivity concerns, um, and at enterprise scale up to um, thousands, of, thousands of users. Um, our fundamental value proposition here is that basically we can have your teams up and running with uh, forced labor risk identification, risk assessment within hours, right? It's lightweight SaaS. So you can do kind of a key piece of your overall uh, forced labor due diligence program, not the whole thing, but a key piece of it. Uh, you can get it up and running in hours, leveraging, uh, you know, insights from the billion, you know, plus node uh, scale analytics that we're doing in the back end. Um, and bringing as much or as little of your data to us uh, as you want. Um, and we can do all of that basically for the cost of about, equivalent cost of about a single trade compliance analyst salary. Um, we know that this is a very fast paced regulatory environment. And we also are aware that uh, risk and compliance budgets at your institutions haven't necessarily uh, you know, track that increased focus by law enforcement. We want to be responsive to that reality. I haven't talked a lot about the cost of all these solutions the last couple of days, but I think it's an important one that we can't, uh, that we can't uh, gloss over. Um, so let me talk a little bit uh, just in more detail about what we're looking for in the data with regards to forced labor specifically, um, and then what we can deliver for you all. All right, uh, forced labor risk assessment specifically. This is a non-exhaustive list of some of the different uh, uh, risk indicators that we, that we look for in the data. So kind of in the top bucket here, 
um, you can see that uh, we have very uh, supplier-centric questions. So who is my supplier? You know, what do they do? Where are they located? Um, uh, you know, are they a match to a watch list uh, like the UFLPA entity list? Uh, do they have an address in a place like Xinjiang? Maybe they haven't disclosed it to you, but maybe it appears in the Chinese public records that we uh, scan. Um, do they appear in any of the media reporting around these issues? So the obvious kind of supplier-centric stuff and so on. Um, we have records of about 400 million companies, 450 million companies worldwide. About 90 million of those are in China alone. Um, so we can get very, very granular on uh, some of these supplier-centric questions. But then down in the second bucket here, uh, you can see some of the risk factors that are more uh, non-obvious, right? Uh, entities, uh, you know, in this bucket would be risky because of their relationships, because of their networks, potentially out multiple hops. Um, and we're only able to kind of surface these risk factors uh, because of our ability to bring together this high quality primary source information and to uh, resolve it all together, um, draw linkages, and then kind of run our network-based approach to analytics across that connected data, so across that big you know, connected picture. Um, so basically it gives us the ability to say not only is my supplier on a list, uh, you know, but maybe their owner is on a list or a subsidiary or a factory or a trading partner or their trading partner's trading partner. So you can kind of string together these, again, these kind of multi-hop uh, risk questions. Um, so in short, we cover the obvious risks. We also cover uh, the non-obvious risks and the really insidious uh, supply chain risks, especially with forced labor, uh, do tend to be you know, buried deep within either these sub-tier supplier networks, as we've heard about, uh, the ownership, the nested ownership and control structures of these businesses. Um, and, you know, I think the unfortunate reality is you don't always get the whole picture from your supplier disclosures. Um, you know, it's obviously that's a key piece of it. Where we come in is we provide that outside in kind of external check or validation uh, of what you are or are not seeing in your supply chain mapping, TPRM, uh, and trade management systems. So, um, if that is the what of what we're seeking to identify, again, a non-exhaustive list of the what, uh, let's quickly take a look at what this all looks like in the product itself. <clears throat> okay, um, these are just some product shots, but uh, we basically do two different but related things here. First, uh, as I mentioned, you can search one or upload up to, uh, I think it's 25,000 entities at a time your suppliers, trading partners, et cetera, um, will match, resolve, and enrich those suppliers for you. It takes just a minute or two. And then uh, we flag any entities of yours that uh, are potential matches to those in our system uh, that have the pre-computed risk factors, you know, including the dozen or so I listed on the previous slide. Um, it, you know, do they own factories, you know, co-located with a prison in China, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of the first thing that we do. But you can imagine that in order to um, uh, sort of uh, answer these sub-tier supplier questions that I was talking about, we also have to do a tremendous amount of pre-mapping of supplier networks. Um, we have to pre-map, have pre-map supplier suppliers, their corporate networks, you know, at least again, what we can see from the outside looking in using the public data, using the commercially available data that we, that we source. Uh, so the second thing that we do is we give you the ability to click through kind of to the more detailed graph or dossier or dashboard views, which I don't have screenshots of, but the other more detailed, more investigator style views of the data. Um, so in this case, you would see, you know, you click through and you would see the sub-tier supplier relationships of a US importer, uh, you know, as disclosed again in customs data, tracing back to Xinjiang with shipments all post UFLPA implementation. Um, and to get this detailed picture, again, you know, kind of working from right to left on, on your screen, um, we have to basically resolve together U.S. import records, uh, import and export data, and, and corporate data from Colombia, from Mexico, from Ecuador, from India, uh, and then export and corporate data from China on the other side of the screen. So you get this complete kind of contextualized picture of uh, a sub-tier supplier network like this. So uh, basically, if an entity has a... 
a pattern like this in our system, again, across those billions, hundreds of millions, billions of, of nodes in our system, uh, we flag it. Uh, we flag it with a, uh, you know, in that in that previous batch view and kind of throughout the product, uh, depending on how you're interacting with it. Uh, and then your teams again can kind of click through and explore uh, this more detailed view, double click on nodes to you know expand their networks, add their corporate hierarchy to the same graph as the supplier network. Um, but this is the product again, the outside in view of the supply chain, using public and commercial data. And I think that last point is a good segue. You've heard it kind of throughout this event. Uh, an important caveat to everything I've just said is that we provide a piece of the puzzle, a robust uh, piece of the puzzle, but a very much outside in view uh, of the supply chain. We want to make it easy for you to integrate us with other tools uh, and systems, including maybe the inside out view from your supplier system of record, uh, really down to that bill of materials level uh, and tracing back to, to, you know, to the factory level. So, so we want to make it easy to integrate with us and integrate us with your existing systems. So I'll quickly hit that and then uh, open it up for questions. All right, so as I said, we're lightweight SaaS. There's a ton you can do with our platform. Uh, we can definitely deploy as a standalone uh, risk identification adjudication tool. Um, but given that it is lightweight SaaS, we're also uh, you know, very uh, aware of the fact that we can't do, any, uh, do everything. Um, and we've tried to make it easy to integrate with your existing systems. So this is roughly how it all fits together. Kind of the upfront risk identification, some of the adjudication work, diligence work uh, can be done in Sayari, again, either on kind of a one-off basis or, or uh, you know, utilizing the, the, the batch functionality. Um, uh, we can also consume data from your supplier system of record, from your supply chain mapping, the outputs of your supply chain mapping systems and processes. Um, and then we can also uh, push out our risk factors, our risk indicators to uh, you know, either your third party risk management system uh, you know, for supplier onboarding, monitoring, um, and then uh, to your global trade management system as well for, for screening. Um, and then finally, uh, we do actually support quite a number of responsible sourcing teams, uh, again, who have a very uh, important role to play in um, program design, oversight, and conducting forced labor due diligence. So, um, to recap, for us, you know, we're a SaaS platform uh, which identifies these potentially risky suppliers around the world based not only on the obvious criteria but also on the networked kind of uh, non-obvious criteria. Um, and then the kind of the second thing we do is we give your team the tools to uh, dig deeper into those supplier maps, those corporate networks, uh, either in our tool or across uh, your broader set of systems. Um, all with the ultimate goal, of course, of identifying uh, potential forced labor concerns, um, managing legal reputational risk. If something goes wrong, um, potentially uh, giving you visibility as to why uh, law enforcement may have made a detention or seizure. Um, and, uh, but though in, a, in an ideal world, kind of proactively uh, you know, uh, avoiding supply chain disruptions before law enforcement gets involved in the first place. So, thank you, that's it. Um, I really look forward to your questions and please do find me afterwards uh, if you want to discuss further. Hi, Caroline Dale from Flexport. Um, thank you, first of all. I think one of the more uh, valuable things that I can see out of Sayari in particular is the mapping of the related entities, um, especially getting into PRC entities where it's a tougher challenge for non-Chinese speakers. Um, but going back to what Dr. Murphy mentioned this morning with regard to name changes, um, subsidiaries being established, can you speak a bit to how the platform adapts and ensures that there's an awareness on the company side of those sorts of changes from their suppliers? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, so the question certainly is, uh, is, is about um, the, the velocity of data and data changes that we have to deal with. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the ultimate goal for us, uh, and again, we're talking 100 million plus, multi 100 million plus node scale here, is to um, rebuild our global graph every week to two weeks. Um, and so we, uh, we do that every two weeks and we try to introduce, um, you know, new or, or kind of refreshed data on existing entities at, 
monthly, quarterly, some jurisdictions like China, again, it takes a long time to get through 90 million companies, but at the very least, um, kind of with that quarterly cadence. And then again, it's all, it gets all resolved using the same uh, entity resolution logic that, that we use, and so we do pick up those name changes uh, and everything else. Um, we pick up new trade records uh, for those entities. Um, but yeah, it's a huge data management problem, data management challenge, for sure. Uh, but one that's very much top of mind. Hey, um, thanks for the presentation. I think that the platform looks really cool. Um, and I just to clarify, um, I think you also make a really good point about the cost, too. Um, just to clarify for him initially, so is a mapping plus diligence tool that companies could use for, for part of both of those objectives? Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you, but yes, yeah, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is exactly what it is. It is a, it's a piece of mapping and a piece of diligence. Great, awesome. Um, I have a question. So you, you mentioned the um, risk identification and then also the risk assessment. Um, and I, I appreciated you guys putting up the various factors that you look at for the risk assessment and identification piece. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to how, when the flags do pop up, how you weight those. So do you have like low, medium, and high risk that gets weighted flagged for the customer, or is it all just kind of one flag? Um, it's a good question. So right now, um, there's, there's a elevated high critical uh, kind of schema or ontology. Um, something that is a match to the OFAC list is going to be rated higher than something that has adverse media about a, you know, potentially using forced labor or something like that. Okay. Um, so we have to have some stratification there, but I think our ultimate goal is to move this more uh, qualitative and thematic rather than uh, force ranked like that. Because it, it's frankly different for everybody. Um, you know, and I think we, uh, we want to, we want to, we want to kind of own the qualitative, and we want to put that the knobs in the hands of the uh, the, the users for for the um, severity. That's awesome. Okay, thank yep. you. Yeah. Anything else? Going once. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. All right, next presenting is Everstream Analytics. We'll be presenting on technology solutions for comprehensive sub-tier UFLPA risk assessments. So presenting for Everstream is uh, Mr. Jim Hayden, who is the chief data scientist for Everstream Analytics. Jim is an innovator in creating analytical solutions to solve emerging problems in the finance, telecommunications, and supply chain industries. Jim leads the data science teams in building scalable, predictable, predictive, and prescriptive supply chain solu risk solutions. Before joining Everstream Analytics, Jim was the chief technology officer at Savvy Technology, a leader in IoT and big data analytics technologies for supply chains, and vice president and chief strategy officer at Mantis, a global leader in the trading compliance and anti-money laundering software market. Jim? Oh, I guess we also got it up. So John as well? OK, also we have uh, John Bovin also presenting. Sorry, John. John is the head of Discover and UFLPA at Everstream Analytics. John is the head of uh, where he focuses on automated multi-tier mapping and force labor technology solutions. He has more than 30 years of experience as a technology leader and solution strategist at firms such as KPMG, Ariba, Resolink, Aravo, CVM Solutions, Salesforce, and Oracle. He's authored numerous articles and blogs on supply chain risk, sourcing, procurement, and supplier management, and has been recognized as a pro to know by supply and demand chain executive. Again, uh, just wanted to say uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for uh, listening today, and uh, thanks to the CBP for the invitation as well. Just a, a little bit about Everstream Analytics. Um, we are a 
uh, call it a general purpose platform for supply chain risk um, and resiliency management. We have uh, hundreds of customers, some of the biggest and brands, uh, brand names out there from you know, Siemens, Google, uh, DuPont, and others. We, we span lots of different industries, um, from automotive to high tech to food and bev, uh, retail, uh, high tech, medical device, pharmaceutical. So we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, risk, uh, specific supply chain risk experience, uh, particularly in risk identification, um, risk monitoring, and also uh, mapping of sub-tiers, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we have received numerous awards, um, most recently, and I, I saw some of our other <laughs> presenters also talking about, we were recognized by Fast Company as a, uh, an innovative uh, company. Uh, we were number three uh, around data, um, data and analytics, so uh, we're really proud of that. What we wanted to talk about today was uh, was obviously specific to UFLPA risk. We've we've been doing you know supply chain risk management as I mentioned and being a platform provider for more than ten years. Obviously UFLPA risk and forced labor risk more recently, <clears throat> and we were looking at some very addressing some very specific challenges that we saw when we started working with our clients in this area. Let me highlight a couple of them. The first was, is, and as we've seen from a lot of the presenters, you know, you want to be proactive versus reactive. If you wait for something to happen, it's too late. It's tough to get out of jail, for, you know, free, as we've, we've all talked about over the last few days. So proactive versus reactive. The other challenge is, was around, you know, customers didn't have access, they couldn't pierce the veil into their sub-tier supply chain. So having that visibility into the sub-tiers very challenging. Um, the other is, is how do I do this at a mass scale? So as you saw, some of our clients, they have tens, 20, 30, 50,000 global suppliers. So being able to do one at a time, you know, to look for UFLPA risk just wasn't an option. They needed to do this at scale. Um, and then the other side of it is it can't be a single project. It's got to be something that you can do on a continuous, scalable basis. And so it needs to be something that can, can continuously go on and continuously monitor. So these are some of the challenges that, that we identified. Um, from a key requirements to address this, we really focused on these areas. The first was, was main, building and maintaining a continuously updated UFLPA watch list. In fact, we call it an expanded watch list, and we'll cover that in, in, in more detail. We also leveraged our ability, we, and I am, I'm the, the global owner of uh, EverStream Discover, which is by itself a, a, a sub-tier mapping capability. So we leveraged our EverStream Discover to connect the dots, both upstream and downstream, from the watch list members. We needed the ability to do this, as I mentioned, at scale, flexible matching from a client's you know, tier one and what you buy from whom to to this complex uh, uh, watch list. Uh, the other thing that you need is you need an ability to, to have a flexible analytics and reporting. So some clients want to look at an Excel spreadsheet. Some want to look at complex analytics, dashboards, um, reports. We want to have that platform. And finally, you need an ability to, to assess the risk and prioritize the most risky uh, identified connections on the UFLPA to the bottom. So you want to, it's all around risk. Because you can't fix necessarily everything at once, but you can prioritize. So taking a risk assessment approach. So what did we come up with? So this is our solution specific to uh, UFLPA uh, risk. And the first is, is, as I mentioned, we built out our own uh, expanded UFLPA watch list. And we did that by, of course, starting with who's on the, 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 the U.S. government published list. We then added and branched out into other NGOs and other research and other uh, names that we could put on, looked in media, looked at reports, as we've, we've heard over the last few days, they're constantly being added. Um, we then look for aliases, subsidiaries, corporate relationships, and then look for suppliers with also locations in the high-risk areas. So, and, and then we take that list, 
and then we build the sub-tier connections. Who are their customers? Who are their customers' customers? And so forth. And that's what we refer to as our ex expanded watch list. We, in order to do that and build that out in a sustainable manner, we do leverage our, uh, our uh, EverStream Discover product, which its sole job is to make those connections, is a multi-tier uh, automated AI-based uh, data-based um, uh, discovery method um, to put those together, not only the, at the supplier, but the location and the product level as well. We then built a, a very sophisticated matching um, algorithm so that we can then because we have this watch list built out, we have the customer gives us uh, you know, lots and lots of their suppliers, we can then put them together and then come up with a risk, uh, a risk priority, as I mentioned. Um, so there's that area. And then there's the whole, we have a, a very rich and sophisticated platform for reporting, analytics, and also incident monitoring. We have what we call an intelligence solutions team that actually uh, reports to Jim, um, who's gonna talk next around kind of how do we enable this. Thanks, John. I'm here to talk about a little bit about the how we do this. I'm the chief data scientist. It's a tech expo. I won't get too technical on you, though. So first, we start with our customer suppliers, and then we match them to our expanded watch list. That sounds easy enough. That first part's really hard. We ask our customers for their tier one suppliers, and they go, here you go. They come from ERP systems. They come from transportation management systems. They come from SNOP systems. Our customers, as you saw from the list, they're Fortune 100 companies. One of them has 39 different ERP systems. All those vendors are showing up in multiple systems there. So the first thing we do, and thanks to the previous speakers for explaining entity resolution for me, we do entity resolution on that. And that gets us to this consolidated list. And there's a valuable byproduct for our customers there. We can go back and say, did you know these four customers that are being used for procurement in four different divisions are the same supplier? Why don't you get some leverage there now that you understand your company dealing with that supplier? Then on the other side, it's build this expanded watch list. So the first tier there are the names and companies on the list. And then the next tier, who they sell to. And the next tier is who they sell to. So we're building out this network of not only the origin of the material from the entity of interest, but who their customers are. We're able to do that. Like the previous speakers, we have a knowledge graph that's built up using open source data, using uh, any data we can get our hands on. So over half of it is import-export records from about 75 different countries. That's notoriously dirty data. It comes through customs. And so there's a lot of entity resolution that needs to happen there. Not only that, this is where people play games, and they use different, slightly different names. Uh, they use billing addresses instead of the real facility where it came from. So you need some reference data to help you out there. So once you understand who the entity is, and you know what port they're shipping in and out of, you don't really know the facility it came from. So we have reference data sources, global directories of chemical manufacturers and automotive OEMs, and that helps us fill in the blank to get to the true facility. We're a location-based risk company, and knowing the facility is really key to us. We have applied meteorologists that forecast typhoons. We have uh, people that look, use NLP on news to look for facility fires, things like that. So this is just part of what we do. Those are the two major components. Once we've done that, we can do some matching. You got it? Thank you. John mentioned this watch list. So we start with the name suppliers, and then we derive any subsidiaries or aliases from our reference data sources using a lots of different similarity metrics. We're using graph-based technology here, and this helps a lot with identifying aliases as an example. So not only are we looking for the name and the address, and they look similar, did they change a few letters, but we're using context too. What are they shipping? How frequently do they ship? Who are their customers? That's all in the knowledge graph, and you can include that in your analysis for similarity. That gives you a much higher match rate on things like people trying to disguise names slightly. I mentioned we're a location-centric risk platform, so we know suppliers' locations. This reference data sources help us a lot with that. And then we know high-risk product materials. This is what we've been doing for a living for a long time. Who, what, and where is the risk and that's what we tell our customers. We try to give them as much context as possible. 
as we're deriving these relationships, as we're resolving these entities, we're giving confidence scores. We have this much confidence that these are the same two entities. So when you're making decisions about taking action, you have that available. When we're making decisions on these are trading partners, there's a confidence score based on how frequently they trade, the number of products they trade, how recently they traded, the number of different data sources that told us they were trading partners. All of that goes into giving you confidence about the data we're showing you where there's potential risk. So I'm going to show you an example here. We started with the entity on the watch list on top, and we've derived that there's a subsidiary and an alias. We then found out who they're selling to and who they're selling to. We come in with our customers, tier one supplier, and we start at the top and see if they match any of these. And our, in this case, our customer has ABC Corp as a supplier, and they happen to be a customer of the company using the alias, and then they happen to be a customer of a customer of the sub subsidiary, subsidiary of the top entity there. So this gives them a view of where we did the matches. We do some risk scoring. Actually, the closer to the top, we feel the more risk there is. It's a direct hit. Your tier one is this company on the entity list. And then the further down you go, it gets a little fuzzier, but we, that's why we give some confidence scores to help make decisions there. And finally is our platform. Again, we try to give as much context as possible. So when somebody's determining the action to take, they have all the information we could possibly give them. And I, uh, I have to say this as a data scientist, this is machine learning based. At the very essence of it, it's statistics. It's not black and white. And so uh, there should be a human in the loop before any action's taken here. And uh, just to round out the presentation, we, we do also have a continuously monitor, a continuous monitoring service as well, constantly looking for updates, whether it's updating um, who's on the watch list, other, others that are found, that'll be added and, and then balanced out as well, or if there's certain things that happen in the region um, as well as in this example. So we have a, a separate team. This is all they do, not just for forced labor, but for fires, weather, everything. So this is just one aspect of what we do. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is actually part of, uh, and what enables this is our EverStream Discover, which is the component that actually does all the data science, multi-tier mapping in an automated fashion. And this is what we use to build out all these connections specifically for forced labor, and in this example, uh, obviously around UFLPA. But this is a, um, something we could spend literally a, a long time on, and, and some of our uh, other presenters have, have drilled into some, some similar concepts. Just, just to, to finish up with some of the recent findings, we have been help working with quite a number of clients, uh, especially over the last few months, identify where the potential UFLPA uh, risks are. So just wanted to throw up some statistics on what, what we're seeing um, in, in these analyses. And most of the, the projects that we work on are, are over 10,000 supplier locations uh, around the world. So these are big, you know, big projects. Um, that's from a tier one specific uh, uh, example. Um, we also are seeing a match rate. In other words, how many connections, at what percent rate are we seeing to somebody on the, on the watch list, whether it's several tiers away. And we're seeing on average one to three percent. So um, that is just something that we're seeing, uh, just to share you know, to, the, to everybody out there. Um, what we're also seeing is tiers three and four are the most common tiers where things are matching. So if you're trying, if you need to do mapping, going down to at least tier three and four appears to be the sweet spot. <clears throat> The other thing that we are seeing is there's a lot of, as we've heard, you know, across the last two days, a lot of different products are are making the connect, are involved in the connections, and the top one that we've noticed is electronics. So clearly, electronics, and we've heard a lot around that, is is a big area. Um, so uh, again, just kind of giving you some of our our findings. Um, and just I'll end with again, we are a platform company. We've been doing this for you know over 10 years and there's a lot of elements to our platform. This is just one particular product 
to help clients specifically with UFLPA, but you know, around helping them understand and identify you know, potential incidents that are impact their supply chain, map their supply chain, uh, where all the locations are, um, and identify risks uh, you know, across lots of different dimensions of that. Is, and then also linking into their enterprise systems. That, that's a lot of what we do. So with that, we will move on to any questions. And again, thank you for, for listening. Hey there, um, Mary McHill from Miller & Chevalier. Thanks for your great presentation. Um, this idea of confidence scores is really interesting to me, and I like the way that you sort of um, talk about how there are kind of different levels of risk based on the confidence scores. I'm wondering, do you provide insight on your platform to your customers about why a confidence score is the way it is and sort of what the risks associated with that are? Thanks. Do you want to answer? So some of that secret sauce, it comes out of the algorithm, and a little bit black box, but we do. We, we tell them the features that go into that confidence score. And as I mentioned, here's a few of them. Frequency of transactions between the two, recency of transaction between the two, number of different data sources that were used to validate that relationship, just as, as an example of some of the few. So they know that, and, and this is, the, a confidence score is just a relative score. A 90 doesn't mean it's 90% accurate, it means it's better than 80, right? And so it's a relative score, and that's what we try to explain to our customers. So they can use their judgment, and then, you know, if they start getting lots of hits on 90, that was accurate, well, let's loosen it a little bit. Let's go down to 80 and see if we're still getting hits there. And that's typically the use case. No. And I'll, <clears throat> I'll just add, specific to UFLPA, <clears throat> um, we also are seeing uh, where a particular supplier may have multiple connections to watch various watch list members, and obviously they would boil up, so specific to UFLPA. Hi, Cindy DeLeon with DeLeon Trade. Quick question, does your platform have interface, um, uh, live interface compatibility with like clients' ERP data on supplier lists? That's question number one, and question number two is, how does the continuous monitoring output work? Is it like you get an emailed report when there are flags that come up on the continuous monitoring? Can you talk a little bit more about the reporting output on the continuous monitoring? Okay. Um, so, uh, great, thank you for the questions. The first question was around interfaces. Do we have, uh, can we plug in via APIs to external systems? Absolutely. You can't sell to large enterprise clients unless you can do that, so we do have that and we support that nearly every customer. Uh, around uh, in incidences, the incident monitoring capability that we do have is delivered via the platform and then the platform can also then notify, can even set up dif different uh, uh, email notifications, different groups, but it, it goes to the platform and then gets distributed out based on rules that the client sets up. And then the last question is about commodity specific. So a lot of the service providers over the course of the last couple of days have been talking about supplier risk identification, but how do you also incorporate commodities and the specific commodities being imported by these companies and matching that risk to the different suppliers? I can tell. Um, so uh, the, the final question was around, another good question, thank you, um, was around commodity level. So we, we actually look at um, three, three broad categories that help us also align to the, you know, commodities and categories and products. So we look at the supplier, the location, and the product that's part of the relationship. We call that, the, the, those three items, the relationship so that we can then look at that product as part of that overall uh, connection and go, what commodity is it? Is it aluminum, you know, out, you know, out of China? You know, risk level goes up. Is it silicone or polysilicon out of a location in China? Risk goes up. So we do have that level of, uh, of analysis as well as part of the platform. Hi, Caroline Dale with Flexport. Um, so when you mention location as one of the risk elements, are you looking exclusively at, in this context, whether it is coming out of the XUAR, or does that include potential co-location with prisons or um, location in a high-risk industrial park? Um, yeah, that's it. I couldn't really hear it. 
So it is specific locations in the regions or zones of interest that we're looking for the direct trades coming out of. But because we have these relationships, we're also looking backwards, if you will. Where did they source? Where did they source? And if one of those leads to that location too, we highlight that as well. Did that answer your question? Uh, sorry, I'm asking about high-risk locations that aren't necessarily located within the XUAR, but that we know to be high-risk either because they are co-located with the prison, high-risk industrial park, those sorts of indicators of a higher level of risk. Sure, we, we support all sorts of high-risk locations. We have risk due to drought, we have risk due to political environment, and yeah, that's important for our platform, doing holistic risk management. But just. <clears throat> Yeah, and just to add on, specific to the UFLPA <clears throat> risk, um, we do make those connections as well. So um, we're looking for suppliers uh, that also have, you know, could be a New Jersey-based supplier, but also has a location in the, in the uh, in the region that would cause a, uh, a an elevated risk. So we do look for that as well. Virginia Newman from Miller and Chevalier. Um, you mentioned the UFLPA risk score, and I think my colleague asked about the confidence level score. Um, and if you, if, a, if your customer runs a search on your platform and then you see a flag pop up, can they look and see what your rationale was and what sources you use to inform that? Yeah, as, as Jim uh, mentioned, we do provide many different factors that, that go into um, the confidence level, as well as we ex there's a lot we expose, so the client can actually see um, what what went into and made something more risky than something else. Um, there's also algorithms that we use and we explain sort of the factors that go into those. So some we don't always expose, some we do, but it's, it's all, part of, the plat all but they, part of the platform. They could click to like the source links if they needed to. Yeah, and specific to UFLPA, if we have a specific source, like if we put somebody on a watch list, we, it's not, because it's not just based on the, the specific U.S. government watch list, if we got it from Sheffield University or some other source, we actually link back to that source. So you could always go back to and know. What we try to do is provide all the backup material, especially around UFLPA, as we've talked about, is you know having support and linkage of, uh, of, of the findings is also important. So we, we also provide all of that, too. I was also wondering if your knowledge graph has coverage in all of the high-risk jurisdictions outside of China that we've seen on CBP's latest dashboard, like Malaysia and Vietnam. Do you know like how good or like what percentage your coverage would be in those jurisdictions? Yeah, and, and actually, it's a great great question around coverage uh, outside of just China. What we're seeing is a lot of the connections for UFLPA that we're seeing are not just in China. As we, you know, and we've, and that's why when I was in the audience listening, I was listening very intently. We're seeing the same thing, you know. Comp they're moving around, they're shifting, um, and and uh, you know, going in. So we're tracking global. We're we're tracking the connections wherever they go. We're following those. So we we're seeing a lot, you know, through Vietnam, through other areas of the world, and and so we're definitely seeing that. And it sounds like, it sounds like a lot of you are seeing that too. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Is this your award? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Our next presentation is from FRDM, or pronounced Freedom, I believe. So Freedom is a supply chain software solution used by global 500 companies in the United States and around the world to map, monitor, and mitigate risk for forced labor and supply chains and we'll present on in an innovative solution used to map, monitor, and mitigate risk for forced labor in supply chains. So presenting for Freedom is, is uh, Mr. Justin Dillon, who's the founder and CEO of Freedom, who's an entrepreneur, author, and speaker. He founded the enterprise software company with the mission of changing the world through the power of our purchases. Freedom is a business platform used by Fortune 500 companies to measure and mitigate the risk of forced labor supply chains. Um, and he's also the founder of and CEO of Made in a Free World, a nonprofit organization dedicated to ending forced labor, human trafficking, and modern day slavery through increased public awareness, action, and advocacy. Justin. All right. 
Good to be with you all. Thanks so much, CBP, for um, uh, hosting this. It's uh, been so fun to get to actually see uh, so much technology, so much interest in technology. I've been doing this for a while, and I was just uh, had a chance to visit with our friends at the State Department, who I used to work with yesterday, and got to check in with them. Having worked with them for over 12 years, uh, it, it's just really encouraging to see the progress that's been made, not just in the government sector, but in the business sector as well. So thank you for having me. Again, my name is Justin Dillon. Uh, I founded uh, Freedom uh, about five years ago, 2018. We are a supply chain risk software platform. Uh, you're going to see a lot of same, same uh, uh, presentation here today. So I'm, I know that I stand in between you and lunch. I'm, a, I'm very aware of that. And so I'm going to make sure that I burn as few calories in your brain as possible uh, by sharing more our story. And if you want to see what we do and how we do it, just come back there and Garrett, uh, back there and I can, can show you how to do it. But I'll run through it very quickly how we work. We've been doing this for several years. What's a little bit different about us is that we've built freedom alongside procurement functions. So less compliance, though that's ab obviously an area we're in and our customers hold those titles, but we've, been, we've built uh, freedom to work as a procurement and compliance team. And what that means is customers have given us their spend data. I'll explain that in a second. To date, we're about $100 billion in spend is managed on Freedom. That's B2B purchases on Freedom. Work with Fortune 500s, as, as we said in the bio. Um, industry agnostic, so we work with universities, aerospace, federal contracting, CBP. Most of our customers range. Um, uh, even managed services uses us to be able to uh, monitor their supply chain, oddly enough. Um, to date, we have over 471,000 entities that are actively monitored. That doesn't mean we don't have knowledge of those. That's what our customers have loaded and are actively monitored as of today. And we're able to monitor all the way down to the end tier. That means the commodities level. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Freedom was started because of a partnership with, uh, uh, with the State Department, which I'll get into in a second. But, you know, we're here to talk about the UFLPA today, obviously. We've been helping companies uh, comply with modern slavery acts around the world for years. And increasingly, we're now working with companies around the German due diligence law, the impending EU law. Uh, California Supply Chain Act has been around forever, and that's mostly just a due diligence law or, or a, um, one in which you, you're, the company mentioned they're doing something. I've had the privilege of being able to watch these laws all the way from California law, which obviously I'm from. Uh, for years, and it's been amazing to see how the maturity, not just in business practices, um, have been adapting, but also just the intelligence in which these laws are being written. Um, we see as the new laws come out, they get a little bit more um, attentive and pattern matching to the way that procurement works. But we do have a number of challenges still ahead of us that I want to get into. One of the ways that we work with, as we said, we work with spend data. That is our first party data. And so we work with partners like IBM, who's our go-to-market partner in the managed services space. We're embedded inside of large ERPs like SAP. We're even embedded inside of banks like Standard Chartered and Standard Bank in, in Africa. The whole point of our partnerships is so that we can live where our customers are currently operating. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what? I would love to buy another SaaS platform today. Literally no one. And we recognize that, that part of our innovation curve has to be how do we get to where our customers currently are and how do we solve problems that they may not, are, they may not understand what the answers look like. And that's something that's really important to remember here. Uh, anyone chasing perfection is on a fool's errand. You will never be perfect. Your supply chain will never be perfect, but it can be better. And I think that the point of this law and the point of the other laws is, is that we as companies have the opportunity to get better. Our mission as a company, we're mission-based. Uh, we're here to protect people, planet, and profits. We don't believe that any of those need to dilute each other. As, as Dr. Murphy was talking about earlier, we don't have to pick between people and planet. That's, that is a poverty of imagination to think that we've got to choose one over the other. I mean that. Transparent and humane supply chains save lives. So that's who we are. I want to talk for a minute about why we do this. Uh, supply chains isn't a space that, that I never necessarily thought I'd ever be in. Uh, years ago, I got asked by the State Department to build a platform called Slavery Footprint 
to help consumers understand their own connection to slavery. This is over 10 years ago. I wasn't that excited about the idea because I'm kind of a hopeaholic. I believe that there's good things in the world. I believe that, that we can create change from where we are in the world. And the last thing I wanted to be associated with was the world's biggest bummer calculator called Slavery Footprint. But we built it nonetheless 11 years ago using econometrics and statisticians and all the rest of it and building an algorithm that can determine for consumers long before any of you had to deal with this. Consumers have been looking at their own slavery footprint for over 11 years. They've been going to this website that the State Department and Google funded and they've been learning their own footprint. So in this case, consumers are way ahead of you. They've over 32 million consumers have been looking at their own supply chain for over 11 years. They've let lo loaded over 10 billion products worth trillions of dollars. And they've been showing up in the marketplace going, who do we buy from? This isn't necessarily a problem that gets hidden inside of the walls of compliance and trade. Consumers are increasingly aware and they want to understand. And while you might not be a B2C company that's working here, you have B2C consumers working for you and on your boards. So this isn't just a business and compliance issue. This is a human issue. This is a consumer issue, and it's only growing. The other reason that I started this company was because once I saw the consumers cared so much, I felt like I needed to go understand this for myself. What does the bottom of a supply chain look like? And I went all over the world and I actually got to meet some of the kids in India. And this is a young girl sitting on a pile of mica. She gave me some. This is mica. This is a raw material. A child laborer who works every day, and they dress for work better than I do, goes into rat hole mines to pick this out to go into our cosmetics, the bottom of our irons, our automobiles. That's what the bottom of a supply chain looked like. If you want to, afterwards, we can run over to Dulles, I can book a flight, and I can take you to meet her. That's how easy it is to meet the bottom of your supply chain. But the reality is, we're sitting at the top, and we're sitting at the end of it. So this isn't unfigure outable. This is something that we can get to. The greatest challenge in all of this, and all of my colleagues here shared this, it's data. It's not unattainable. My belief that if you want to create change, it's a, there's an algorithm for it. It's called will plus way multiplied by timing. There was a lot of will to create transparency in supply chains 10 years ago, but there wasn't ways. There are lots of ways here. You've seen them all. We all pretty much do the same thing. We're all pulling from the same data sources. Pick somebody that works well with you and go for it. But the reality is most companies don't have visibility in their supply chains. And when I learned that five years ago, I realized to be able to fix a social problem, we have to fix a data problem. Less than 6% of companies have any visibility at all, and 80% of the data, data, as our, my colleagues before said, is unstructured. Spend data is a hot mess in companies. That's the elephant in the room here. When we ask our companies for, for data, it comes in all shapes and forms and sizes, and a lot of times we're having to match those socks to be able to start to get them any kind of clarity whatsoever. There is a huge amount of work in federating data, and that to me is what was the other reason that I felt like this was a good reason to start Freedom. How do we take the world's data, start to put it together, change lives, and also change the way that we do business? Now, there's two ways of looking at this, and UFLPA has made this very clear. You can take a preventative response, or you can take a reactive response. Everyone here today has said, prevention is the best medicine, be on your toes, not on your heels, the best defense is a good offense, pick your metaphor, the whole thing is you had need to start and get ahead of this and not just be reactive once you find something. So I'm going to go through how freedom works and how we help you be preventative and also responsive. First thing we do is we do data federation. Again, that's the matching the socks. That's taking the spend data, helping our customers understand what they're buying, who they're buying it from, just at a basic tier one level. And then from there, we're able to start to map all the way back to commodities. We've built multiple different mapping tools. One of them that we're quite proud of, and you can go play with it in the back, is called Product Genomes. Essentially, it's a predictive bill of materials. I heard someone talk about commodities earlier. All you need to tell Freedom is what you buy, and we're able to tell you what commodities and raw materials and semi-components go into that. Why does that matter? Well, five years ago, when there wasn't as much of the mapping technology around trading partners, companies needed to know 
what products am I buying from what customers have the greatest amount of risk? And we were able to provide that for them. And by doing so, we're helping them do a job. That job is helping them to determine which suppliers need the greatest amount of oversight. We too, our customers have large swaths of suppliers, 10,000, 20,000, in some cases, 70,000 suppliers that they need to manage. And again, from a procurement team, that is a lot to look at. They need to know why things are risky, where it's risky, and what things need to pay, they pay, need to pay the most attention to first. So we're able to map that all the way back to commodities level and the products level. We also map in trading partners. Everyone has this, the way you're able to map second, third tier, go backwards, uh, all the rest of it. We're able to do that as well, where you're able to do entity matching and get a sense of which suppliers have uh, the most riskiest suppliers. And again, we use predictive and actual data, meaning is there an infraction that you need to be paying attention to through adverse media or, any, or on the UFLPA list. We, all that data is uh, loaded into Freedom and does that mapping technology just like everyone else. The other way that we help our customers do this is, is again, think of this as a macro, not just micro. A lot of the ways in which we've been looking at solving problems is on a single supplier level. Our customers deal in the macro, meaning that they have to look at their entire supply chain and know which ones, what has changed. And I want to speak a minute about our customers. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a data science background. I just have, um, I just love to make things that make a difference and, and give those to people. And I know that doesn't sound like much of a pedigree, but it's working for me. What I love about our customers is they tell us what they need. And I think that is so important. We take a jobs theory approach to innovation, meaning, I can build you anything you want. Are you going to use it? What are you going to do with it? What's the problem it's going to solve? Some of that uh, resonance and that 360 view and the intellectual honesty of knowing what problem a product is going to solve is so important in the innovation curve. You need to understand what someone's going to do with it and if they're going to use that. And that's how we've built every single feature in Freedom and continue to build out features is understanding what jobs are we taking off of our customers' desks, which include alerts and supplier engagement as well. Now, response is also important. Our customers, many of them have to report yearly, meaning that UFLPAs is something they have to deal with, but they also have to deal with the UK Modern Slavery Act and the Australia Act and whatever uh, uh, trade enforcement they have to do um, uh, across Mexico, US, and Canada. So they have multiple different jobs that they have to do. So reporting becomes really, really important. What have they done? Again, these reports are, what have you done over the last year? What are you planning to do this year? And so many of our customers come to us and go, what's the best practice? And the answer is, we're still figuring it out. Every company is still figuring it out, and the government is figuring it out. But the cost of doing nothing uh, continues to go up globally. Whether it's, whether it's here at the UFLPA or the German Act, the cost of doing nothing goes up. So our customers need to be able to have a repository of what they've done year over year. In Germany, you have to keep track of seven years of activity. Risk goes up, risk goes down, activity taken, remediation, all of that needs to be locked. So we're giving our customers a drawer with which they can track all of their activity and give them the ability to report. And quite frankly, what's very important to us is create impact. We're not here just to point at problems. We're here to make companies operate better and we're here to make the world operate better. So impact is a big word for us. And if you're not into impact, we're definitely not the provider for you. Um, all of our customers get uh, speed to impact. The reality is most customers or most companies, if they're looking at this, are looking at it from a manual process. So the whole point of this is having a very light load, a very light lift to bring spend data in, and within two months you're already up and running and, and uh, tracking risk inside of your supply chain. Uh, where we see ourselves going is the, the, the other elephant in the room, now there's two elephants, spend data and another one, you need your suppliers to provide you with information. And just sending them a questionnaire, speaking as a supplier myself, receiving questionnaires is not self-motivating. Why? Because we already have the contract. Why do I need to ask, answer more questions? Suppliers need incentives to provide more information. And I think that is the next code to crack in the work that we are all trying to do, is how do we build a network where suppliers are not just doing because they have to, but because it's good for their business. Transparency needs to become a value add, not a cost center for companies. 
That's the only way we're going to start to trace back at scale. One of our, like I said before, we follow our customers. We follow them into uh, what they do. And one of the customers that has just inspired us the most is a company called Oshkosh. They make big uh, 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 military vehicles, fire engines, lifts. Uh, they're the ones when your mail starts to show up in an electric vehicle, think Oshkosh. They're the ones that are, that are building that. Amazing company out of Wisconsin, an amazing individual named Alec uh, who's watching. Hey, Alec. Um, he couldn't be here today with me. We love following their innovation curve. And one of the things that we've seen what Oshkosh has done with our technology is start to take it and putting it into the procurement process. We didn't even know they did this, but they took our tech, put it into the procure-to-pay process so that as suppliers are come, get onboarded, they go through the, the vetting process before they ever become a supplier. We think that's amazing. And we think that our customers actually have the best ideas out there because they're the ones that are doing the jobs. So we're very appreciative of the way that they operate and what we can solve for them. Lastly, let's not forget that history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. We've been here before. We've been here before. King Leopold in Congo, uh, extracting the, the most precious commodity of its day, not mica, it was rubber. 10 million people's lives uh, ruined and destroyed. We know what the history books say, and we know that we can, as human beings, we have to operate better. And just because we live in the 21st century does not give us any preference or any superiority over what has happened before. We're capable of this. We're also capable of using our collective will, our collective buying power, and our collective intelligence to be able to get rid of this and solve this for good. Transparency does save lives, and it can save your business. Thanks for listening. Any questions? I was always the kid in the back of the room raising her Not hand. Today. I can't help it. Um, how would you recommend companies begin cleaning up their supplier data, their product data, in order to better integrate a solution like yours into their supply chain? It's a great question. Uh, first of all, um, uh, realize that you're in the majority, the 95 percent majority of companies that have data that needs to be cleaned up. So it is a, is a process. As Alex said, for, Alex always says from, um, uh, from Oshkosh, it is a journey, right? You are on a journey and you're not going to be perfect day one. We don't need very uh, detailed data to be able to get started. Supplier names is how we get started. What you're buying, uh, how much you're spending, which is just a filtering tool but also really helpful. Uh, the industry that you're in. You'd be amazed how much spend data companies don't even know what the industry and tying it into a NAICS code. Those are all really, really important data points that whether a company has that or not, we, can, we have a hydration process where we can hydrate all that data and pull that information in. Once that information comes in, just those five data points, we're able to start mapping all the way back to the nth tier. So it's not that hard, but like my colleague said before, sometimes companies have, you know, dozens of ERP systems that spread out. So we try to tell our customers, just get started with what's important. 65% of our customers add more data every year. So we don't get all of their data all at once. So it is a process and you can improve on it over time. One of the scores that we track inside of Freedom that we've created is a transparency score. And that transparency score is how much do you know? How's, has the data that's been federated onto Freedom, has it increased? Did we add it? Did you add it? Did your suppliers add it? That gives you a bigger, as our friends say, graph on your supply chain. Your graph should always be growing. It should always be getting bigger. And so just putting your spend data up first is just the first step. Make sense? Awesome. We're good, right? OK, thanks, everyone. All right, well, it is definitely a privilege and honor to host you in our home here at the Ronald Reagan Building. As you may have noticed that we are the premier destination for every fifth grade class that comes into Washington, D.C. for a field trip. Uh, so I wish you all the best luck as you head into the wilds of the food court uh, for lunch. So, uh, so we're going to take, um, take some lunch 
uh, please, we'll start back up at one o'clock. Um, I look forward to, I'm sure that everyone will have some more productive discussions network during the lunch. So we'll see you back here at one o'clock. All right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Hope everyone had a great lunch. I'm pretty sure in, uh, you know, maybe in 20, 30 minutes, we may see some planking kids up here or something like that. So but just uh, exercise kind of what I do with my own fifth grader, just try to talk louder and over him, you know, which comes at great success. So, um, so all right, so the first up that we have uh, that we'll be presenting this afternoon is from um, Helixa, the company Helixa which provides innovative solutions to physically mark, trace, and authentic authenticate products from producers to retail, uh, to retail, creating transparency along the entire supply chain. Now presenting for Helixa is Dr. Gediminas Mikutis, uh, who is the CTO and co-founder of Helixa. Gediminas is one of the inventors of the Helixa solution. He has extensive experience in project management, IP generation, and executing sustainability strategies. He's a member of the expert panel of the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. He works on projects related to supply chain transparency, and he's a frequent speaker at international events focused on creating transparent supply chains and supporting new legislation. Gediminas? All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gedi Menas, and uh, I'm representing Hedexa. Hedexa is a Swiss company that has uh, developed and is now commercializing a solution to mark raw materials and trace them throughout the supply chain up to finished products and even beyond using DNA-based markers. So first of all, um, why do we need traceability at all? Let me see if I can change the slides, yeah. So, Irrespective of the industry that you look at, here we show the example of textiles, of the denim. Irrespective of the industry, the majority of the environmental impact, as well as the social impact, is happening very much upstream in the supply chain. So it's happening not with your tier one suppliers, but usually with tier two, three, four suppliers. And therefore, from a brand's perspective or from a retailer's perspective, it's not enough to only understand your tier one suppliers, as the speakers discussed this morning, we actually need to go much further to be able to address the risks related to the forced labor, to address the risks related to environmental sustainability, and also to address even the quality risks to the very basic extent. However, this is by far not easy, that's why we are all here, and uh, to illustrate how difficult that is, uh, I can give you a bit of stats. So actually 60% of the claims on the apparel products in retail in Europe and the US cannot be backed up by any data. So there are claims on the products, but they cannot be backed up by the data. And to be able to take control of your supply chain and to manage those risks and to ma manage the uh, liabilities that you have, you actually need traceability. Now, if you think about uh, the most common approaches to traceability, there is the uh, chain of custody systems that can be paper-based, or nowadays they're becoming more and more digital, and they're based on either internal ERP databases of the companies, they're based on standards and the associated transaction certificates, and they're also very often based on uh, nowadays new technologies such as blockchain. However, these solutions are only as good as the data that you put into them. So imagine you have a supply chain where you document every supply chain step, but the documentation is not connected to the product itself. So if one of your suppliers exchanges the product with a cheaper copy, with a non-original product, your digital interface would still show that you have all the supply chain documentation, yet the physical product is not what you expect. And to to manage this challenge, you need to connect this digital information to the product itself, and that's where we at Helixa come into play. So what we do is we have developed a way to mark textile products with a unique DNA code, and we use DNA because just like each of you has a unique DNA sequence, we can chemically create as many unique DNA fingerprints as you want, and then use them to mark the products. Now the DNA on its own is not really stable, so what we do is we put DNA into these tiny capsules 
that protect the DNA from harsh chemical stress, uh, thermal stress, as well as mechanical stress. So this allows us to mark raw materials and that DNA can be detected across the whole supply chain up to the finished products. We do work in a few industries, so we started working with uh, precious minerals where we mark diamonds, emeralds, pearls. We also work on uh, precious metals such as gold, uh, silver, and some others. And recently we have been seeing a lot of uh, demand for traceability in the textile supply chains on one hand because it's quite, uh, those are quite complicated supply chains. And then on the other hand, there is also a lot of regulation coming into the uh, apparel and footwear sector. And then finally, looking long term, we are also looking into the traceability of food. We just had the approvals for Helixa to be used in food products, so we believe that that's also a market that's important to cover, where we would be able to prove the provenance of the coffee that you had this morning. Now, going into a bit more detail of how this actually works, so we design unique DNA codes, and then these DNA codes are applied as early as possible in the supply chain. So in the case of textiles, we start with a fiber, where the DNA is sprayed on the fiber, and then uh, at any later point throughout the supply chain, you can analyze the uh, yarn, you can analyze the fabric, you can analyze the finished garment, and detect the DNA. And this DNA allows you to prove claims related not only to the origin, but also to sustainability standards, to specific sustainability conditions, the quality of the material, recycling status, and so on. And we chose to use DNA first because it allows us to give a barcode to the product, so it allows us to give identity to the product, which means that the information is traveling with the product itself. So unlike digital traceability solutions, if you exchange the product, you would not detect the DNA, and that way you would be able to prove if somebody in your supply chain is actually counterfeiting the products. On top of that, we apply DNA in the very beginning of the supply chain, and because we put it into these small capsules, it enables the DNA to survive all the transformations. So we start with the fiber, we end up with the finished garment, and still if you would analyze my shirt, you would be able to detect the DNA that was applied to the fiber somewhere in Pakistan. So we have traceability throughout the whole supply chain, yet the DNA that we use is something that you eat every day, so it's something completely safe and it's approved uh, to be used in organic textiles, it's approved uh, to be used in food products, and so on. And finally, the DNA gives us the versatility that you need for supply chain traceability. So we can generate as many unique DNA fingerprints to give a unique identity to a specific supplier, a specific product, raw material, or even a specific batch. And this gives us quite a bit of flexibility. Now, going into a bit more technical details of how this actually works, we apply a unique DNA code as early as possible in the supply chain. So usually we, we start in the, just after the fiber is produced and is somewhat automated the next steps. And at that point, we spray a water solution containing DNA markers on the fiber. And from that point on, the fiber is marked. So the DNA evaporates, where, uh, the water evaporates, whereas DNA sticks to the fiber. And from that point on, you can trace the fiber at any point throughout the production. Then to extract the DNA, we do a PCR test. So first we flush the liquid through a textile garment or intermediate product. We extract the DNA, we load it into a PCR machine, and we detect the specific DNA. Now the key advantage of this technology is that it works as a key and lock mechanism, which means that you only detect the DNA that you are looking for. Just like with COVID, if you are analyzing for COVID, you detect the specific uh, COVID DNA, and the same way you detect uh, only the DNA that you are looking for, which increases the security of the system, so people cannot simply sequence the DNA and detect what is inside. Now, once the DNA is analyzed, we issue the certificate of analysis that can be shared with our customers and they can share with the regulators, with the uh, customers and border protection and so on. And in some cases, this data is shared directly with them. In some other cases, it's uploaded to, to external solution providers, uh, ERP systems, blockchain systems, and so on. And then some of our customers actually like to share this data with the end consumers. So in those cases, we also offer the QR codes where, that lead to designated landing pages where you can actually see the whole product history. And based on that, you, uh, 
in those pages, you also have all the data to back up these claims. So it's not a random landing page, but it has all the supply chain information where the DNA has been marked and at which stages it has been tested. Now this technology has been adopted by uh, more than 40 different customers across textile supply chains and also a number of uh, uh, precious mineral supply chains. And we do work with a, a number of leading European and US uh, brands and retailers, as well as manufacturers all across Asia, South America, and Africa. Uh, and to these customers, we do help to achieve one of the three goals. First of all, we give them the complete supply chain visibility, really starting from the beginning of the supply chain up to the finished product. And that allows them to make claims related to the origin of the product, so let's say whether the cotton that you are sourcing is coming from Pakistan and it's not uh, from Xinjiang province. It allows you to prove claims uh, connected to the sustainability of the product, let's say whether you are using organic cotton or not, whether you are using recycled fibers and so on. And it allows you to prove uh, quality standards. Uh, let's say if the cashmere that you are using has been blended with cheaper fibers such as sheep wool or even synthetic fibers. Secondly, the DNA allows our customers to communicate their supply chain story, this way increasing the uh, intimacy with the end consumer and building the brand value. This has been quite important with some of our customers and we actually do have data to show that it adds value to the product and increases the sales of that product. And finally, um, with the increasing, increasingly strict supply chain regulation, and I'm not talking only of UFLPPA, there are a lot of regulations coming into place in various geographies, uh, especially strong in Europe, we enable our customers to prove the claims that they are making on the products to avoid the anti-greenwashing legislation to apply to them, and we allow them to approve supply chain due diligence requirements. Now to finish off, I would like to show one use case which goes even beyond the linear supply chain traceability starting from the fiber. We do actually work on uh, recycling more and more because recently there has been more and more demand for proving of recycling of the products. And whenever you see this enormous growth in specific fiber demand, you know that there will be parties in the supply chain that will actually try to cheat the system and will try to provide you with the fibers that are not necessarily recycled or recycled from different sources and so on. So what we did in this case is we partnered with one of the European retailers to mark the post-consumer waste that they are collecting. And that's what a lot of companies are trying to do now. So they set up the systems to recycle their products. That's also coming into law in many uh, jurisdictions. So they collect the products, then they ship it to a production country somewhere on the other side of the world. And then they can only hope that six years, six months later, or maybe one year later, they receive the products that are actually are made from uh, this post-consumer waste that they collected. And in this case, we actually marked the post-consumer waste. It was then shredded. It was uh, made into the new fiber, uh, uh, blended with a virgin fiber, made into yarns, fabrics, finished garments. And then in the end, the retailer receives those new garments. We do a DNA test and we are able to verify is it really coming from that specific post-consumer waste or not. So this allows you to have not only claims on origin of the fiber, but also allows you to prove the recyc recycling status and uh, thus you can make the sustainability claim on the product. So this gives our customers assurance to have this closed loop recycling system verified through DNA traceability. And with this, I would like to finish and I hope I gave you some ideas of how technology like that can be utilized, not only for the forced labor issues, but also to comply with increasingly strict regulation on supply chain due diligence on anti-greenwashing and so on. Thank you very much. Any questions? Good to see you. I'm uh, Jeff Wheeler, the uh, director of the Global Trace Protocol Project. We very much appreciate the work that Helix has been doing for us on the cotton pilot in uh, Pakistan. And it might be interesting to hear a little bit of your reflections on, on how the, this iterative process took place of problem solving, the importance of training, identifying some of the issues, and then having Helixa be able to help us work through them. 
Right, so roughly, I would say roughly in a third of our supply chains, actually we do detect that at some point through our traceability project, we lose the identity of DNA. And that gives us immediately the idea that at those points, the material has been mixed or exchanged. And there, there is quite a bit of need for education for the supply chain part is because today supply chains operate very much on the mass balance principle, which means that you don't have to retain identity preservation throughout the supply chain. And that's where we see the, the biggest challenge is where we really need to educate all the supply chain parties that look, this product is traceable using physical traceability. And this means that at every point of the supply chain, you have to retain this identity preservation and you cannot substitute the product by identical other product because in so, such cases, traceability wouldn't work. So I think this is one of the areas where we do have to do a lot of education work and that's where, where we need to still improve and where we need to work with the, the supply chains closer. Thank you for your presentation. Um, can you speak a little bit about how often this type of analysis would be conducted for a customer of yours and the co average cost? I don't know if you want to get into that or not, but you know, it just sounds very um, in-depth and DNA and it could be expensive. Can you speak a little bit to that? Right, so the amount of testing that we do depends very much on uh, how the supply chain is set up and how much confidence we build in that supply chain. So in the very initial phases on a new supply chain, what we do is we do test material at every single step of the supply chain. So let's say if we mark the fiber, we test it at the yarn stage, we test it at the fabric stage, we test it at the finished garment stage uh, to build a trust that the system works indeed the way that it is supposed to be. Because usually our customers have mapped the supply chain, so they do have an idea how it should work, but they are not, never 100% sure. And in those cases, we do test it in the beginning really at every single step. However, over time, as we build their confidence and as our customers build their confidence, they say, look, we can minimize some of these steps of the testing and this way make the whole operation leaner and really focus on the riskiest parts of the supply chain. And usually our customers are quite good at identifying where they suspect some unusual activity or where they have the lack of transparency. Um, then talking about the costs, that's uh, very much dependent on the scale, that's dependent on how complex the supply chain is. And then you have to think of the cost that can be offset at the retail side with the savings that you, you gain, that, as I indicated, by being able to defend the claims that you make in front of the regulators, to be able to communicate the added value to the end consumers, to make it personal to the end consumers. If you are buying a cashmere sweater, it's very nice to see the goats and the whole supply chain journey from which the cashmere has been actually made. And that also adds value to the customers. Now, to, to give you a rough indication of how much technologies like Hedexa cost, we are talking about a few cents per garment. So for the end product, that sounds very affordable. Now, if you are upstream in the supply chain, if you're a manufacturer, if you're a innovative manufacturer who wants to implement this, then the cost at that stage can be quite prohibitive. So we really have to be able to distribute those costs across the supply chain. Any other questions? Okay, then, thank you. All right, next we have uh, Applied DNA Sciences. Um, so Applied DNA Sciences is an innovative DNA supply chain traceability solution for forced labor compliance. They're using DNA tagging, DNA genotyping, and isotope testing for forced labor compliance. Presenting for Applied DNA Sciences, Mr. Jim Hayward is the chairman, president, and CEO of Applied DNA Sciences. Dr. Hayward has over 20 years of experience in biotechnology, pharmaceutical life sciences, and consumer product industries. Dr. Hayward is actively involved in the global effort to ensure the authenticity, origin of products, such as cotton, and the protection of global supply chains from counterfeiting and diversion. Thanks.
Well, first of all, I'd like to thank CBP for the Technical Expo and for inviting us. I'm Jim Hayward. I'm a molecular biologist and CEO of Applied DNA Sciences. And as our name implies, we are focused on nucleic acids and their utility in therapeutics, in diagnostics, and in supply chains. We operate under ISO 17025, which is the forensic standard. And we're pleased to present our certainty traceability solutions for secure cotton supply chains. Certainty is a multiplexed platform that relies upon the forensic strength of two forms of DNA. The genomics of endogenous cotton DNA, remember of course that every fiber of cotton is a cell. It has a nucleus, a mitochondria, a chloroplast is loaded with DNA itself. And we overlay with that with the security of unique molecular tags. And these two DNA platforms, in concert with the relative abundance of naturally occurring isotopes, form the three legs of our certainty supply chain platform. Now, we are a public U.S. company with our labs and manufacturing in New York. Since 2009, Applied DNA has really been a pioneer in cotton traceability using molecular tags and the genomics of endogenous cotton DNA. Examining how to differentiate DNA for cotton origin and for cotton varietals. And now we're using natural isotopes to identify origin as well. We also provide traceability for other materials such as viscose, polyester, leather, and we have done the same for military microchips for more than nine years running, automotive parts, O-rings, inks, including inkjets, silicone gaskets, and many other materials. We work with lots of federal agencies and with police departments all over the world. To date, our evidence has been used to prosecute over 170 international criminal cases with, more, with a 100% conviction rate in all 170 cases and sentences totaling over 500 years. Over 140,000 unique DNA tags have been designed and manufactured at scale in our U.S. facility. Now, as CBP has mentioned on multiple occasions, you need to know your supply chain. We, of course, agree and have developed what we call the certainty baseline as a framework to provide a systematic way to authenticate fiber, yarn, grige, dyed fabric, all the way to finished product. We firmly believe that the strongest supply chains have testing continuity between each of the nodes in the supply chain. It's more work, but it's worth it. Now, using uh, our certainty baseline as a framework, we provide an integrated multiplex cotton traceability system that consists of the stable isotope ratio testing for cotton origin, genotyping testing of the endogenous cotton for cotton content, and signature T DNA tagant that provides a fully secure, traceable supply chain. Together, these three pillars provide the industry with a complete and comprehensive tracking system for cotton as well as other textiles. The first technical pillar relates to stable isotope ratio testing for cotton origin verification. 
Now, stable isotopes are isotopes of the same element that do not appear to undergo radioactive decay. They're usually the light elements, and their ratios, because they don't decay, remain constant. For example, the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, or carbon 13 to carbon 12, or deuterium to hydrogen. Those ratios are very stable. Now, cotton is grown in many places around the world, and the isotopic ratios of those elements around the world were really established thanks to the Big Bang, and they change only slowly. So that you can use the ratio of those isotopes to track the origin if done with care. Now, for more than 10 years, Applied DNA has developed and updated a global cotton reference library from many commercial growing areas, aided in part by a USDA credo. Now, this three-dimensional scattergram with axes of the isotopic ratios for those three elements shows how cotton reference fibers form singular regions that aggregate, enabling the identification of the geographic origin of an unknown sample. You can see how different regions within the US compare to regions such as Australia, India, and Egypt. But these are for 100% cotton fibers. What happens when you blend a cotton fiber with another fiber, say recycled PT, or if you have a cotton fiber that has been extensively treated with finishes enough to change the mass. We DNA tagged cotton fiber in West Texas in order to carefully track these bales. Before tagging, we genotyped the endogenous DNA to ensure that the gin feedstock was exactly as they claimed. We prepared 60% cotton, 40% recycled PET as gray yarn, gray fabric, and finished fabric made from that tag cotton. Now, at first glance, these samples all appear to look like cotton from China. The isotopic ratio, the recycled PET, was different enough from the West Texas cotton to overlay the samples on the position within the scattergram that would normally represent Chinese cotton. Therefore, if you don't prepare your samples carefully, if you don't know the identity of what's in your fiber, it's possible to have false positives using isotopic analysis. You need to be able to subtract the contribution to the isotopic ratios made by blended components or fabric finishes. By analyzing the isotopic ratio of the pure recycled PET and subtracting that proportionately from the blended fiber, you can see that the gray yarn, gray fabric, and finished fabric all move to be consistent with West Texas fiber. In textiles, there are many variables that can impact the overall isotopic profile, such as bleaches, fire retardant coatings, blended fibers, such as with viscose, polyester, and others. Therefore, the potential of a false positive is always there if you don't identify the cotton components properly in the very first place. But the key point here is that 
the DNA tagged fiber enables us to validate the authentic cotton and also prevent a blending artifact with non-tagged materials that might promote false positives. Which brings us back to the true origin of cotton. You have to know where your cotton is sourced from. We have three tools that contribute to that, isotopic abundance, genotyping, where we rely upon minute differences in the endogenous DNA of cotton fibers that correspond to different species varietals and geographic origins, and we use DNA tagging. Since 2012, Applied DNA has tagged, tested, and tracked from the source at the gin to yarn, fabric, and finished goods over 400 million pounds of American fiber, cotton fiber. Our system has been well tested and withstood the challenge. Without the tagging, there can be doubt and uncertainty because there are infinite ways to blend cotton, dye, and bleaches. Our system is simple. Once manufactured at scale, a unique DNA tag is applied onto the fiber itself, typically at the gin or the spinner. Before the tagging, we use our genotyping and isotopic testing to verify the feedstock. Using genotyping, we have developed and patented assays to discriminate between the two dominant cotton species and for some of the varietals within a species. So for example, we can determine whether cotton is Barbadensi or Hirsutum, or within Barbadensi, whether it's Egyptian or American. The tag can be specific to the gin or to the spinner, and once tagged, you can verify it in raw materials, finished products, and you can also use the tag in packaging. The assay for the tag is a simple PCR test that can be done in the lab or on site in less than an hour. So here's how it works. Traceable fibers are tagged using our DNA transfer system. Each DNA tag bale is associated with a bale ID and issued a certificate. Portable PCR units, the colorful ones you see on the bottom there, can be used to test at each stage of the supply chain from the fiber all the way to finished goods. And these portable units are about the size of a coffee can weigh about a pound, and they can run from 16 to 32 samples every 40 minutes. In one day, you could easily test 300 samples at a cost of less than $15 per sample. It saves time in production and testing time as well. So all of that data can be tracked in our secure cloud, our certainty portal, which complements other digital and blockchain methods. Now we have the Cotton Library, the advances in next generation sequencing and in bioinformatics that can identify specific DNA cotton types and their origin. Mutations take place frequently in the complex cotton genome, which in some ways is more complicated than our own. Laboratories across the world have identified nearly 50,000, 50,000 single nucleotide polymorphs, that's a single change of one letter in the genome. And a SNP is at a single site with only one letter change. SNPs are responsible for many human diseases. All 50,000 SNPs are mutations that occur randomly. 
or in hotspots at known locations in the cotton genome. It is likely that many of these mutations can be used to characterize the origin of cotton within a geographic gene pool, much like Darwin's finches. And as I show, will show you, we've done for Giza, and it provides a means to uniquely identify the DNA from Xinjiang cotton. So the benefits of DNA tagging and genomic testing are you can be accountable for your own cotton and supply chain. It's faster, more affordable, and scalable. It's a portable forensic testing that can reduce lead times, and the potential for false positives now becomes vanishingly small. This is what I referred to a moment ago. <clears throat> Once mapped, as we have done here, genetic changes become biomarkers that can be used to identify specific cotton varietals. Here's an example of how DNA testing has already been done for Egyptian Giza 94. Once the change has been mapped, as shown in this electropharogram, simple PCR assays can be designed that can be utilized for testing anywhere in the world. Using next generation sequencing and related methods, we can genotype cotton DNA from different regions of the world, providing a faster and more precise way to authenticate cotton. So why are we all here today? We want to know that there is no Xinjiang cotton in our samples. And we also want to get cotton that we know we can trust. We've developed the systems, the tests, to identify global cotton, and we're working on developing a diagnostic genome, genomic DNA test for Xinjiang cotton that would significantly help in resolving potential false positives, and also a means to test global cotton faster and more effectively. And with me today in the audience are Andrew and Mei Lin. You want to raise your hands? And um, I'll be uh, leaving in an hour or so, but feel free to continue the dialogue with Mei Lin and Andrew. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, listen, thank you very much. All right, our next presenter is from Covisis, who will be presenting on a revolutionary tagless track and trace solution for item, item and package level uh, covert traceability to meet regulatory requirements. And the presenter for Covisis uh, is Dr. Naresh Menon, who is the CEO of Covisis. He has over 30 years of industrial research, development, and product launch experience. He's passionate about addressing issues that impact consumer confidence in areas such as e-commerce and where regulations require item level traceability, such as aerospace, medical, and automotive. He received his PhD in physics from Purdue with an emphasis in sensor fabrication, instrumentation, and novel data analytic methods. His early career was spent at Corning Incorporated and with Northrop Grumman Mission Systems. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Naresh Menon, the CEO and founder of Covices. Um, so Covices stands for the co being co shared and vices for vision. Um, really uh, excited to be here. Um, we have not done any particular programs or projects directly related to 
CVP, so it's a real honor to be here. Um, most of our work has been in supply chain traceability for other sectors where there are high regulatory barriers uh, for uh, requiring product level traceability. So what I'm going to talk about, I mean, this is a great uh, session to be in because we have two other uh, speakers who have talked about biologically inspired traceability. We're going to talk about another way of using biologically inspired traceability, using nature to uh, figure out how, where your parts come from. So there is a clicker here, I'm told. I'm sorry, I, th I seem to be the only one with an issue. Which one? Oh, thanks. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. It's kind of embarrassing to be a, a video alum and not being able to use a clicker. Um, so, you know, we've had two days of sessions of very uh, informative and sort of passionate issues about um, uh, forced labor. So I put myself in the shoes of CBP, the host of this event, and said, what is their big problem? It's an overwhelming problem. How do you know and how do you rapidly identify who the bad actors are? Because we talked about supply chain, there are many, many tiers as you go deeper into the layer of the supply chain. And, ha and there's over three and a half trillion dollars worth of goods coming to the country. And how do we make sure who to trust? Because Every supply chain is commingled, and there are people with far less resources and require far less resources to commingle the supply chain and uh, create confusion and cost. And at the end, this is all cost that's transferred to um, the, the end user, the uh, intermediaries along the chain, and we as consumers have to pay for it. And how do we find a way to solve this problem? So, so we developed what is called as a virtual tag. Do we go to phone? So today's solutions for traceability, I mean, we talk, there have been many sessions and talks about data, how we want to trust the data of our supply chain. But at the end, to trust the data, as the previous speaker spoke, you need to a way of physically associating your data with the article itself. Now, this is not new. Historically, we all have barcodes, QR codes, direct part marking, uh, uh, even tag-ins such as uh, the DNA tag-in sessions that we talked about, but they're all physically attaching a label to your part. This is possible in many cases, but then there are many, many, many components and parts when either the article is incredibly small or change, applying a tag changes the performance of the part or applying the tag requires you to requalify the component itself then you become, come to a case, many cases, where millions of parts cannot be tagged. So if you cannot physically tag it, and if you don't have a way to ac access the tag, we need another solution. Uh, so a solution is needed that is immutably linking a component to its data. And what we have developed is called a virtual tag. Now a virtual tag is not something, you know, um, hand wavy or blockchain. What it actually is, is we is a bio-inspired way of uh, looking at, a as an, at an article and create, extracting its fingerprint. So we take an image of the part, and from that part, we take the surface texture, which is at the micron scale. And it's well published that these textures are incredibly unique, even if you move around within the same article itself. And using that texture, we kind of take that, create a fingerprint, which is immutably linked to the part itself. I'm going to see if there's a if the video can be queued. Um. So, so using that photograph and the surface texture, we create two components. One is a traceability fingerprint. The other is classification. So we can actually tell where the parts made, what kind of processes were made, if they're common features, and then actually serialize, and if needed, individually serialize every part, do dual factor authentication. You have a serialized number, and then we verify it with our virtual tag. 
um, and is unique, uh, incredibly unique. We have done, and I'll, I'll get into the more details of what is the smallest size and speed uh, in a second. Thank you. So just as a recap, so it is an imaging technology. It takes us less than two seconds, one, one and a half seconds to take an image, and from that, at the edge, extract the surface texture, create the fingerprint, and then link it to it's either an enrollment phase or at a verification phase. Uh, it's a portable camera system. We have built it into robotic uh, systems for mass production um, at, at, at inline processing. Uh, it can be done at the uh, field of use. It can be used in statistical sampling of your, of your lot. Um, we do mostly rigid components. Uh, we don't do cotton uh, and other textiles directly, but we'll do the package. Which, uh, it's, um, it's immutable, it's part of the system itself, and it's covert. You never know where we have put the VTAG. Only we, as the authors of the, of the technology uh, and the sponsors, will tell you where the VTAG is. And we don't change the package, the manufacturing, or processing uh, of, the, of the system at all. It's all image-based. Um, the way we work with our uh, customers and supply chains is we create tokens. So these are, uh, tokens are a few kilobytes in size, and we link the data from one source, from one ERP system to another ERP system, um, just like you would do with a barcode. So what are our operational capabilities? We've been in business for quite a few years. Uh, we were all funded by the Department of Defense, um, and we develop our tech stack using the de defense applications. Um, we are, we've done complex parts, such as aircraft engine, which are high temperature. They cannot put a physical tag on them. They're required to be traceable. Uh, we work with the US Air Force. We work with uh, defense uh, microelectronics agency, microelectronics components. We trace it from the wafer to the die to the package and beyond. Um, we work with automotive companies, which you see down there are uh, uh, um, airbag initiators. We trace it by the pin, which is half a millimeter in diameter. Um, we do um, for medical devices, we work on implantable screws. So the idea is that it's incredibly uh, fast for inline use and is designed to be a minimal added cost to your operations because we have a machine vision camera which is bolt on to your process flow. Uh, that's our system. It's a pretty straightforward uh, off the, uh, camera system that we use, similar to something you would buy from Cognex or other machine vision camera systems. Our uh, intellectual property is how we extract the image and the, uh, how we take the surface texture out of it. It can be configured for multiple application spaces. So this is a quick case study I wanted to share. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we found in the industries that we work in is compliance is good, is important, is needed to protect lives, but there's also cost, uh, as many speakers have also alluded to it. Uh, so this is a case study we did funded by the Missile Defense Agency. The reg regulations require that microelectronics that go into our weapon systems are fully traced. Um, and what we did was we worked with authorized distributors as well as uh, an integrator such as Boeing, and how a microelectronic component from the distributor to Boeing can be immutably traced. Uh, uh, many, many hundreds of parts, the whole PO systems were created for doing the traceability, data transfer, and showing the assurance. And this was very important, because from that we realized, which was a surprise, our whole goal was to show that you know, we can have an immutable traceability link, but we started to show that we can actually eliminate costs, because a lot of, at every time a component is handed off from one distributor to the other, there's testing costs, there's validity costs, uh, evaluation costs, and those just add up. And within, within a year, we were able to show savings to a, a quarter of a million dollars and a very small pilot program, which makes it cost-effective for the system itself, because you're eliminating duplicative costs. 
Uh, and I think that's very important for those audience to realize that if you adopt the right traceability solution and the data solutions, you're actually cost neutral to actually saving costs because these regulations are not going to go away. We requ we're required to comply. And if you comply, if you comply the right way, uh, you can actually save costs. So how do we address a CBP-like problem? So we have not done anything um, for the CBP, so this is a hypothetical case study. Um, um, the example would be uh, you have an authorized source, an authorized distributor that you have uh, qualified as your distributor or a manufacturer in a source, and you can prevent any commingling uh, in any gray market uh, product introduction into that secure supply chain. At the end, it is the manufacturer or the, uh, the purchaser's responsibility to establish a secure supply chain, but you want to make sure that it's not defeated by gray market products. And that's what we can do in a very cost-effective way. Um, uh, uh, we have done tamper-resistant tags, which is you can put your own tag, and we will V-tag that label and make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, we will do things like um, part-level traceability. And finally, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have seen time and time again that as you increase trust in your supply chain, you actually systematically reduce cost. You're talking about less testing, but you're also talking about suppliers that we work with are motivated to do traceability because you can actually do faster payments. I mean, they're very excited to be able to pay it faster. It's not stuck somewhere in customs. It's not stuck somewhere uh, in supply chain. Hey. We are giving you an immutable uh, uh, way of uh, guaranteeing that the product that you have is what you, what you said you're going to ship. And that data travels to the customer instantaneously. So how can we help you? Thank you. Good afternoon, very interesting. I'm Thank you. Brenda Smith with Expeditors. You mentioned um, part level tech. Can you do it at the unit level, or would the picture look the same? Um, could you give an example of what you mean by unit level? Um, so if I have a pallet of something, and I want to know, um, or I have two pallets of, so of the same good, both produced. Um, I know what the fingerprint is on the legitimate, but let's say the other pallet is gray market. Came yep. from the same factory, um, same production techniques, but it was it's not authentic. It wasn't licensed. Can I tell the difference? Yes. So we don't we are designed to wherever we can put an image, wherever you have your trusted label. So for example, if you take a pallet and you seal it and you put a label on it, we can verify that label is what your trusted source applied. Uh, and even if it's, so for example, um, V tags are applicable on paper based or any other uh, physical label, you, ta you, you know, like a tamper resistant seal. If you break it and if you defeat it, we know that that tamper seal has been broken because it's, it's one of a kind. So, the, so you have to combine the label with the, the product itself? Yes, so, okay. so you have to have a trusted source where you know the provenance of your okay. product. And once you have that trusted source, we can do other part or pallet or wherever you put your trusted seal. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Hi, um, that was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, my name is Virginia. I'm wondering about, it sounds like this is mostly applicable to finished goods. Um, you mentioned that there's some part level traceability. I'm wondering if you have any clients or if you think it could be applicable to if you imported a finished good, but there was one kind of subcomponent that was of concern. Has anyone applied it in that respect to try to tag that subcomponent and then? No, um, for us it's any rigid article. So for example, uh, we could V-tag the buttons on your, on your jacket or zippers. So anything that's a physical rigid component, that's where we work best. Um, so anything that's, um, that retains, and as long as the surface does not get abraded or removed, uh, we can assure uh, our VTAG survives. Was that Thank helpful? You. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll... Um, We'll take a break.
uh, and then we'll get into our next uh, round of industry presentations. So why don't we return back here at uh, 2.15. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone back from the break. Uh, so we're in the home stretch. So we've got our last group of, last but definitely not least, last group of presentations. Uh, and we will start off with uh, Trust Trace, who is uh, presenting on AI-based solution for Uyghur Force Saber uh, Prevention Act trade compliance. Uh, so uh, Pauline, Miss Pauline God, who is um, the head of partnerships and, pro and a product manager for UFLPA has over 10 years of experience in sustainability management in the apparel industry. Pauline holds an academic background in economics and environmental science, and she's based in Stockholm, where she's been working at, at uh, the Trust Trace headquarters for the past, uh, past uh, five years. So with that, I'd like to welcome Pauline. Thank you so much. My name is Pauline. Um, I'm here to present the uh, TrustTrace UFLPA solution. And at TrustTrace, I'm the product owner of the UFLPA solution, as well as manage the partnership ecosystem, which over the days we heard a lot about partnerships, a lot about collaboration, which makes me very happy because there is no one silver bullet solution to, to tackle this. So TrustTrace, we're also a SaaS platform. We've heard that a couple of times today. Um, we work with the apparel industry for supply chain traceability and transparency for product and material traceability and compliance. We're based in Stockholm in Sweden, and we have offices today in India where we have our technical headquarters uh, in the US and in France. Now we're around 120 people and run some of the largest traceability programs in the world. Monthly, we follow around two and a half million transactions of material movements today. And we have about 45 different customers and 8,000 to 10,000 suppliers onboarded on the platform today. We populate a lot of more suppliers' data, but onboarded on the platform. We're trusted by some of the leading enterprise apparel brands in the industry today and have a very agile and connected team working to solve the different challenges that the apparel brand face today. We're also very connected with the different players in the apparel industry. And on the point of being connected, this is just quickly I want to mention some of the um, partnerships and the memberships we have today at Trust Trace. This is key to accelerating sustainable change in the industry today. We need to partner. And we have also just recently partnered with Caron. We're very proud for that. And this means that our customers can um, leverage the Caron list of restricted entities directly on the Trust Race platform. And it will, of course, bring more confidence to the data that is connected or collected in our platform. Last year, we also launched two different resources that have been very well received in the industry today. We have the traceability playbook, and these are open source. You can download them on our websites. So the traceability playbook is a guide on traceability for apparel industry. It was co-authored with some of the leading industry players, such as Fashion Revolution and Fashion for Good. Uh, and then we also have the Knowledge Hub, which is a curated summary of uh, some of the traceability uh, insights, uh, the trends, the laws and regulations that are affected the industry. So, about the UFLP solution that we have today, uh, it's a set of features that consist of three different components. So first of all, we have the supply chain mapping. Here, brands can discover and declare the supply chain, and it's to help them to make the decisions before placing a purchase order. So it's this proactive approach that we have heard sometimes these days. We have evidence collection and submission. This is after the goods have been um, uh, are ready for shipment, so it's too sure that the shipments would comply, for example, with a UFLPA. And from an approach standpoint, you should always have this data ready. So all of this data should be collected proactively. If you don't do that, it's, it could take some time. It will not, most probably not be ready in 30 days, but 
it's of course the approach that we recommend. And then we have dashboard and reports and all these things for actionable insights in, uh, in real time. And these three components together forms a very powerful approach for both risk detection as well as risk mitigation. So as I said, we're a platform. We help brand work across the supply chain. And we help them to expand the networks and insight continuously because this is ongoing, continuous work. Um, as the supply chain information differs across product, this is also key, there's not one sourcing strategy that all brands use. It will differ if it's a t-shirt, if it's a jacket, or depending, there will be several sourcing strategies. So we need to, um, to have solutions and offer solutions for all these different sourcing strategies. So here we see a combination of product insights into the supply chain mapped together with a data confidence level. So this is an overview, and I will delve into the different details of these different steps of the stairs in the, in the summary. So starting from zero, we have the bottom of the stairs, the um, starting from zero. We, we, we see this step when brands know little or almost nothing about the supply chain of a specific product that they are looking to investigate. So the starting point then could be to use global average trade data. However, as expected, the confidence level when you use these kind of data sets could be quite low because it represents a possibility of how the supply chain mapping looks like, but it's not really validated on a product level or a lot level traceability. So instead on level one, uh, we do supply chain mapping with declarations, and the brand stands sourcing strategies could be cut may trim or using traders, for example. So they would ask these suppliers to, um, to fill in information who they're sourcing from, that is who they're working with, uh, populate that data into the trust trace platform and form the supply chain mapping. If you go even one step up, level two, the supply chain mapping is then enriched with product data collection. So products or styles that are imported into the platform and the desired suppliers will also manually provide data on the product level. And then the third level is where the data gets even more granular, which is often needed today. At the material data collection. So here the direct or the fabric supplier can provide the details of the yarn or the fibers that's used for making the fabric in the material, right? So naturally, the more upstream you go, the more granular data you will get and also the more confident you can be in the data that is collected. So I'm gonna just show you a bit of the use cases of how our customers, our brands are using the trust -based platform today. It's sample data, we cannot give out the, the data from our customers, of course. So first of all, master data. So the brand would have the master data in the PLM systems, and this is imported into the Trust Trace platform. So this is a sample product of the data that, or a product that a brand wants to build a supply chain mapping for. So when this is imported, and depending on the traceability readiness or the levels that I just explained, the, the views can be a bit different. So if, again, if we're starting from zero and we have this supply chain discovery where the, the brands maybe just know the name of the direct supplier, a starting point is to use global trade data to predict the supply chain. So when a brand first imports this style into the platform, it could look something like this. So the only visible supplier that you can engage with on the platform would be the green supplier and the rest is just a prediction. So we can sense the buyer, we can sense the seller, the, uh, the consignees, but all this tinted information that you see, it's a suggestion and the data collection could be not validated. So it's not really sure that it's the true supply chain for that specific product. So it's a, it's a good start. If you, if you start that, that's, that's a good start, but we always recommend to, to gather more data. So level one instead, we, um, do the supply chain mapping again, starting with the direct supplier, which is the green supplier that you see. And um, then they populate the data via declarations for the upstream supply chain. So the data such as supply name, facility, material composition, downstream suppliers, etc., are captured on the platform and visible to the brand. And it would be the brand that is uh, mandating what data to be collected for this specific style. So the green manufacturer you see on the screen, that's onboarded on the platform and has declared the supply chain for style one, two, three. But 
the, um, the amber then represents the manufacturers that are populated into the data. So the brand might not be able to man and directly communicate with them, but uh, they will see the information. So you see also some suppliers are gray, and because of the supply chain mapping, you've realized that they are there in the network of the supplier, but they're not associated with that specific style. A red triangle would, of course, visualize some risk detected, for example, by this third-party integration with a Caron. Um, and two points here. One of the major outputs when you do this work is to whitelist the suppliers or to safeguard the suppliers that you're currently having a relationship with. And then you can take some action from that data. So this whitelisting is almost equally important as blacklisting because it will it will put some pressure, and I think we talked about incentives in some other sessions. So this can put some pressure and incentives for your suppliers to declare even more information and continue this relationship with you. Um, and of course, at this level, the brands also have the possibility to start to collect and validate data that, uh, at the different nodes. So already at this step, one level up, looking at the UFL pay requirements, you have a far more detailed supply chain mapping for the specific good. The details and the nodes of the, the suppliers will be there. You have the possibility, of course, to download this list, to send it to authority or for some own due diligence measures. And um, you can create this digital chain of custody to validate the, uh, the digital supply chain of uh, this good. Already at um, level two, we go a bit more granular, a bit more detailed. So here, the direct suppliers again are onboarded and the product bill of material will be collected. So this brings an even more granular and higher confidence in the data that you have collected. And brands can go deeper in the supply chain for products that they would classify as critical. And critical, it could be cotton product or it could be a product that is a flagship product or something like this. So again, the green suppliers represent the suppliers that are onboarded on the Trust Trace platform. The amber are the ones whose data is just populated. Uh, the red visualizes some risk. And the gray, they're not a part of this specific style. And then it's, it all together helps, again, whitelist the suppliers that you would like to continue working with. So at the third level, even more granular with material data collection. So here you have your tier two onboarded as well. It's not usual, but it's also not uncommon to, to have this level of granularity. But so the material suppliers is providing supply chain data about the yarn or the fiber suppliers as well. So once either these direct or the sub suppliers provide this information on the fabric, the, the supply chain mapping will be more specific and more um, reflect accordingly. The data collection that you can upload on the material level can also be the material ID or material name, manufacturing name, composition, etc. And, and it can look something like this. So now we can go into evidence collection for a sample purchase order. So what we've seen up till to now are some samples of how brands should do before placing an order, right? So to proactively collect and detect and mitigate risks in the supply chain. Now we are transitioning to pre-shipment. This is a visual of how the evidence collection may look like for a specific purchase order. So let's say it's time for submission. And as we know, cotton comes with a very complex supply chain and it's a highly prioritized material. Um, so you need to collect a bunch of documents. And let's say it could be purchase orders, it can be invoices, packing lists, work orders, bill of ladings, etc. So we have also built in a um, translation capability on the platform, such that if the documents, which often are not in English, needs to be translated, that can happen automatically and it can be ready for, for shipment or submission to some authority. So it's not only that we collect these documents for shipments for an authority such as the CBP in terms of UFLPA, it could also be for internal validation, for due diligence measures or for, uh, for your analysis internally. So to sum up, what Trustrace do today for the brands in this apparel industry is we, we offer trusted data from day one. So even if you have very little data to start with, 
you can start right away. And we, we have a platform that is intuitive and easy to use for the suppliers, because think about it, it's also the suppliers that are working and need, to, need more incentives to do this. It should be easy and, and quick. The granularity and the data confidence level, it will get higher and more confidence as you go. We offer this flexible approach for the different sourcing models, as I mentioned, because there's not one sourcing model for the, all the goods out there in the apparel industry or, or in any industry, and we accommodate for that. It's a complexity. We're also enterprise ready, and we work at scale already. We have millions of transactions and thousands of suppliers up and running on the platform already today. And also importantly, we have this ecosystem approach, and we are integration ready. We have APIs in and out. Uh, we have partnered with the key industry leading players. So to sum up, we have helped brands map their supply chain and collect evidence for about six, seven years now. Uh, it's been all from sustainability front runners to enterprise brands. And engaging closely with our customers, we have come to realize that what we have, it's not brain surgery. It's, it's quite straightforward, but we have a good solution that accommodates for UFLPA and it adheres to these different sourcing strategies, even if it's supply chain mapping or data collection, validation of goods, and uh, enabling this connection or discussion with the suppliers. So thank you. That's very short about our solution. We're happy to demo and to answer questions. No questions, we will be at the end of the room. Thank you. All right, next presenting is Ascent. <clears throat> Ascent will be presenting on supply chain mapping methodologies for UFLPA operational guidance and compliance that enhances supplier screening and regulatory guidance. Now presenting for Ascent is Dr. Abi Okpechi. Um, Abi supports companies in their efforts to integrate human rights into corporate risk management frameworks and supply chain risk analysis. She helps companies develop and implement for saver risk management strategies and address other social risks in the supply chain in compliance with internal and external standards for several corporate offices. Abi holds a PhD in public law and human rights. Also presenting for Ascent is Jamie Wallish, um, who, is the, who is a regulatory and sustainability expert, uh, ESG and responsible sourcing. Jamie's area of expertise is media monitoring, specializing in indirect screening and, respons indirect screening and responsible sourcing. She helps companies proactively analyze their supply chains for adverse media mentions, denied parties, and human rights issues. Jamie has worked closely with the US Department of Labor, focusing on conflict minerals, child labor, CSR, and ESG initiatives. Okay, um, good afternoon, and um, thank you to the CBP for this opportunity to present at this event. My name is Abi Okwechi. I am a regulatory and sustainability expert at Ascent. I'm joined by my colleague, Jamie, who will, um, together, will be walking you through Ascent's um, solution for um, the um, UFLPA. So, um, about before we go into what our solution looks like, um, just a little bit about Ascent, who we are as a company. Ascent is a data, is a supply chain data management company, and we help companies to identify and address the compliance risk across a wide range of topics within their supply um, chain. We've been around since 2010, and we have over a thousand employees across four continents. Our customer base is primarily within the complex manufacturing space, so we're looking at um, aerospace and defense, um, 
automotive industry, the um, electronics industry, industrial equipment and medical devices. One of the things that we are most proud of as a company is the fact that we're the only North American company that is both um, B Corp certified as well as holding uh, advanced status with the UN Global Compact. So we walk our talk. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Jamie Wallish. Pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so just to give a little more context into who Ascent is, right, really want to level set. Um, so we, if you want to move to the next slide, um, uh, position ourselves in the, the SaaS uh, platform world as a supply chain sustainability partner. So what that means is we engage with our clients um, in all supply chain initiatives um, that could obviously impact them in terms of their growth around sustainability. Um, so we uh, perform and help support uh, data collection in regards to ESG, as well as product compliance and trade compliance. Um, the elements in terms of services that we deliver um, include managed services as well as expert guidance, which we'll definitely go into in more detail uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, but today, obviously for the, the purposes of this expo, we are going to dive into our UFLPA solution. Um, just to, to be mindful and add the caveat that this is just one of the many regulations um, uh, that Ascent follows and helps deliver in terms of compliance. Thanks, Jamie. So um, we know from research that more than 90% of forced labor um, occurrences actually occur in um, the supply chains of private enterprises. And of course, complex manufacturers are fall into that category. But we also recognize that some of the solutions that are out there for um, industries that have shorter and less complex supply chains, like the apparel industry or food industry, may not be quite as um, effective for companies in the um, complex manufacturing space. And so what Ascent has done is to tailor a solution that is directly, that directly responds to the needs of complex manufacturers in a way that is aligned to the guidance that the CBP has um, set out there. So for most of us here would be aware that last month, CBP released a new set of guidance, um, what it called due diligence or best practices recommendations for what companies should do to, in relation to the UFLPA, both to prevent um, um, detention and in, in the event that a detention does occur, what to do with it. And so um, we have tailored our solutions to marked to each one of these elements, these requirements by the CBP. And we're going to be walking you through what those, each one of those um, things mean from a sense um, perspective. Yeah, great. Thanks, Abby. So um, before we get into those kind of four major elements, we really want to um, articulate the, the baseline and foundation in terms of the solution that we offer regarding UFLPA. So kind of the, the two main pillars, or what you can think of as our approach, um, is the 360 degree approach. And the two main pillars are articulated here. One um, on the left is the direct engagement. So we're directly communicating and collaborating with the entities in your supply chain to capture information around those topics that are material to you. In this case, it's the UFLPA. Um, on the other side of that, the other kind of supporting mechanism um, and the other pillar is the enhanced supplier screening or that indirect piece. So the exact opposite of direct engagement where we're taking the list of entities in your supply chain and scrutinizing them through the public domain. So let's dive more into uh, that kind of second pillar, enhanced supplier screening. And that really touches on uh, the first element recommended by the CBP, which is the maintain awareness. So enhanced supplier screening um, is positioned as the methodology to have continuous visibility and exposure into risks um, or unknown hidden risk that's out there within the public space. And this isn't not only associated with um, suppliers or entities that you give us, but as well as their legal affiliations and who they're directly and indirectly associated with. Um, the elements and features incorporated within uh, the ESS solution um, includes that we screen on a daily basis in over 200 digital, uh, million digital sources and platforms. So as you can imagine, a wide breadth um, of sources and material we're trying to capture information from. Um, we screen in over 18 plus languages in the native language to make sure that we don't miss any context or substance that's being identified within that information. And obviously this is going on at an international and global scale. So we're screening in over 182 countries. 
Yeah, and um, the second piece of that um, guidance is for companies to assess the risk within their supply chain so they can make informed decisions. And so that speaks to the second part that um, Jamie mentioned about a direct engagement. So what we do is um, we directly engage your suppliers. Yes, um, the kind of open source data that um, Jamie has spoken about and I think a number of, um, of presenters have also talked about, they, they, they are useful, but there's the potential there for them to leave gaps because unless you are capturing every single one of your suppliers with those um, kind of open source data, then there are some of your suppliers you're not actually looking at. And so the direct engagement piece, what it does is it allows you to directly go to your suppliers and ask them and find out what, what are their inherent risks what kind of risk is um, associated with them, and what kind of control measures do they have in place to address those risks. But the, the solution that we use for this um, direct engagement is known as the um, Slavery and Trafficking Risk Template, which is an industry risk template um, developed by the Social Responsibility Alliance. It's been optimized for the Xinjiang forced labor question, um, issue, and it helps companies to actually take a risk-based approach in that they can look at a specific commodity and use that um, tool to trace down through their suppliers where, what is the provenance, what is the origin of those goods, um, and then you know, to understand where the risks lie. So that gives a broad depth of insight, you know, much more broader than just the open source data on its own. And then the other piece, the last two pillars of the UFLP, of the um, CBP's guidance, kind of looks at how, what you're supposed to do to prevent your detention and to overcome detention if it does happen. What we do at Ascend is we, we provide education. So we ed educate your suppliers on the different regulations related to um, forced labor in particular, in, for this is instance, the UFLPA, as well as your companies, what you need to be doing. And then you are in a position to then leverage the risk information that you gather through your direct engagement, through your indirect engagement, and make an informed decision. Do I want to continue operating or um, you know, um, partnering with this um, company, or do I want to uh, make any changes? And then you're also able to use all of that information that you gather to build an evidentiary record, which alongside the you know, trade transactional documents that the CBP um, requires you know, to get your goods out of detention, you can provide to the CBP to show evidence of your due diligence that you're actually doing not just what is expected of you, but that you're going beyond, over and beyond. And um, at this junction, we're just going to pause for a minute and take a look at a, a, a brief um, demo of what this whole solution looks like in practice. How Ascent works. Ascent simplifies supplier collection through software and services to identify risks. Ascend provides a unique instance of the Ascent Sustainability Manager software to the customer and stores all information collected. And this helps identify risks associated with forced labor, ESG topics such as climate impact, as well as product compliance. Starting with the supplier information and the bills and materials provided, our team will reach out to the suppliers through an email campaign and manage all communications with suppliers with multi-language capability. Our supplier success team will be there to help answer your supplier's questions with guidance from our regulatory expert team. The UFLPA topic can be new to suppliers and the training and support Ascent offers will help increase their understanding as well as their responses. As your program progresses, we can offer more by providing corrective actions based on the evidence review of the policies the supplier provides. We will monitor suppliers indirectly using our enhanced supplier screening to track any adverse media or sanctions lists. This, along with the direct engagement, will give you a 360 review of your supply chain. The supplier completes these surveys and corrective action tasks through the free supplier portal. Then, we offer the results in the form of sustainability report inserts, dashboards, and other reports. All of the topics and surveys are based on the GRI framework and SASB reporting recommendations and are overseen by our regulatory experts. The first CBP best practice recommendation of maintaining awareness can be met with a sense enhanced supplier screening. Our screening can include all suppliers by looking for issues clients wouldn't self-report on, like child labor or anti-bribery complaints. 
Through corporate tax records, we will identify any legal affiliates or beneficial owners of those suppliers and include them in our monitoring. This dashboard shows the relevant hits using negative sentiment analysis. Using a combination of AI and a team of experts, we will rank these hits high, medium, or low. For example, high hits include any denied parties or sanctions lists. Dashboard filters can narrow down the results in the insights page by your company's business units, any categories, or even specific keywords such as Uyghur. All of these filters can be used to help identify trends over time, as well as display a heat map of where those hits are by which country. The second best practice recommendation of assessing risk and make informed decisions can be met with the STRT. Ascent asks suppliers to complete the Slavery and Trafficking Risk Template, or STRT. This is an industry template developed by the Social Responsibility Alliance that has been used since 2016. More than 10,000 companies use it to uncover forced labor risks and comply with a wide range of regulations. Since 2020, the STRT has been specifically optimized to capture Uyghur forced labor risks. One of the greatest strengths of the STRT is its commodity-specific traceability approach that allows companies to assess suppliers on the origins of the goods they supply. For example, if you were interested in the origins of aluminum in your products, your suppliers would be asked to provide information on the sourcing of that specific product alongside their general forced labor due diligence. Suppliers, of course, complete this questionnaire and demonstrate their internal controls they have in place to prevent forced labor, and these are supported by evidence such as policies. Ascent also offers a service to review these policies and evidence to verify they meet internationally recognized standards and are appropriate to mitigate risk. We then offer corrective actions to the supplier to help guide them in creating stronger policies to help prevent forced labor. As suppliers upload their completed STRTs, we will digitize the responses to easily identify risks. The dashboard will extract the top five risks, including your supply chain overall risk to human trafficking and slavery, COTSA, and the links to Xinjiang. As part of the steps to assess risks, being able to easily identify those suppliers with higher risks will allow you to make informed decisions before importing your goods. The individual responses can be seen here and clicking on the supplier's name will open the, the individual supplier's profile page where we can see the responses to the survey as well as any policies they've uploaded. Understanding the specific parts purchased from that supplier can be seen here because of a sense cross-referencing. Here we can see the parts and the part details, including the country of origin, as well as the HS codes. We can apply filters by country, such as China, quickly. This solution also helps you be proactive in identifying and addressing bits and materials that are not necessarily on CBP's high priority list, but for which enforcement actions are being taken, as we've seen with aluminum and PVC. The third and fourth recommendations of prevent and overcome goods detention can be met with the information gathered. This information derived from direct engagement with suppliers, indirect risk assessment through enhanced supplier screening, as well as the country of origin information. You are now equipped to make informed decisions based on these risks. For example, you can determine which of your suppliers have links to Xinjiang and work to remove and eliminate them from your supply chain to prevent detention. Our regulatory experts will educate your suppliers and their role in ensuring the goods they supply have no nexus to forced labor generally and to Xinjiang in particular. In the event that you do have goods detained and need to overcome detention, you can take the information derived from your supply chain risk assessment together with other trade documentation such as transaction records and present it to CBP to prove your due diligence in ensuring your goods have no nexus. In short, Ascent can provide an audit trail as part of the evidentiary record as needed to your legal counsel to support your efforts to counter goods detention.
Okay, great. I also just want to give a quick shout out to Maria Poole, who is a sales engineer at Ascent that uh, delivered this in-depth and in thorough demonstration. So thank you to her who's watching. Um, to, to close out our presentation here today, we just wanted to give a brief note on a business case of a um, complex manufacturer in the solar industry that came to Ascent to utilize our UFLPA solution. Um, they were familiar with, um, with Ascent based off of, again, our positioning in the SaaS um, uh, uh, industry um, as engaging as a, a, a supply chain uh, sustainability partner. So they were interested in our uh, uh, UFLPA uh, solution specifically. So what we did is we uh, deployed um, the elements that we talked about today to satisfy those needs. So again, that enhanced supplier screening to have that continuous monitoring and engagement of all the entities in their supply chain to capture risk within the public space um, and, and make sure they're being very proactive um, in terms of that engagement and risk out there. Um, as well as incorporating that direct um, supplier engagement via the STRT. So now they're very well equipped in positions to have that hard data and traceable documentation to deliver and show um, you know, their engagement with uh, defensible due diligence obligations and programs. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for your time and uh, we'll open the floor for any questions. I literally have people texting me questions that couldn't be here, so I'm asking a question for the audience at large. Okay. What do you do with the gaps in the data? You're very bill of material driven, and there are tiers to a bill of material in a complex manufacturing environment. What happens if you can't get information at tier two, tier three, tier four? How does that affect the overall results of your analysis? Yeah, thank you um, for that question. Um, so, as someone said yesterday, um, suppliers are very driven by business interest. I mean, they are companies after all. So, and so um, with the UFLPA coming into force, lots of suppliers are beginning to understand that this is um, co cooperating with their with their customers is a condition of carrying on business. And so that has tended to be an incentive for companies to um, provide information that's needed, you know, at their own, um, within their own operations and from their own suppliers. And one of the points that we did make in that presentation is the um, ability of the SGRT to facilitate a traceability approach um, for specific com commodities. And it's similar to some of the approaches that has been demonstrated here. It's a cascading approach. And for those who are familiar with the conflict mineral space and are familiar with the um, conflict minerals template, the same way that you collect information from subsequent tiers to find your way down to the um, smelters you know, of interest is the same way the STRT operates. So it collects um, information from um, you know, subsequent tiers of your supply chains. Great question, thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for a great presentation. My name is Mary, um, I'm an attorney at Milner Chevalier. I was, I'm really interested in this sort of 360 um, idea that you guys have and I'm wondering if you sort of use that to leverage information that you've gathered um, in the reaching out to suppliers phase and um, sort of overlay it on top of the other mapping that you do to authenticate one way or another. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's absolutely what we try to, to tackle is the complementary approach between those different methods of data collection. So really how I articulate and position ESS, Enhanced Supplier Screening, is a supporting mechanism to what you're doing on the direct engagement side. And also really labeling it a trust but verify solution. So you're going out directly engaging with your suppliers, you're, you're trying to trust them in terms of what they're uh, communicating and delivering to you, but sometimes there's gaps, sometimes they're unknowns, sometimes they don't reply, reply at all, right? So that's when ESS comes in to help fill in those gaps. But absolutely, they should be used in that two-pronged approach method. And we really believe you, you can't have one without the other when it comes to a strong um, foundation of defensible due diligence. Thank you. Yeah, great question, thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys.
right, this brings us to our final presentation, which is uh, STS, Synergy Technical Services USA. We'll be presenting on supply chain mapping methodologies for UFLPA operational guidance and compliance. Presenting for STS is Maria Stoyanova. She's the Director of Supply Chain Sustainability, Cer Sustainability Services, working towards testing, inspection, and certification in the solar and storage industry. Maria is passionate about the responsibility of enterprise for their impacts on society and prior to STS worked at CSR Europe in Belgium and with the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So, Maria. Hello. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much to CBP for the invitation to present the STS supply chain mapping methodology. My name is Maria Stoyanova and I am Director of Supply Chain Sustainability Services at STS. I will start with giving you some context on the solar supply chain, on who STS is, and I will focus my presentation on our methodology for supply chain mapping. And lastly, I would like to introduce to you our uh, report sharing platform. In terms of context, 95% of solar panels today are produced with polysilicon. And this is what the solar module polysilicon supply chain looks like. It starts with the quartzite, which is mined from the ground. Then uh, it is smelted into metallurgical grade silicon, which is further purified into solar grade polysilicon cast into solar ingots, which are then sliced into wafers. From that, the solar cell is produced, which is um, then assembled into the solar module. Today, more than 70% of the manufacturing at each of these stages takes place in China. And for the solar ingot and solar wafer stage, um, this percent goes as high as 95%. And at STS, we know very well the solar supply chain where um, com the components are being produced. So this is actually where we are. We are global, but our operations are focused in Asia. Our headquarters are in Shanghai, and in China is where we have uh, our largest fleet of inspectors and auditors. We also have uh, our local teams in Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and India. We have about uh, 100 employees, the majority of whom are uh, engineers and are um, on the ground in the solar facilities where the solar panels are being manufactured. A little bit more on what we do. Um, we are an audit and inspection body. We support the procurement efforts of the solar and energy storage developers. We are the pioneers in the solar space. Uh, we were established in 2010. We are ISO certified, which means that we need to avoid any conflict of interest. And for this reason, we are contracted by the buyers, not by the manufacturers whom we audit. Uh, we are highly specialized in renewables, not only solar, but also energy storage and wind. And the services we perform for our clients are inspection, testing, auditing, and advisory. So basically, we are the boots on the ground for our clients. We are in the factories 24-7 while the panels are being manufactured, making sure um, that um, the quality specifications in the purchase agreements are being adhered to. And because we are a trusted partner for our clients, when the Hoshine WRO was put into place, and then later on the UFLPA, and there was a need to be conducting um, traceability audits, we were asked to, um, to start this type of verification as well, looking at the traceability systems in place and the documentation available. So this is when um, we developed our supply chain methodology about started about two years ago 
and I would like to talk a little bit more about how we do supply chain mapping for the solar sector. The objective is to verify the suppliers at each stage of the supply chain. And then afterwards, to verify the provenance of the materials and components. And we look at the uh, supply chain, starting with solar module, going all the way up to quartzite. We developed this methodology based on our deep knowledge of the supply chain, our established audit methods, and we took as a basis uh, the Solar Energy Association um, Supply Chain Traceability Protocol, which we were the co-authors of uh, in 2021. And we made sure that when the CBP's operational guidance for importers was published, that our methodology is completely in line with the guidance. Our clients use the supply chain mapping when they're qualifying suppliers and US bound supply chains in order to assess the risk that the products may fall within the scope of the UFLPA. Our methodology has three steps. First, we start with a scope agreement. The client and the manufacturer define the product that we are going to map. This means that we need to know the manufacturing facility, we need to know the manufacturing dates, how many pieces of solar modules were produced. We also ask for the purchase order as a starting point, and then we take this number of the purchase order and then we trace it along the entire supply chain. Um, the second step is compiling a self-declared list of manufacturers. Uh, we ask for this as a first stage. This is um, a self-declared stage, and we proceed to verify this declaration. We verify the commercial link between the different entities in the supply chain, as well as the traceability of the input and the output at each stage of manufacturing. We do that through sampling of documentation. And there are three types of documentation that we uh, collect and verify. Commercial records, such as contracts, purchase orders, invoices, proof of payment. We look at transport records, which would include packing lists, bill of lading, customs documentation, certificate of origin. And also importantly, we look at the production records, uh, which are usually kept within the manufacturing facilities, such as the incoming materials receipt, warehousing records, certificate of analysis, the MES records, which contain the batch numbers of the input and output. And then depending on the documents that we receive for the different suppliers, we have four different levels of verification, which uh, we report on. If we receive no information at all, um, this is the unknown level. Um, when we receive information, even if this information is very detailed, and we sometimes receive um, from manufacturers um, details on, on the batch numbers, for example, that we used for certain production. But if we have no supporting evidence, then this would remain at a self-declared level. So this is really our lowest level of confidence when we receive this information, but we're not able to verify it. If we have access to documentation, then that's our next level um, of verification, documented level, uh, where we are able to verify the link between the different suppliers, uh, but not really trace the product. So this is really the highest level of verification where we have the traceability between input and output, usually looking at the batch numbers. This is an example of the visuals that we have in the deliverables. Our deliverables are reports to our clients in which we map out the supply chain. So we present all of the suppliers in the supply chain, which here uh, in this slide you can see are marked with different numbers in different colors. So this is the level of verification that we have reached for each supplier part of the supply chain. This example here was put together for the purposes of this presentation, uh, but it 
is actually uh, very indicative of the level of verification that we are currently seeing within the industry. Um, we are able um, in many cases, in most cases, to read verification until polysilicon and then upstream uh, there is visibility uh, but it's more difficult to obtain the documentation in order to reach the highest level of verification. It is challenging but I have to say it is possible and it has been done. Um, it is just at this moment an exception rather than the norm. But I believe that um, the sector is evolving and for the past two years we have seen huge changes in the level of verification that we can achieve. Our supply chain mapping is complemented by a traceability management system audit. This is something that we do at site level. We evaluate the manufacturer's ability to consistently trace product information. We look at how traceability is set up within the site, how uh, resources are allocated, if enough resources are allocated, what is the security of the data, but also security of the incoming materials. And lastly, how traceability is operationalized within all of the different processes within the manufacturing facility. We have based this audit on um, ISO standards, again, on the sales supply chain traceability protocol, and have made sure that is fully aligned with CVP's operational guidance for importers. Our clients use this audit together with the supply chain mapping to evaluate whether a manufacturing facility has a robust traceability system in place and is able to supply reliable traceability information, which then goes on to feed in the supply chain mapping, which I just talked about. The reports that we produce, supply chain mapping reports, and also the traceability management audit reports, can be shared with clients through our report sharing platform. When we started traceability, this traceability work two years ago, we had uh, requests from multiple clients to be conducting traceability audits at the same manufacturing facilities. Um, so we decided to, to group these requests, and this is how this um, sharing platform was born, whereby um, we conduct the assessment as a third independent party, and we make the reports available to the clients who request it. We launched this program two years ago in 2021. We currently have uh, 40 members, so these are the developers, the, the buyers of the solar modules, who are interested to receive the reports on, on their manufacturers. We have 18, manu uh, 18 manufacturers who are currently participating, 52 available reports um, spread over three assessment types, so supply chain, mapping, traceability management system audit, and then the third one is purely quality related. It's a um, factory audit. An important element here is the confidentiality of data, which is very important when we're talking about traceability and sharing information on suppliers and supply chains. We're very careful with how we manage this data, and this is why an important element is the authorization process in place. The data is owned by the manufacturers themselves, and uh, we require the written authorization to share those reports with the clients who request access. And this translates into a reduced volume of, of audits. Um, we don't need to go a number of times to the same manufacturing facility um, in order for the clients to be conducting their due diligence. We have designed this program also uh, in line with the recommendations from the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force for importer companies to arrange joint audits and independent verification processes. And lastly here I want to mention uh, our supply chain mapping track record. Um, I realize that in comparison to all of the numbers that have been shared here uh, during these two days, 18 might seem like a rather low number. 
uh, in comparison to 22,000 suppliers that we heard uh, previously. But actually, these 18 manufacturers, uh, they represent about 40% of the um, entire manufacturing capacity for solar modules worldwide. And we have been conducting uh, supply chain mappings for not only for solar modules, but also solar cells, wafers, ingots, and polysilicon. And the majority of that has been done in China since, as we saw in the beginning, this is where the supply chain lies. Uh, but also Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, India, US, and Turkey. I would like to leave you with these last um, three thoughts. Traceability of the polysilicon uh, supply chain is challenging. We are seeing um, great strides forward, but I have to say that it still remains a challenge to go all the way up to quartzite in terms of documentation. We have developed a robust solution for supply chain mapping, which we have been applying to the solar sector. And lastly, we would like to invite also um, other sectors to join in a similar way initiatives to share reports such as the ones, uh, the one that we have developed with the sustainable supply chain program. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Hello, Maria. Hi. Christian Roseland from Clean Energy Associates, founded in 2008. So I just wanted to ask, you mentioned that you do factory audits. Sorry? You mentioned the factory audits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that include polysilicon facilities, and has your team been in any? Uh, we have conducted supply chain mapping at polysilicon facilities. So far, we have not been requested to conduct uh, factory audits at polysilicon facilities. Okay. So no presence in polysilicon facilities? Well, our clients are the buyers of um, solar modules, and they are not directly interested in factory audits for the polysilicon part of the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so that brings us to the end of the day. So I will spend the next hour talking about, uh, just kidding. <laughs> so, so first of all, I want to start off, um, I want to express my gratitude for our keynote speakers that participated over the last couple of days, you know, starting with DHS Undersecretary Robert, Sil Robert Silvers, Chair, Chair Nuri Turkle, Commissioner Miller, Mr. Kit Conklin, Dr. Laura Murphy, and our federal partners at the Department of Labor, Deputy Undersecretary Thea Lee, the Department of State Special Representative Kelly Fade Rodriguez, and from the Hill, professional staff member Dr. Elnigar Yiltsabir, for their leadership and perspectives and commitments to advocacy to combating forced labor. Most importantly, I want to thank every, everyone from industry, civil society, civil society, academia, and government, from both our executive and legislative partners, and all the interested stakeholders that joined us here in person and virtually over the last two days. And for those that may be curious, we did a check online. Uh, we did a check of all the folks that are streaming uh, at lunchtime. And today, we peaked over 10,000 folks that are live streaming uh, this event. So really thank all the folks that are not only attending here in the room, but also all the folks that are uh, attending virtually as well. We really, truly hope that it's been quite informative uh, for all of us and productive for, for all of us in this engagement. Just to highlight, you know, forced labor is a human right issue. Um, I think for, you know, we've seen the faces, we've seen, we've heard some of the stories during, over the last two days. Uh, and for some of the, for, for those of us or some that may, this may be the first time that maybe you've heard these stories or maybe be the first time that you've seen these pictures, I really hope that it's not the first time or not the last time that you take, you know, that you really uh, take a look into some of the accounts and you look at the issues. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of great reports out there from a lot of the, the folks that you've seen in the room today um, that have produced um, um, 
materials, reports, books on all the, 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 the crisis that's occurring overseas. So I really hope that it starts uh, our journey, especially for folks that, you know, that you know, those of us that are uh, involved in trade compliance and ESG work, especially as we look at how to tackle the issue of forced labor within our supply chains that, you know, we go in eyes wide open and really truly understanding the issues that are occurring uh, in the Xinjiang region of China. You know, forced labor is an unfair trade practice that undermines the ability of companies that do treat workers fairly to compete in the global economy. It's also the law and it's designed to make us collectively evaluate our supply chains and reduce our dependencies on illicit foreign manufacturing. I think we should be proud as a nation, as a, as a government, as the trade, to be the leaders. Um, and the U.S. is leading in this space, right? The trade is leading in this space. And our like-minded partners globally around the world are leading and exemplifying this effort to eradicate and address the issues of forced labor that they're occurring overseas. Due diligence in supply chains is the key to security and predictability to ensure that we are not complicit in unwitting consumers of goods produced and manufactured with forced labor. And it's just good business now more than ever for more reasons than just forced labor. And we do see your efforts from the, the, uh, the ramp up of CBP's forced labor enforcement over the last several years, also with the implementation of the UFLPA, we've seen large shifts in supply chains. We've seen the trade really working at and exercising due diligence uh, in their supply chains. And from the, the data that, that shows in the data dashboard that was released yesterday, all that shows you know, where we see reductions or shifts uh, or, or is all kind of exemplary of a lot of the hard work and great work that trade is doing uh, to really look into their supply chains and exercise due diligence within your supply chains and ensure um, that our supply chains are not going back to sources of forced labor. The UFLPA is clear that we all share a collective responsibility to exercise due diligence. As many have shared over the last few days, this can be done and tools are available to help you. Whether these tools are technology service, services to the articles that investigative media spend a lot of time and work to, to publishing, as well as the academic studies that are, that are published that highlight some of the issues as well as the government reports that are provided and worked from the various departments and agencies across the government. Due diligence is most effective when it's proactive and not reactive. I think Justin mentioned it today uh, from Freedom that many of the methodologies and many of the technologies that you have heard about over the last two days have some similarities. So really it's important to pick one, one that matches your company, one that matches the way that um, that, that fits your needs, uh, and start now. And as, Laura, as Dr. Murphy shared this morning, is that if, you know, as she put up on her size, that if we can see it, you know, so can you. Sometimes it's really that simple. I'm, I'm reminded of an instance where I had spoke, with, spoken with an importer uh, who um, had done an excessive amount of due diligence uh, to make sure that the supply chain in their manufacturing chain was very refined, that they've vetted all the importers. And, sometime, and, and so we had a call, we discussed, um, just kind of as more of just an open discussion, what well, they weren't under enforcement at the time. And so, uh, you know, and they showed us the supply chain, um, six, six manufacturers within the supply chain before it was imported to the United States. And so me, I mean, I don't know, you know, looking at these, um, these manufacturers within their supply chain, I don't know who they are, I mean, they're just names, right? And so I just do a quick Google search while they're talking and all of a sudden, you know, number three in their supply chain, glaring says relationship with the XPCC. You know, so sometimes it's just that easy, right? And so when you, when you highlight that to them, you know, maybe there is, you know, some, some embarrassment or whatnot, but sometimes due, due diligence can be that easy. And so, oh, and by the way, when I said Google, I wasn't endorsing it. I think it was added to the dictionary as, a, as an actual verb, so there is no endorsement there. Um, so I want to thank all the industry presenters that were willing to share their capabilities and in your incredible work to figuring out creative and innovative approaches that support industry's effort to illuminate supply chains and to identify force saver risks and make inform, to make informed business decisions. We hope that this expo provided a unique forum that brings industry together with civil society, academia, and government to engage, to network, 
to build connections and promote a community of stakeholders that together confront our national commitment on the issues of forced labor together. We look forward to hearing your feedback on, on this expo. Um, I know we look forward to future opportunities to hear about your experience, hearing from the technology service providers, hearing from industry on your experience with these technologies, and then bringing folks back together to have the opportunity to, to chat again. So we'll be looking for that opportunity to do that, potentially maybe at our upcoming trade summit uh, in April. So we'll see, um, see if that's a possibility. We'll have, be chatting with uh, OTR here uh, with XD Pullum. And so before we conclude the expo, I, I want to extend my sincere appreciation to the CBP team uh, and to the department staff and the interagency members that had a, a part in planning and preparing and coordinating this event. Certainly a lot of late nights, a lot of uh, long hours had gone into getting through a lot of the, you know, for those that may be uh, experienced with the federal acquisition process, uh, those that may be experienced with putting on a wedding or, or, or some type of event like this, it's not, a, not an easy ordeal. So a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, maybe not blood, but a lot of sweat and tears had gone into the planning of this expo. So really, uh, really thank you to the CVP team uh, and the folks that had, had put this event together. So thank you so much and for your support and collaboration on this very important mission. Uh, it is really, truly to see, really wonderful to see everyone face to face. I know that um, it, there's a lot of very familiar faces in this room. I think when we get into this, uh, into this space that there is a lot of familiarity and it's really wonderful, especially over the last couple of years, to really see the, do the face to face engagement again um, where you know, we've gotten used to just doing the exchanges over email. But I really appreciate that and I hope that this continues, that we have the opportunity to, to really engage face to face again and it's just the start of this, um, this type of engagement. So I really just want to say I wish everyone uh, a wonderful rest of the week uh, and safe travels home. Uh, to all the folks that are online in the virtual environment, uh, you know, I wish you all kind of the, the, um, a great rest of the week as well and that, uh, that this has been a very productive uh, and very fruitful uh, expo for everyone. So with that, we'll conclude the expo and thank you for everyone's participation. Good morning. Boy, that's a tough act to follow, huh? I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. Uh, my name is Vincent Annunziato. I'm the director for the Business Transformation and Innovation Division. And um, had the good fortune of working both on uh, modernization and innovation products, but also uh, working in some of the Uyghur uh, dilemmas that we're dealing with now. Um, I have a great panel today. We'll be talking about innovation, how we're investing. Uh, some of these panelists, when they turned in their bios, I expected to get a paragraph and I got autobiographies. So uh, it was quite the, uh, I was like, no, seven sentences, that's all you're getting. So we really got a, a hefty group. I want to, though, start off, um, you know, when you talk about innovation, innovation, the way that we term it is really the, it's the art of change, right? Being able to find some efficiency, whether that's in time, or money, and that's what makes it worthwhile for us to invest. Um, and recently, I had a conversation with my son, of all people, that really starts to articulate that. Now, he's my namesake, so we call him Little Vinny, but he's really 5'10", and he uh, towers over me, makes sure he does that all the time. But he, he sits down on the couch with me, he goes, so, Dad, and already I'm ducking, because you know, when you get those two words as a parent, you know something's coming at you, and he says, you ever been to a library? Now, I'm stunned here, right? And I'm trying to imagine where this is going because I know I've taken them to the library. I remember reptiles and all that other stuff that we saw there, and books. And I know my wife's taken them. And he sees that I'm not, you know, I'm kind of confused. So he says, uh, Dad, no, I, I mean, when you were younger, like when you went to school, how did it work? Okay, so I said, well, you know, when I was younger, I couldn't drive there, so, you know, but when I got my car, I was finally able to go, no, 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 Dad, how did it work? 
So I said, well, I'd go in, I'd look at our, an index, and I'd look up these books, and if I had trouble, I'd go to the librarian, and I could see I'm not connecting. So how do I make that connection? Google search. So I said, Vinny, I said, you know when you go in and you, do, you, know, you type in some keywords? I said, and it brings you right into what you got to get to? He goes, yeah, now he's starting to get it. I said, in my day, I used to have to take the books, put them out on the desk, lay them out, and I'd have to search through chapters and actually read to find the words. <laughs> he goes, you had to read? <laughs> now, what am I talking about right now? It's a generational gap, right? But what's happening in this day and age is that the innovation is moving so quickly, companies have to be very, very careful about what they're investing into because every time a bright, shiny object comes up, it doesn't mean it's going to work. The company may not last. It may not be what's promised. So what I wanted to do is bring the groups that are dealing with some of this so you can see how the government is investing into this technology. And we have some great people here today. I'm going to start with, um, uh, by the way, I'll be introducing all four of you, and then we'll get into the questions, OK? If we have some time afterwards, maybe you can ask some questions as well. So Anil John, he's the technical director for the US Department of Homeland Security, Silicon Valley Innovation Program, uh, which works with innovation communities across the nation and around the world to adapt, develop, and harness cutting edge technologies and capabilities that are commercially sustainable while simultaneously meeting government needs. Thanks for coming here today, Anil. Um, next to him, I have uh, Mr. Valley Oliver, who's graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 2005, where he obtained his BS degree in computer science. He has an MS degree in information technology, served six years with the US Navy, and was awarded multiple achievement awards and uh, medals in the military. Uh, he's worked with Booz Allen as a systems engineer, uh, and he was uh, part of the US Army software marketplace. Um, and now he's currently working as the deputy uh, executive director under Tom Mills, who couldn't be here today due to a last minute change. So thank you, Mr. Oliver, for filling in for us. Next to um, Valet, I have uh, Mr. Dan Solis, who was selected as the assistant commissioner for import operations. Uh, and he's worked there as the division director of West Coast Imports since February 9th, 2018. He's recognized expert in FDA import operations and has served as the Acting Assistant Commissioner for Office of Enforcement and Import Operations since March 29, 2020. During this time, he's provided leadership and direction to all OEIO field import divisions, as well as the Division of Food Defense Targeting and Division of Import Operations at FDA HQ. He brought about leadership and stability needed during the COVID-19 pandemic, and now he serves as the Principal Advisor to the Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs and reports to the Deputy Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs, DACRA, on all matters. Uh, he provides direction and insight to human and animal food and leading the development of implementation of new import programs and procedures. Next to, uh, and welcome, uh, Mr. Solis. And then next to him is uh, Matthew Burke, and he, thankfully, we had to make two changes here, stood in for Steve Casada, and then also the DAC Patricia House. So we really had a, uh, he really came in at the last minute, so thank you. Dr. Burke has been with CBP's laboratories and scientific services for 14 years and is currently a senior science officer. He began in New York laboratory as a chemist and supervisor for 13 years uh, prior to moving to LSS headquarters. Throughout his career, his primary focus has been the analysis of trade goods for classification and country of origin by chemical and, and genetic analysis. Since 2022, Dr. Burke has served as a senior science officer with oversight of LSS's Country of Origin program. Uh, he's also a U.S. Delegate to the World Customs Organization Scientific Subcommittee and has served as an associate member of the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, Wildlife Forensic Subcommittee, and several interagency scientific review panels. So welcome, Matthew. All right, um, so we're going to get into the questions. And of course, you know, the first question I'm going to ask all of you is whether or not you've ever been to a library. <laughs> of course. All right. Mr. John, you and I have been working together for many years, uh, especially in the standards area. Could you please uh, talk a little bit about what role the standards play in uh, te technology implementation? Um, for sure. 
one of the things that became that has become clear, uh, I'm sure, both yesterday and obviously in the keynotes today, is the role of data and the quality of the data and the fidelity of the data in being able to make good decisions. Now, if you are an organization like CBP, that is as old as America, you have two choices before you how you want to get that data. You can do a one ring to bind them all and tell people how you want it. Or you can basically work together in order to define a common set and a framework for how data should be understood. The best way to do that is not to do it governmentally, is actually to use open standards, open mechanism, open standards or development organizations in order to define how data should be structured and how it should be coming into the house, right? And I also want to be very clear, when I speak about standards organizations, there is a cottage industry in what, they, what is called standards where you actually have a whole bunch of you know, vendors and things like that getting together in organizations and creating what they call standards, which then you need to pay in order to access and use. What I'm talking about is basically working in a globally recognized uh, standards development organization where the output of those standards is open, royalty-free, and free to use for the single person all the way up to the multinational. And that is the value that standards, a common way of representing information and common way of representing how we connect different systems together becomes very important. All right, thank you, Neil. And, and these standards are really a, a global community. We're really looking to reach around the world, not just within the U.S. borders. So these standards really are making a, a huge impact. Now, Valley, you're on the uh, side of actually implementing and working with OAT, you have a huge enterprise, probably one of the most complicated uh, pieces of architecture we've seen, and we're, we're one of the largest transactional systems in the world. Uh, so managing that is huge. Can you talk about some of the exciting technological advances that you think would enhance trade and commerce? Yeah, so um, to start off with, my, I, I think I've used the library a little bit when I was a kid. My kids have no idea what a library is. So um, with that said, uh, the system he's talking about is the automated commercial environment, the ACE system, which um, my uh, IT folks that we uh, managed the development for. And in order to stay uh, in line with the future, we have to continue to infuse it with technology in order to get you know, the best out of trade. So we work side by side with places like the Small Business Innovation Research, research um, folks um, to give them the, to, to receive presentations and to find ways that we can solve some of the, the bigger issues that we have in the supply chain. Uh, we work with the NILS team uh, with the Silicon Valley Innovation Program, and we also work with the uh, INVIT, the innovation team. But a lot of those partnerships that we have um, evolve into coming up with proofs of, proofs of concepts and uh, other technology things that we want to put into our system. So one of the things that, that we, we, you hear out in the world with the uh, um, cryptocurrency is the, the use of blockchain. Blockchain is a technology that is considered, it's, it's called a distributed ledger technology. We're not trying to use it from a cryptocurrency level, but we're trying to use it as a way to maintain the, the proof of concept or the control of data as we exchange data through um, our traditional partners, our non-traditional partners. So we have several DLT projects uh, in, in the works, and uh, I think that's a, a great thing for the, the ACE system. Um, with that said, there's uh, some other technologies that we're leveraging. Uh, we got a lot of use with called the robotic processing automation. The ability to let our machines do some of the work that will free up our humans in order for them to do more of the investigation, some of the things that we here at CBP actually need to do. Um, and this has pushed the A system forward, and we're looking forward to continue to, to, to leverage those technologies. One of the projects that I came on earlier um, uh, with the ACE program was trying to modernize it and, and put most of the system into the cloud, the uh, platform as a service. And, and uh, we were able to leverage a lot of technologies in order to cloudify our system so we can be better uh, in a better position to serve our, our user community so they can have access to ACE and to the other systems I have uh, on any device at any time uh, in order for them to do their jobs. So that's some of the technologies that we're infusing uh, in, into our system. 
Thanks, Vala. You know, we're doing a lot of work in the robotics processing right now, and the amazing thing is it, it removes the redundancy over and over. One person have to do something maybe on a daily basis, uh, whatever it happens to be, and running it darn near instantaneously. So that's making a major impact in what we're doing today. Um, now, uh, Dan, you and I have been working a long time together. Um, you know, originally we did the single window back with the original ACE, which is running today with all the partner government agencies. Um, 48 agencies making use of that, 13 of which are actually processing along with us, FDA being one of the largest um, processors of that information as well. And, um, and Dan's been working very closely with me on a lot of the modernization efforts that we're doing now going into um, uh, the proof of concepts that we're running um, on, how, on, on what we're doing in standards. So Dan, how does uh, FDA monitor supply chain shortages for critical medical product supplies? And, and how about any lessons learned from your experience in the pandemic? Oh yeah, Th thanks for having me. And um, you, you failed to mention that we both started right out of kindergarten and that you know, we, we've been working at this for, for such a long time. You don't know, you know, wanna um, date ourselves on how long we've been working on this. Um, yeah, first of all, Vinny and my CBP colleagues, thank you for inviting FDA here. It's a, I think it's a testament to partnership and the ability for all of us collectively to, to catch up with technology. I think technology is outpacing our ability to enforce and we need uh, not, not only the partnership within the federal side, but as, as uh, many of the previous talkers are talking about, really in partnership with the trade and, and the industry we regulate. Um, a, a lot of innovations, I think from, you know, not only um, the data that's coming in, but that feeds into how we make admissibility decisions on the FDA side. You have to appreciate each one of the FDA commodities that we regulate from food and drugs and medical devices, each one has a di different center with their own um, requirements and, and uh, laws that we have to enforce at, at the border. So when we're coming into an enterprise-wide solution, we're having conversations with Vinny and his group, we have to consider the requirements of a drug, of a medical device, and, and uh, food, cosmetics, you name it. What was very interesting is you come across individuals like Vinny who can look at a problem and you can present problems there, but really what we're driving at is, are there solutions out there? Maybe not within the confines of, of our discussion, but there is a solution out there. And it's, it's uh, people like Vinny that really knows how to connect the dots. What we've been able to do on the FDA side, one advantage that we do have we know how a product that FDA regulates is being manufactured. From the sole source component, and we call it a, you know, a supply chain mapping just like everyone else, but we tie this in, into a matrix that goes all the way to distribution point, beyond just the importer here in the US, all the way to retail outlets and our state partnership. And what we try to do is, when we're working together on uh, different enforcement cases, we, we tie a lot of these key elements together and, and you know, build a, a case that we, we need to, that goes up to DOJ. On the innovation side, what's very interesting is, a lot of companies really are intent on being compliant with CBP laws, with FDA laws, so that at ports of entry, our job really is not to stop commerce. It's really looking at the small percentage that want to circumvent the, that process. So we have a lot of different tools in things like the import alert, but also we've been utilizing a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning to really target the highest risk. There's a lot of redundant processes that each one of our systems, we, we can pro probably all admit that we can reduce a lot of these redundant. And AI is a way for us not to take over the human intelligence, but really, can we augment the, the, the uh, redundant systems and make it more efficient? So those are some of the things that we've been able to utilize in concert and support. FDA has been there from the beginning on the 21 CCF effort. And along those lines is because of the lessons learned, like Vinny said. We learned a lot on how to expedite critical medical supplies and get them to healthcare providers at a much faster rate. We did, we did this obviously with CBP and FEMA, and we're taking a lot of that lessons learned in that emergency use authorization world and can we apply it for a normal mo mode? And um, I think the good news is we're walking away now with better platforms 
and then you know expediting a lot more in in the uh, release of compliant shipment today you know versus say five years ago before the pandemic even even hit and FDA has been contributing for uh, now it's several years on the efforts that we have going forward with the standards that we're talking about from the beginning with uh, with Anil John and you know the hope is that we keep that single window single right we don't want to start getting disparate systems growing around that we're trying to keep it single so we're chunking down the information making it more discreet and trying to get back to origin as far back as we can in the supply chain so when you start thinking about Uyghur and what we're trying to do when you're sourcing all the way back to your suppliers it's giving us an advantage to miss to mix the Uyghur technologies in with this modernization effort so you're starting to see a multi-pronged approach to tackle this. So that's why this is uh, pretty amazing, this area. Um, now, Matt, you work on the scientific end of things. And I know we've started recently working together a lot with research with DHS s and But could you talk a little bit about how the labs assist CBP with verifying the supply chain and the imported goods? Yeah, good morning. So <clears throat> for anybody who doesn't know, CBP actually does have a lab system for the laboratories and scientific services. And we're really the provider of science and technology to the greater CBP, greater CBP world. So in this context of, of what we're talking about here, most of, our, most of our services go to either the Office of Trade or Office of Field Operations, where we're in constant communication with them, constant communication with people like Vinny, to assess what those different components of CBP actually need, what questions they need answered through the scientific or technical processes. And in this case, I'm not talking about IT technical. I'm talking about biology, physics, um, anything along those kind of lines. LSS's history goes back almost all the way to the beginning of CBP. Um, our first jobs were analyzing sugar and alcohol you know, really important things for the colonists. Um, the first questions that we answered were, what is it and how much is there? Which is what tied into the tariff rates for the goods at that time. Over time, the questions that we're answering have gotten just exponentially more difficult. Things that we're trying to answer now is, where was something grown? Where was something mined? What path did it take before it arrived in the United States? Over the last 15 years of my career, almost 15 years, um, we've used these kind of questions. We've used this, these kind of questions have been in enforcement of anti-dumping, countervailing duties, um, JDAC determinations, various trade agreements, NAFTA, CAFTA, USMCA, and now the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is kind of the newest iteration of that. It's important to, to, to note here that we've always been looking at supply chains. LSS has always been involved in validating supply chains. But most of the time, the supply chain that we've been interested in as customs has only gone back a little ways. So when we're talking about anti-dumping, the thing that's important is the country of origin for CBP purposes, when the last substantial transformation was made. Now with the UFLPA, Country of origin doesn't mean where was the shirt manufactured or where was the solar cell put together. It goes all the way back to the very first, where was the cotton grown? Where was the cotton ginned? Where was the polysilicon mined in order to make the solar panel? It's a much bigger supply chain that now we're trying to look at through a scientific lens than what we've done in the past. The other thing that LSS provides to Office of Trade and Office of Field Operations very frequently is, is technical translation services, is kind of what I like to call it. Interpreting technical documents, translating scientific jargon, providing expert opinions um, on the validity of scientific claims that the trade is making to CBP. So a lot of the work we do is looking at certificates of analysis, looking at manufacturing processes, and explaining that to our customers, oops, to the Office of Trade and the Office of Field Operations, what's going on there from a chemical perspective, from a biological perspective. The UFLPA supply chain validation or any kind of supply chain validation that's gonna look at the, the forced labor problem is gonna incorporate all of these different things that LSS has been involved in. EAC Highsmith yesterday made the comment that technology is not a silver bullet for knowing what your supply chains are. And speaking as a chemist, she's 100% right. 
There's nothing that you can do with science to secure your supply chain by itself. It's a really important component. It's a really powerful component. In order to spot check, in order to audit, in order to answer a very specific question about what is going on in your supply chain. Having a really well-documented supply chain means having information on every step of the process, knowing everything back to the raw materials that turned into your final products. Testing, scientific testing throughout your supply chain is really gonna inform what's going on and you know, uh, verify that what your suppliers are telling you are accurate. LSS's role in all of this within CBP is to provide an independent test outside of what you're doing, an independent test for CBP to verify that the claims that are being made to CBP are accurate. All of CBP cares about facilitating legitimate trade into the United States, and that's really LSS's goal here, is to take the supply chain data that you're providing to CBP and checking it and making sure, yes, everything you're telling us is, uh, is, is accurate, it's all good. All right, thank you, Matthew. Um, you know, what's amazing here is you start to see, you know, uh, that coagulation, right? So you have standards so that anywhere in the world somebody can submit data to us to get from origin all the way into importation. We have the OIT now working on making sure the new technologies that we have are not only appropriate for our system, but are working so that our operators have an efficient tool in front of them. In FDA, you have the business case, the need for having to do that, and CBP as well, and then the physical verification. So you can start seeing the culmination of all that. So let me move into round two of the questions. And Anil, you know I like to tease you all the time, right? Because um, when Anil was working on the standards at the global level with the W3C, he has been working in them for five years. And Anil, how long did it take to get that first international working group once CBP got on board? Um, so obviously, was it we like are working in public. Two weeks. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was. Uh, it was um, one of the one of the advantages of again a part of the U.S. government that is as old as America, uh, basically picking um, and noting that open standards are important. Is yes. that it, there is a certain uh, um, gravitas that comes along for the ride with so that. So it was a great strategic move there on your yes. part, Anil. Anyway, and, uh, on that note, right, so nice. I, I see Brenda back there. Uh, she was one of the signatories to that memo Absolutely. that was written by CBP on how important open standards are in doing that. And obviously, um, Anne-Marie has been a huge champion uh, to move that forward as well. Absolutely. So I wanted to acknowledge both of those contributions. It's been a, it's a, a great partnership. And, and now... What are the standards and, and why are they important to CBP? Why don't you talk a little bit now to get down to the business level so the folks can understand what we're, we're going with this. So we keep talking about standards, standards, standards. The standards are important and about having said that, one of the common um, comments that I made is, you know, uh, standards are great. There are so many of them, right? So, and one of the challenges with that is people assume that simply because you are following a standard that the systems that are implementing those standards are truly interoperable, that they actually can work seamlessly without any problems. That is complete and total bullshit, right? So, so the long and the short of it is basically standards are created in standards organizations by people, and people are complex, and they negotiate, they do a lot of give and take. So often when you have a standard, what you end up with is basically a set of compromises. And often, those standards actually have multiple ways of doing the same thing, so that vendor A, who was participating in the standards organization, implements a capability using one way. Vendor B, who is implementing that standard, basically uses another way. Both of them st claim standards compliance. Neither of them can talk to each other. That is not a path to success. The priority for us within CBP and DHS in the work that we've been doing is to ensure that the standards that we are um, championing and using 
are truly demonstrated to be interoperable, which means it's not simply a matter of ensuring that you show that you're complying to standards. You can do that using a set of automated test suites, but we also require the entities that we're working with to do something very old fashioned, what we call a plug fest, which is where you bring your infrastructure to the same table and you connect them and see if it works. And ultimately, the point of that is to make specific choices within the scope of the standard that ensure interoperability. So when I talk about that, um, I'm going to go one level deeper on the technical side. I am a technologist, so forgive me um, if I so at the end of the road, we need information in a manner that is semantically aware, which means that we are using linked data. JSON linked data is the foundation of the information that we are representing in a various bill of lading, variety of other things out there. Um, we are using a couple of uh, very open global standards that we contributed to, and we are championing at the W3C called Verifiable Credentials Data Model which is a way of representing data in a very open format. And this is important. I keep mentioning the standards are important and standards are usable only if it is usable by, the, by anybody who wants it, that there should not be a gatekeeper between you and using the standard. You should not have to pay to use a standard. So the ability to use verifiable credentials in order to represent information in a standardized manner, which CVP and the companies that we are working with are working out in public in developing a traceability vocabulary using that standard that you can contribute to on GitHub. You can basically influence, you can bring your stuff to it. It is open, public, and global. And the other one is basically how do you represent entities in the supply chain? We use a standard that are called decentralized identifier that allows us to basically assign uniqueness to entities within supply chains and in other areas as well. The combination of those standards combined with interoperability testing. And again, um, I think there was a comment made that it is really, really important that basically self-assertion of standards compliance is not enough. We truly need to test for interoperability because at the end of the road, if you're in the business of providing data to CBP, you need to provide it in a manner that is openly consumable, and I'll just leave this, I, I, I'll, I'll bring it down to one particular um, example that Dr. Murphy uh, brought up during her uh, keynote as well. At the end of it, she mentioned that they're basically coming out with a uh, you know, open platform that basically is mapping the supply chain and things like that. I am really looking forward to actually learning from her the standards and the data models that they're using to see if they are indeed something that can be easily plugged into the broad ecosystem that is out there and, uh, and, and it is usable by the global audience for uh, something that she's producing, right? So standards, interoperability are really important in this particular space. And Anil, as much as I tease you, I know that you set up all of that groundwork so that USCIS and CBP could get into this global community of standards as well. So I never take that away from you. On top of that, the fact that you set up a test suite so that any company that wants to work with us has to publicly pass. We can see whether or not you've passed those tests in order to work with us so that you are um, interoperable with the CBP system. Because the thing that we want to avoid is getting into a situation where we're con constantly customizing and playing catch up. So, so I, I want to ahead. add one yes. point to that, right? So CBP was forward leaning in thinking ahead that if we control that test suite, there would be a lot of people hesitant to use it. So one of the decisions that CBP made in this particular space is to actually contribute and develop the test suite under a standards development organization so that anybody could use it, anybody could fork it, anybody could basically test it privately before you make public whether you're interoperable or not. So you have the opportunity to go and pull that down from the GitHub repository for the test suites, test it on your own infrastructure, and when you're ready, claim compliance or lack thereof. And, and that's really, really important because if you don't make it easy for people to verify compliance, they're going to consider that to be a really, really challenging problem uh, and a whole lot of drama ensues. All right, thank you, Anil. And Valet, 
I know you spend your nights worrying about tech. So why don't we uh, switch a little bit and talk about how you're staying up on these new techs uh, that are rapidly advancing and, and what you're doing to control that area. Yeah, thank you. So one thing that we have to think about as, as we look at IT is cybersecurity. Um, cybersecurity does keep myself and my, my colleagues up at night because technology is moving fast. It's, it's moving faster than um, sometimes we can keep up with. So um, what do I mean by, by necessarily thinking about cybersecurity? Um, all this data, all the things that we've talked about today, and I'm pretty sure you, we've talked about you know, yesterday, um, it's usually sitting in a system somewhere. And that data is very valuable to um, a lot of folks, to our adversaries, uh, to our corporate partners, uh, internally to the government. And um, if we allow that data to be accessed or to be uh, manipulated um, by folks that aren't, you know, have our best interests in mind, it could be a problem. And so, you know, we have to think about as we inc incorporate new technologies in our systems, what is the cyber security um, uh, concerns for that? So one of the things that, that, that has been prevalent in my um, short government career is that we are trying to move everything to the cloud. We hear the word, let's go to the cloud, cloud's gonna make everything better. But the question I have to ask is, you know, as we move our um, technology and our resources, our data into the cloud, is that cloud provider also using the best cybersecurity um, technologies and methodologies to keep our information safe? So there's a trade-off there from the, uh, the, the, the advancements of going to the cloud and understanding the cybersecurity concerns. Now, with that said, I'm a huge advocate of going to the cloud. Um, I think one of the other things for um, those of us who uh, um, have to report to our leadership is when we go to the cloud, we shouldn't lead with the, uh, um, this is going to save us money. And I, I think a lot of people here that's like, oh, go to the cloud, save money. We should lead with, this is going to uh, give us the ability to be more nimble, more efficient in our ability to add to our technologies, add to our applications, to give um, our supply chain folks um, a better ways of changing and updating guidance in a faster um, manner because um, the technology is built in, in, in such a way. Um, the savings may come in the future, but initially it's to do that. Now, what does that have to do with cyber? Um, we can hold our cloud providers accountable with, uh, when we move to, to the cloud and say, hey, you know, it, it's imperative of them to be uh, sensitive to our cyber uh, concerns in order to keep our information protected. And by pushing that responsibility and that concern off to our cloud providers, that'll give us more resource, resources internally to do other great things for our supply, uh, our supply chain. And finally, one of the things that I, I also harp on with, with my staff and when I have these conversations about IT, it's just the way that we government procure and do IT acquisition. I, I think with the way um, the, the, the technology is moving at the speed that it is, sometimes our way of getting the dollars and the color of money and how we procure it hasn't kept up with how technology is actually being put out in, into the world. So the one example is, is with how cloud charges people in the real world, uh, how ch cloud charges people in the real world. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's done based on the actual usage. Well, you know, it's kind of hard to budget for actual uses. We d don't know what that usage is until that moment. So we need to start keep co coming up with some creative ways to do um, our procurement strategy as we do IT acquisitions. Um, and if we, when we do that, we can uh, start adopting technologies at a faster rate. Um, we can do it in a more secure manner. And we can just have technology work for us and help us modernize some of our systems that, well, let's face it, are kind of, kind of dated. And you know, we need to be able to put the information in our um, uh, customers' hands, regardless if they're on a mobile device, regardless if they're on a workstation or office, regardless if they're on the, in, uh, in a VR headset five years from now. 
Um, we have to be able to be nimble to be able to do that. And you know, hopefully that's some place where uh, the OIT and CBP can start building our systems to support. All right, thank you, Dale. And you know, as a business person, one of the questions that I start asking the tech folks is what is the exit plan now? Just because we're getting into a new technology, you have to know how to get out of it. Because if there is a rapid rate of movement and you want to get into the next technology, how do we break from the one that we're currently investing into and then have a strategy to get into the next? So that becomes really important. Now, Dan, um, you have uh, some, some work going on with the Uyghur region as well. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Yeah, um, I, I think from a su supply chain standpoint, we're, we're very much um, supportive of, of the Labor Act. Um, many of FDA regulated products is coming from the region and, uh, you know, CBP being the primary, FDA plays a role before it's actually distributed. If, if it passed through the multiple screening and it gets to an FDA review, we're quick to share that kind of information because not only are a lot of raw materials coming from the region, we know how, how it's being manufactured. Through, so, you know, our, our point in a lot of this really is the communication piece between us and, and our federal partners and that collectively we have a whole host of data internally that now, you know, through several uh, means, MOUs, for example, we're able to share a lot of this intel and proactively in, in the world of federal government, we work plan at the beginning of the year so that we target these these high risk ports of entry together. And that's, you know, s something that we continue to do uh, year in and year out. Thank you, Dan. And uh, Matt, the um, technologies, can you talk a little bit about the technologies that you guys are currently uh, investing into for the validations and, and all of that as well? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So let me start with kind of what I said in my first answer and just reiterate that no single scientific analysis or even you know, scientific suite of analyses can really completely map out um, a supply chain. Uh, it seems obvious, it's been said multiple times throughout all of this, but it really bears repeating, if nothing else, so that I can keep telling myself that. Um, I'm a scientist, science can solve everything, right? Um, what science can do is it can clarify and reinforce knowledge of particular steps in your supply chain. The technology that LSS chooses in order to answer a particular question depends on exactly what question we're trying to answer and on the, identi the identity of the commodity that we're trying to answer it about. And I realize that sounds vague so far. So the first thing is really, is the technology compatible with the commodity? So just by way of a very simple example, if we have a technology platform that relies on the sample being a liquid, it's not going to be appropriate for doing a solid sample. Silly, but it's, it's a real serious consideration. The second thing is that the technology has to correlate to the question that we're actually trying to answer. If the data we're trying to get at is where is cotton grown, then technology that tells me the color or the quality of the cotton is not really relevant to the information we're trying to get. So in terms of determining where something came from, and that's a very big and a very broad question, I'm just gonna give you kind of a laundry list of things that CBP has used in the past to get at that information. We've used gas chromatography, gas chromatography mass spec, direct analysis in real time mass spec, that's DART for people who, who know that, nuclear magnetic resonance, inductively coupled plasma mass spec, light and heavy isotope ratio mass spec, genetic analysis. I'm probably missing some in there. These are the ones that immediately came to the top of my head. And I'm not entirely sure this is the, this is the crowd for getting into, into super tight details on that kind of thing anyway. Um, a really important point to make is that it's not the exact technology that we use at LSS that's really important, but it's how we choose the technology in order to answer a particular question. It always comes down to what question are we being asked? And if anybody out here has a kind of a statistical background, you'll know how important it is to have a very well-defined, very narrowly defined question. The same is really true in science. We can't ask vague questions like, is this supply chain secure? That's not a question science can answer. Did this cotton grow in the Uyghur region? 
that's kind of a question that science can answer. Is this cotton consistent with the Uyghur region? That's a question that science absolutely can answer. The question is really important. Ideally, LSS wants to use multiple different technologies to answer any particular question. And the reason for that is that it improves our confidence in the results we're getting. The next thing that we look at when we're choosing a particular technology is that it's difficult to circumvent. Anything that we look at, if it's easy for someone to circumvent that particular test, they will. And I'll give you a really, really basic example from another project we're working on. And this is very well known in the food commodity world, um, honey. So honey is mostly composed of two sugars, fructose and glucose. It's very easy to adulterate honey by adding sucrose to it. It makes it a lot cheaper, and it's just as sweet. That's really easy for us to test for. Well, as soon as the people who were cheating wanted to find out if we were testing for it, and we're getting nods over here because this is really partially an FDA problem as well, the easy way to circumvent that is you stop adding sucrose and you add high fructose corn syrup, which chemically looks an awful lot like honey. It was a great test, but it was insanely easy to circumvent. That doesn't do us a whole lot of good in the long term. What we try and do is we try and think through potential circumvention routes in order to make, in order to plan for what we're going to do when the circumvention arises. And something that's really important to LSS, we need to make sure that the technology we're using has peer-reviewed academic literature support. Um, that is especially important for LSS operating in a law enforcement env environment. We're a forensic science lab, and nobody else here is probably going to be using forensic science labs to do these kinds of analyses. But CDP has to. We have to consider things like the Daubert criteria for court admissibility when we determine what our methods are. Everything we do is in support of law enforcement actions, and that's the very definition of forensic science. Why I'm bringing that up is that LSS, LSS gets asked very particular questions that are relevant to CBP and that are relevant to a law enforcement env environment. We have a very particular point of view that may not 100% match the kinds of questions that you're asking about your supply chains. So knowing what technologies we use for any particular question isn't necessarily going to be 100% relevant to you choosing technologies to look into your supply chain. You may have different criteria, different questions that you're trying to get answers to. Technology that's perfect for me in my role may not be technology that's perfect for you in yours. And I'll give an example that specifically relates, specifically relates to the UFLPA and cotton, since that's a big one right now. The question we're asking is, is this cotton consistent with having been grown in the Uyghur region in China? The question you may be asking, depending on what you're trying to get at in your supply chain, is, is the cotton that's in this final product, did it come from this particular farm in Georgia, or this particular farm in Brazil, or this gin or this mill? That's a different question than the ones we're asking. And you may use different technology to actually get at those answers. When you're trying to decide what kind of scientific techni technology you might apply to secure your supply chains, to validate your suppliers, here's just a couple things that uh, occur to me to think to consider. So looking around at the expo, looking around at the science and technology providers that have, that have spoken here, take the time to consider whether what you're looking at is defensible. And I don't necessarily mean defensible in court. That's kind of my problem. But defensible to CBP or defensible to your own internal QC processes? Does it have a firm basis in the literature? You want to have something that has some background that's been proven to be to work. What holes are there in the process? And I mean the entire scientific process. Planning for sampling, actual sampling, the entire scientific testing, how you report the results, how you get those results. And if you plan on using that scientific testing, to back up your supply chain claims to CBP, how are you going to transmit those results to CBP in a way that we're gonna look at and we're gonna say, yes, we trust that, that's real. That's an, an enormously important question to be asking yourself. Um, just to preempt the question that I assume is going to come, 
No, LSS is not going to endorse any particular technology or any particular technology provider to answer any particular question. Um, I gave you kind of a laundry list of things that we work on. You can probably figure out which ones we use for certain different questions, but um, our role is not to provide that kind of information, and uh, I can't. Um, but really, same thing that everybody said, it's having really clear knowledge of your supply chains is the important thing. Using scientific testing to gain some very narrow, very specific insights into your supply chain is the thing that you need to consider. And then consider whether you can get that in a form that you can use that evidence when you give it to CBP to support your supply chain knowledge. All right, thank you very much. Uh, listen, folks, we are running late on time, so um, I'm going to ask you to applaud this panel, and we're going to move off to get into the next realm. I really appreciate everybody and the panelists today. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right, well, good morning. Um, I'm, uh, for those of you uh, who I don't know, uh, my name is Eric Choi. I'm the Executive Director for the Trade Remedy Law Enforcement Directorate in the Office of Trade. Uh, it's really my distinct uh, pleasure to be able to, to, uh, to host for the, to be your host for the rest of the day, but also to welcome everyone back for the second day and the final day of the expo. And certainly for the folks that this is your, that, uh, you, who weren't here today and this is your first day here, not only for the folks that are here in person, but also all the folks that are uh, joining us virtually online as well. I just want to welcome you all. Um, just to kind of uh, highlight for everyone, when we have a significant amount of folks that are here in the room, but also just for interest, that you know, yesterday, uh, late yesterday in the afternoon, we did a query and a poll to kind of see how many folks were participating virtually and online, and we had nearly 9,000 folks that are doing simultaneous live streams uh, on the on the uh, the the, uh, the live webcast. So. Really um, appreciate all the folks that are joining us. I think very critical conversations that are, that are ongoing today. Um, and really appreciate all the folks who are joining us online and live uh, through the live stream. Uh, so for all the folks that may have heard this yesterday, but for all the new folks that are here that weren't here yesterday, there's a few housekeeping tips, realizing that, I, that we've had a long morning and now I'm between you and, and, uh, and a break. But let me just get through a few housekeeping tips uh, real quickly. Uh, so first of all, we have an incredible CBP team uh, that's back with us today that's helping to support this event. Uh, that, and so if, uh, if you look around, you see folks with the green lanyards on. Uh, they're the folks that are here uh, from CBP across the, the agency that are here to support and help. So if you have any questions or concerns or, or need to figure out where the, you know, simple, simply just where the bathroom is, you know, just ask them, you know, reach out. Um, we have uh, the support staff around, around the, uh, the, the area. But also just to highlight that um, we are very fortunate to um, have folks, we have an area back in the rotunda where we have industry back at the tables. And we know that there's a lot of very important conversations that have been going on throughout the day yesterday and, and already today as well. Uh, but we also have uh, our CTPAT table back there. So folks, a lot of critical uh, evolutions that have been occurring within the CTPAT program. So if any, you have any questions with regards to any of the latest updates and changes and what's going on with CVPAT, the team is there and they're ready to answer any of your questions. And, and certainly as you heard from industry yesterday that industry's hiring, we're hiring too. So uh, we've also got, you know, as, as uh, has been highlighted in, in these slides uh, this morning, we have a, a table out there if you'd like to learn more about CBP. Uh, there's a table back there with folks that can answer your questions and, and there's some tchotchkes there that are, that are kind of cool, which I'm going to try to grab later on today. So, um, so we also do encourage, we've got uh, the continental rooms here on the side. Um, we know that the tables are being used for conversations, but you know, maybe you want to have conversations that are a little bit more proprietary uh, and, and you need some space to do that. So we do have rooms along the side for you to go to use those rooms, to leverage those rooms, to have those conversations. Uh, and we really encourage these connections and the networking opportunities that, that this expo may present. Um, so for the, one of the more important fundamentals, there is Wi-Fi available here in the RRB. Uh, it is secured uh, with a very highly secured password. So uh, I'll read it slowly. Um, the password is CBP123. And if that's hard to remember, uh, it, is, it is marked in various areas that, uh, or just ask someone with a green lanyard and they can reiterate what the password is. So there are, there are multiple bathroom options for the folks that weren't here yesterday, um, and they're marked on, on, the, uh, on the program itself. So 
at, when we transition between sessions, uh, you'll hear the chimes. There's folks that's going around with the, with the, the uh, chimes, and so we'll ring the chimes as we're getting ready, you know, we're usually with, when we're within one or two minutes out uh, to begin the next session. So listen for the chimes. When you hear the chimes, you know, please make your way back and, and get ready for the next session. So we're going to be moving into the, the industry presentations here next. Um, and so just to kind of the general format with the industry presentations, about 15 to 20 minutes you'll hear from the presenters, uh, which will give plenty of opportunity for folks that may have questions uh, for the specific technologies or capabilities that are being presented. So please, you know, if you have any questions, please ask because, you know, your questions may benefit all who may have similar questions that, that may not want to stand up and ask. Um, so if we run out of time, uh, please see our event support our event support team members in the rotunda so we can make sure any of your questions are answered that may be specific to the event or, or where we can maybe help to point you in any one specific direction. And then lastly, as you see kind of in between, you may see disclaimers that are up here. So I just do want to highlight just briefly that as we move into the presentations that the purpose of the, of the event is to provide a platform for sharing across the private sector from industry to industry. So, CVP is not endorsing any particular technology or technology or, or technology provider that's being presented today as well. Uh, so, most importantly, uh, we will uh, we're going to be taking a 10-minute break before we get into the industry presentations. Again, listen for the chimes, um, and I look forward to seeing everyone back after the break. So, we'll, we'll um, reconvene back here at 10:20. Thank you. <laughs>